Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Bread of Life channel. Um, tonight, I'm going to be talking and answering kind of the question, can people who don't believe in Jesus be saved? And the reason I thought this was important to do a whole video about is because last time I did a stream, and it was actually on the topic of hell, but this topic came up. And since then, at that time, and since then, there's been a lot of confusion about um, my perspective on this. And so uh, I just wanted to take some time to share that. And then I wanted to have a discussion about it. So I want to invite all of you, if you're watching, to join and talk about this topic. And it doesn't matter what perspective you're coming from, if you're a Christian, if you're an atheist, if you're agnostic or you know, Buddhist, Muslim, whoever you are, you're welcome to join and share your thoughts on this subject. So uh, here was a comment from Brooke Barnes on um, what I said about uh, in the last stream. She said she kind of discredits Christianity. You don't have to believe in Jesus in order to get to heaven. So let's talk about what I'm saying and what I'm not saying. First of all, no one, I believe the statement that, um, you know, no one goes to the Father except through Jesus Christ. There's only one Savior, and that is Jesus Christ. And everyone who is going to be saved is going to be saved through him. The question is, do you have to have knowledge of Christ's salvation in order to be affected by it. And I'm going to present some arguments for what I believe. Now, I cannot absolutely guarantee that the perspective that I'm sharing is true. I think it has strong biblical support. Uh, but, you know, there's many Christians who disagree with me. So, you know, I encourage you to listen to other perspectives on the topic as well. But I really want to set up the problem because this isn't uh, this isn't something uh, I've thought about this a lot, and a lot of people think about this. And it, my journey with this question started as a child when I heard about Muslims who prayed to God five times a day. And I asked adults in my life, you know, um, what about Muslims who are so devoted to God, but they don't know Jesus as Savior? And a lot of the answers that I got as a child from Christians, it was it was really the same answer. They all said, well, if you don't believe in Jesus, then you can't be saved. And so this very exclusive view was presented to me. And I don't think that I didn't even realize that there were other views, that there were Christians with other perspectives, but it's something that troubled me. And the reason that it troubles me and that it troubles most people is that if we are to believe that God loves everyone, and if we're to believe things that the scripture says about God's nature and about what Jesus came to do, then it seems odd that whether or not you're saved is more dependent on the information you get than uh, on, you know, God's power. So I just want to read this verse from First Timothy. It says, For there is one God, and one mediator between God and mankind, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. Now, uh, there's other verses that say that God desires that everyone be saved and come to the knowledge of truth, that God doesn't want anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Now, <clears throat> if these things are true, that Jesus died as a ransom for all people, and God is serious about wanting to save everyone, then it seems a little strange that only the people who happen to get the right information about Jesus 
will have the opportunity to be saved, especially considering that most humans who've ever lived never did hear the gospel. And so, and especially the types of people who never heard the gospel, because throughout the scripture, God makes known his care for the poor. And so, you know, even in the first covenant that God made with the people of Israel, he gave them warnings about how they should treat the poor. He said, do not take advantage of a hired worker who is poor and needy, whether that worker is a fellow Israelite or a foreigner residing in one of your towns. Pay them their wages each day before sunset because they are poor and counting on it. Otherwise, they may cry to the Lord against you and you would be guilty of sin. God also says, when you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Leave them for the poor and for the foreigner residing among you. I am the Lord. Um, half of the things that God is mad about, if you read the prophetic books in the Bible, God is extremely concerned with how people treat the poor. So, um, but in the verses I just read, you see that uh, God God was concerned about the poor and not just the poor of the people of Israel, but he actually said that if the people of Israel didn't treat the poor and the foreigner well, then they would be guilty before the Lord. And then what happens? Well, they do mistreat the poor. And then throughout the prophetic books, when God is like really angry at people, he is angry at them uh, very quite often because of the way they treat the poor. So he says in Isaiah, woe to those who make unjust laws, to those who issue oppressive decrees, to deprive the poor of their rights, to withhold justice from the oppressed of my people, making widows their prey and robbing the fatherless. So God is very concerned about the poor. Jesus said, blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Uh, when Jesus talked about what his mission was, he unrolled the scroll of Isaiah and he read from it. And he said, look, this is fulfilled in your hearing that I have come to bring good news to the poor. Now, if Jesus came to bring good news to the poor and God cares deeply about the poor, then what are we to do with the idea that only the people who hear about the message of Jesus can be saved, considering that most poor people who have ever lived have not heard the message. So, I mean, there are considerable numbers of poor people who have, but we're talking about throughout human history. Uh, so it, it, it would be a little bit strange for God if he's serious about saving the world to make it so difficult to be saved and that the plan of salvation would actually get harder after Jesus comes, right? Like, is that really good news? Like now you have to believe in Jesus in order to be saved when before you, it seemed like you just had to be a good person, right? Then that's, Jesus really isn't bringing good news, right? For most people. Only the people who are lucky enough to hear about him. So this is a question that needs addressing because many Christians do take this exclusive view of Jesus's salvation and say, no, you know, the Bible says that if you don't believe in Jesus, then, you know, that's that's too bad for you. Um but I think that that is actually a misunderstanding of a few verses. And so I'm going to read some of those verses and talk about it and just talk about how I think God is, um, you know, in the process of saving people. And I'll kind of give an analogy for that. Um, but anyway, speaking of like how people were saved in the past, you know, um, they were, they were at least how God judged them, right? It was on the basis of their righteousness. Did they obey God's laws if they were in covenant with him? And then the Bible also talks about people who are righteous. 
And the people who are righteous, some of the qualities that they have are they give generously. They, uh, they're gracious and compassionate. They care about the poor. They are honest. They don't love violence. They, they rejoice in justice and they care about justice. So these are some of the attributes of the righteous that is talked about throughout the scripture. And, but when I say the righteous, I don't mean people who are perfect because the Bible also says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, that there is no one righteous, not even one, that they've all become corrupt. And so it is true that all people uh, have sinned and, and are corrupt in certain ways. But despite the fact that we have all sinned, the Bible also calls quite a few people righteous and describes what righteousness looks like. So we have to understand those ideas in context. And so um, I'm afraid I'm not organized enough and I'm going to cause more confusion. So I'm going to stop and look in the chat in a few minutes to just make sure that I'm on track. Okay. So um, I want to read a few verses to kind of support the perspective that I'm presenting here. And then I'm going to read a few verses that seem to contradict it. One of the verses that uh, supports what I'm talking about, it's actually an entire chapter of the Bible. It's Romans chapter five. And it talks about how sin entered the world through one man, through Adam, and Eve, of course, and death came through sin and death spread to all people. But it says that um, if many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? The gift cannot be compared with the result of one man's judgment, just as Condem one trespass caused condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. So what this is saying is that we all came to we all have sin and death because it started with Adam and Eve, right? So sin and death came into the world through one man. And that was pretty powerful, right? I mean, I don't have to know even who Adam and Eve are to be affected by their sin, right? So like, even if no, even if someone's never heard of Adam and Eve, even the, if they know nothing about Adam and Eve, they are still going to die. They're still going to have a sinful life and they're still going to die. And that's because of what Adam and Eve did. So in the same way, this says, hey, but what's happened through Christ, it's not, you can't even compare it to what happened with Adam and Eve. It's so much better. So if Christ's salvation is more powerful and so much better to spread life to all people. How powerful must that be, right? Like that means it has to be more powerful than Adam's sin. And I don't need knowledge of Adam's sin in order to be affected by it. And so what I'm saying is in the same way, we don't necessarily need knowledge of Christ's salvation in order to be affected by it. Christ provided salvation for all of us. We have a powerful savior. And, you know, I think it's pretty hard to escape his salvation. Um, but so that is one place that I believe supports what I'm saying here. And some would even say that supports universalism. And I, I think... Um, if, you know, somebody wants to come on and share that perspective, they're welcome. That's not my perspective right now. I don't believe that all people will be saved, but 
I'm happy to hear someone else's perspective on that. Another verse that supports what I'm saying here is 1 Timothy 4.10. We have put our hope in the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially those who believe. So Christ is the only Savior. He is the Savior of all people. And that's especially true for those who believe in him. So if you do have your trust in Jesus Christ, if you believe in Jesus Christ, then you can be especially sure that you are saved. Now, um, you know, I, I talked on the last stream about Matthew chapter 25, the parable of the sheep and the goats, where Jesus says he's going to gather all the nations together and separate them like sheep from goats. And the sheep are going to be welcomed into his kingdom. And they're, the sheep are surprised when Jesus tells them, you're welcome into the kingdom. And Jesus said, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was a stranger, you invited me in. And so by their actions, they showed that they wanted to belong to Christ's kingdom, but they were surprised about Christ's kingdom. So this is not talking about Christians because Christians shouldn't be surprised that they're serving Jesus Christ. They're not going to be surprised when they're welcomed into the kingdom. Um, the goats are not welcomed into the kingdom. And Jesus says the reason why, because when I was hungry, you didn't feed me. When I was thirsty, you didn't give me anything to drink. When I was a stranger, you didn't invite me in. And they said, but Lord, when did we not do that stuff for you? And he said, whenever you did not do these to the least of these, you did not do it to me. And so clearly in this parable, the sheep are being accepted into God's kingdom because of their good works. The goats are being rejected from God's kingdom because they did not have good works. They were evil in their actions. So um, how do we make sense of this, right? Are, are we saved by good works then? Well, if you think that these sheep and goats are Christians, then you're, you do have a big theological problem because that contradicts half the New Testament about our salvation. But Jesus clearly says at the beginning of the parable that this is all the nations he's gathering. It's not Christians he's gathering. It's all the nations. And so here we have the sheep being accepted into the kingdom because of their good works. Now, it wasn't their good works that did the saving. Jesus is still the one saving them. It's because of Jesus's sacrifice that they can even be saved. Um, without what Jesus did, then there is no savior. There is no salvation. And so they're still being saved by Jesus, but they didn't have the information about Jesus. Now, what about people who have heard the message about Jesus Christ, like many of the people who are on this channel. They've heard the message, but they just don't believe the message, right? Um, well, you know, I have many friends who are non-religious who are very caring people and are kind of doing the works of God's kingdom. Um, it, it It's like they are caring for the poor. They are caring about justice. And so what would I compare them to? Would I say that they could be saved? Um, <clears throat> I'm very open to that possibility. In fact, I'll tell an analogy about this. You know, I, I'm kind of thinking about salvation being like trying to swim across the Atlantic Ocean. No human being can swim across the Atlantic Ocean without help. And so Jesus is there. He is there to pick you up in the rescue boat and take you across. And some people recognize right away that, hey, Jesus is the Savior. I'm getting in his boat. We're good. 
And then there's others who may have never heard the message, but they're swimming as hard as they can to try to reach God's kingdom, to try and be good and, and do good things. They may not even know there's a rescue boat, but Jesus is there nevertheless. And when they pass out unconscious from swimming by their own effort, Jesus can pick them up and rescue them without their even realizing that he is the one who is rescuing them. And then, you know, when I would say about some of my, some of the people who have heard the message of Jesus, but just don't believe, sometimes it's as if they're swimming and this like, creepy guy pulls up in a boat and's like, Hey, you want to ride? And they're like, uh, no, thanks. Because it doesn't look like a safe ride. And I think that's a, the situation with a lot of people I know who, um, you know, have heard the message of Jesus, but they haven't accepted, accepted it. And Part of it may be because the Jesus that they were presented with looked pretty creepy and it wasn't an accurate view of who Jesus is. They didn't um, see Jesus in his love and his compassion. And, and so they, they, they don't, they're not ready to get in the boat, but they're still swimming. They're still trying to do what's right and good. And they still are trying to head toward God's kingdom, even if they're not sure how they're going to make it or if there if there is even is a kingdom. So that's the the analogy I'm using. And, you know, um, that's the way I think about it. Jesus Christ, he's the only way to heaven. He's the only way to be saved. Some people also have asked saved from what? What are we being saved from? Because my last stream was about how hell is a terrible idea that crept into Christian tradition. It's not really what the Bible teaches. Hell is, as described in the Bible, is not a place of eternal conscious torment. <coughs> so if I believe that, then what do I think people need salvation from? Well, they need salvation. We all need salvation from sin, from death, from this corrupt world system. So if you're a person who looks around at the injustice of the world and you want to be saved from that, Jesus is your salvation. If you find corruption within yourself and you would like reform, you want to be healed, that is salvation. That salvation is found in Jesus Christ. And if you know you're heading toward death and you don't want to die, that is how you can be saved and granted immortality through Jesus Christ. Okay, so what are the things that verses that would contradict what I'm saying? Now, it seems strange to me because for so long, all I heard in Christianity was this exclusive view and what I believe is called inclusivism. And it is, you know, there's books written on it. You can get a book by Clark Pinnock. Um, there's been scholars who have written on this. And so it's not something I'm making up, but it's not a point that, I mean, it's not a view that I hear expressed very often. I still most commonly hear the exclusivist view. So where are the exclusivists getting their idea that, hey, only people who hear the gospel and trust in the Lord can be saved? Well, one of the places is in the book of John, chapter three, and um, it's verse 318. So and I think I mentioned this in my last stream, but I wanted to talk about it more because I felt like I brought in confusion when I talked about it. So um, it says this, it's talking about, this is right after the famous John three sixteen. for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him 
shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. So some people read this and say, hey, see, it's clear. If you don't believe, you're already condemned because you don't believe in the name of God's one and only son. But who is this talking about? Is this talking about people who haven't heard the message? Or is this talking about people who have experienced Jesus, seen him, these people who saw him face to face, saw his miracles? You know, uh, Jesus did so many miracles and many of the Jewish religious leaders just did not believe. So, um, you know, uh, it, this is not just people who just happen to not hear the message. And we can tell that by the context if I go on and read it, because it says, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people loved the darkness instead of the light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that they may be, it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. So this isn't talking about all people. This is talking about people who are purposely hiding their deeds of darkness. They want to stay in the darkness. They don't want to come into the light. They don't want to do good. And so to me, in the context, it's clear. It's not talking about just people in general who haven't heard the message. It's talking about people who are specifically rejecting God because they want to continue in evil deeds. Now, here's another uh, passage that that could be quoted. John, First John, four three. Um, every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming, and even now is already in the world. So that some people take this and say, see, if they don't acknowledge Jesus, then they're not from God. That's antichrist. But I don't see how people can be antichrist if they've never heard of Christ. Uh, it, you really need to be presented with Christ in order to accept or reject him, right? So you can't really be antichrist without, um, you know, having uh, an opportunity to acknowledge Christ. So, um, uh, I guess that's mostly what I wanted to say. And now I can let people in to talk about this. Oh, Lance is here. Cool. Hey, Jerome. Hey, James. Um, so yeah, uh, we can talk about it. So I just, but I'll just state clearly a recap. I believe Jesus is the only savior of the world. I believe the statement, and this is the number one thing that people quote to try to refute this, but I believe this, that, um, you know, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, I fully believe that statement. I think no one can come to the Father except through Jesus Christ. However, that does not say that they have to have a perfect knowledge of the plan of salvation. None of the people in the Old Testament, maybe, you know, if, if you say Isaiah, he understood the prophecy in Isaiah 53. If he understood that, okay, then maybe he had a full knowledge. But Noah, uh, is he not saved because he didn't um, confess Jesus as Lord and Savior? He had no knowledge of that. People throughout for, you know, thousands of years of God's people did not have knowledge of God's plan of salvation. So did they get saved without Jesus or was Jesus their path to salvation even without them knowing it? I would say that just in the same way that people in the past 
did not have knowledge of salvation and yet were able to be saved through Jesus Christ. The same is true for people today. Um, let's let some people come in and share their thoughts. And again, if you come on the stream, you have to show your face backstage. You don't have to have your face on camera, but I have to see your face. That is to prevent indecent exposure. So please show me your face backstage and then um, you can come on and share your thoughts. And while we're doing that, I'll just read another verse that supports what I'm saying. So, um, okay, Midnight Sparkle is here. Hey, how you doing? Hello. I figured I'd come in, you know, just to uh, just to annoy you. Kidding. <laughs> cool. You're not annoying me. Tell me what you what you have to say about this topic. Uh, well, let's see. Hold on a sec. Can people who don't believe in Jesus be saved? Well, <clears throat> I mean, hard, to, you know, hard, hard, hard to be saved by somebody you don't believe in. I mean, unless, unless, you know, unless, unless because Jesus sacrificed himself, even if they don't believe, they're safe automatically, which does seem to be the view for, does seem to be, be the view of certain, you know, certain people that once saved, always saved. That's 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 a whole other mess. Uh, I don't know. Like <clears throat> from an atheist point of view, there's really nothing to be saved from. You know what I mean? Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean that is a lot of people's view. So I I mean it's my view that everybody does need <clears throat> salvation, but I I understand there's different views. Hi, Chad. Hi. I want to respond to this comment before it gets too far back, and then I'll let you share your thoughts. Jerome says, so what's the conclusion? Don't share faith so people don't reject God on purpose. Well, that actually assumes that the only point of, um, you know, this presenting Jesus to people is so that they can have eternal life. But actually it's so much more than that because it's a you know it's getting to know god and having god and the experience of knowing the salvation that has been provided for you and knowing the savior is something that i would want everybody to have so uh, yeah people have asked like oh well if you're thinking this way then do you care less about sharing the gospel no i live to share the gospel like that's what i love to do i love to see the look in someone's eye when they understand for the first time the the gospel and so i love to share this message and i think it's very valuable um it's the most valuable message so of course i still am interested in sharing it i don't i wouldn't make the conclusion um because i don't think that people are um they're if they're rejecting the message they're rejecting it on a level a different level. I don't think it's just like, oh, if they hear it and and then they don't accept it, then that means they rejected it. I think there's more to it. I think you can reject the message even without hearing it, if that makes sense. I don't know. Anyway, I don't I don't want to like go on and on. Let me just but, um wait, I mean I know chat probably wants to say in here, but how can you reject something if you don't hear it? Exactly. Like I, I don't know. Go ahead, Chad. That's and that's my point, Midnight. I don't know if you were here earlier when I was talking, but that's what I was saying. How can you have rejected Christ if you've never heard of Christ? You haven't rejected Christ if you haven't heard of Christ. Um, I mean, you. Ha so, but it, what I mean by rejecting the message is even if you haven't heard the gospel, you're re you can reject God by your actions. Um, your actions, like it says in John chapter three that I was reading, people don't come into the light because their deeds are evil. So anyway, um, let me stop confusing people because I feel like that's what I'm doing right now. Chad, what do you want to say? Um, so my question is, I think, just as applicable to this topic as it is to your last stream about hell. And I'm just curious if you have a theory as to why 
um, this view is, is so your, the view that you're expressing is so uncommon. Curious people who genuinely study these things and want to want to believe what's true. Um, Christians, right, who believe the Bible. Why why do so few of them share your view on this? Do you think? I think it's because they're afraid. Um, somebody's echoing. I'm going to mute you guys. Um, I think it's because they're afraid that it means that Jesus is not important for salvation. So I feel like they, they want to make sure that they are staying true to, you know, the, the necessity of Christ for salvation. And I, and then for some people it's that they've never heard another view. So when I, when I was kind of like, when I was like away from the Lord and trying to figure out like, you know, like the, between my teenage years and up until 23, when I was really processing these things, I didn't know there were other views because I only heard this view. So for me, the choice was, okay, do I believe that Jesus is the only way? Like, can he, is he really the savior of the world? And he only, if you trust in him, can you be saved? Or do I not believe in that at all? You know what I'm saying? Like, I didn't know there were any other options. So like the verses that you mentioned earlier, um, John 3, 18, 1 John 4, uh, whatever it was, presumably you think those play some role in coloring people's interpretation or, or prompting people to believe that belief in Jesus' sacrifice is necessary, not just Jesus' sacrifice simpliciter, right? Um, do you think that these this, what you just expressed is just, it's biasing people as they read those verses? Or do you, do you think that those verses have nothing to do whatsoever with why people um, think that belief in Jesus is necessary? Okay, you're saying the one I quoted from like First Timothy, where it says like, Jesus Christ is the savior of all people, especially those who believe? Well, I was just, I was more thinking of, Versus like John 3, 18 and 1 John 4, I guess to simplify my question a little bit, do you think that those verse ha verses have anything to do with why people think that um, belief in Jesus yeah. is necessary? Definitely. Do you think God could have communicated the truth about these matters in a way that that would be far less susceptible to, inter to misinterpretation? That's possible. Do you think that yeah. it's equally expected on the hype on the theory that God wants us to know the truth? Do you think that it's equally expected that he would write these verses the way he did, as opposed to writing them in a way where um, they're more comprehensible? Well, I don't think God wrote them. So inspired. God inspired them. Right. Um, but people wrote them. And, and I think those people intended to communicate, Kate clearly, but we're talking about a text that's being communicated across culture, across time periods. Um, so I think we do pretty well uh, being able to understand the message considering the, the time it's removed from. And, you know, like, I think it's quite understandable. I mean, people can, people who are literate can pick up the Bible and read it in their own language and understand enough to, to hear the good news. So, hmm. um, what do you think though? I just Does think, it bother I you think that these two issues, that like what you're expressing for me, I, I mean, like the idea that the belief in Jesus is necessary to be saved has always been one of the things that like makes Christianity seem very implausible because just given my personal knowledge of my own psychology and how I feel like I'm genuinely searching for the truth and um, not getting that confirmation to, to be told that my salvation depends upon believing these things just adds a whole other layer of implausibility. And I think that the same thing goes for a lot of other people. And so I think that that fact alone is strong reason why I, I feel like it's reasonable to expect God to communicate these things 
in a clear way. And when I read these verses like John 3, 18 and 1 John 4, I, I understand where you're coming from, but I also can totally understand why somebody would read these and come away thinking that um, you really do need to believe in Jesus before you die in order to be saved. And so it just, it's, it seems very, very unlikely from my perspective that these verses would be inspired this way if God wanted as many people as possible to be say, or to know the truth, I guess, in this life. It's sort of, this is sort of like a subset of, I don't know, the problem of evil or, or divine hiddenness, I guess, in a, in a sense. Um, right. But I don't know. I'm curious if Rob, Rob has any thoughts on this. He's making coffee. He said he'll be right oh, okay. back. Well, I have a question. Sure. The thing is, I'm one of uh, those people that asked you, like, what are we saved from? Well, by your account, Jesus. So, but for the sake of time, I'm just going to ask you probably like a related question, but it's more, more like down the road is what exactly is eternal life to you, Rebecca? What is eternal life? Life forever. Yeah. But like, what is it going to be like? I don't know everything about it, but I do know some things. I know that I will. And I know these things from the resurrection of Jesus. He had a body. So I know I'll have a body. He hung out with his friends. So I believe I'll hang out with my friends. Um, he ate and drank. So I think there will be eating and drinking. Um, and, um, uh, yeah, there's, you know, there's some descriptions of the beauty of God's kingdom. So basically and, you're the, the form that you think that will happen will be the same ex the exact thing as you are now, pretty much like your reincarnation. I wouldn't call it reincarnation because I'm reincarnation just... means you're become a different being, but I'm going to be always be Rebecca, but I will have, you know, um, I will, I will be perfectly righteous, perfectly holy. And, you know, eternal life doesn't just start after the physical death. It starts when you're born again in Christ. So you, you, it, I'm experiencing part of eternal life right now. I'm experiencing, um, you know, having the indwelling Holy Spirit. I'm experiencing, uh, the like things of God's kingdom right now. So if I understand right, it's just that you want to just be. That's the basic of what I get, but it's anyway. So just be like just exist. Yeah. Well, it's not just about existing, it's about being part of God's family. It's you're you're part of the family of God. You're in a family forever. Okay, all right. So sorry for just uh, basically, but just kind of putting a chisel on your wall, uh, on the wall. But basically, to from where I'm coming from as an atheist, basically, it is arrogant to think to wish for eternal life. Is it arrogant Why? to want to not like to not want to be non-existent? No, nope. but for having eternal life, it is arrogant because the thing is, you cannot have like on a biological, well, well biological, natural, and also philosophy, in like in on a philosophical level, you cannot have life without death, and you cannot have death without life. It's just how it is. And it's basically a symbiotic relationship that we have, have as basically organisms. And it's like, and like finally, one of the things that if you want to live forever, like eternal life and all that stuff. 
you go by the risk of as you go through the centuries and everything, you risk to change yourself. You know the quote about basically you you, you die, die young and and be a hero or live long enough to be the to find yourself that you are the villain. Like will the same will you keep the same integrity or whatever value Chris, like you're confusing me. I have no idea what, what you're getting at. Can you simplify this? Do you think that if, well, first of all, is that you need to have life and death. It's just a way of how things need to be. And second one is... <clears throat> Do you think that if you have eternal life, will you be the same person consistently throughout the ages? That's it. Well, I think there may be potential for growth as a person, just like I grow as a person right now. Or you um, could probably degress. Same thing. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure what else you want me to answer. Like I'm, I, your comment is kind of like all over the place. Well, I'm not really good with words, but. Uh, no, it's it, okay. I'm just trying to figure out what you're saying. Cause I don't really know how to respond. The same to person that you are now. Are you going to, do you absolutely think that you can be the same person within 10 years, 20 years, No. 50 years, a hundred no. years, thousands and stuff like that if you have eternal life well Do you I, there's things i don't know about what you know life eternal life in god's kingdom is going to be like so i can't fully answer that but i think on earth right now we are changing all the time so i don't think i will be exactly the same in 10 years but yeah but anyway I don't know if anybody wants to chime in, Midnight or Rob or Chad. I don't know, but yeah. I could ask another question about something you said, Rebecca. You were talking about sure. Matthew 26 with the sheep and the goats. And I wish I could remember your exact wording, but you said something like, well, their, their works, you didn't say their works are what saved them. You said. Um, Jesus saved them. Right. You said Jesus, you drew it what sounded to me like almost like a distinction without a difference. And that you said that they they do need to do certain works in order to be saved. But you then said that Jesus is what saves them. Do you remember your phrasing on that? Well, OK, so what I was saying is because of their good works, they showed that they were seeking God in his kingdom. Right. So. Um, it's by their good works that Jesus recognized them as part of his kingdom. And Jesus even said, you know, by their fruits, you will know them, right? Like for believers in him. So even though they may not have heard the message, the works of their lives showed that they were like on God's side, basically. And so it's not, but it's not that those works were the saving power for them because they still needed the salvation of Christ. They still need to have their corruption healed and they still need to be given uh, the perfect righteousness that only comes through Christ. So that's what I'm trying to say is that like righteousness does count for something, you know, a lot of times people do focus on Christ's salvation and as a free gift. And I'm one of those salvation in Christ is a free gift for anyone. And that's how the Bible talks about it. So it's not like, okay, the, you know, all the good people will be accepted and the bad people no, will, will be rejected. No, Christ's salvation is, is for the sinner. It's for the worst among us, right? 
but it's for the those who want to be freed of their wickedness and you know those who are wicked and want to stay wicked will have no salvation and so the goats um it, it's you know it's not that they couldn't be saved from their wickedness but it's that you know they showed that they did not desire to be free if that makes any sense Okay, so it, like all of this makes perfect sense to me, but like I know when I express it, sometimes it confuses people. So please do tell me if I'm not making sense. So there's a difference between saying that through that through one's works we can determine that somebody is saved, I guess you could say, and saying that through one's works they are saved, right? One is about how you determine or find out that somebody as the Holy Spirit or whatever. And the other is what makes them in virtue of what are they, you know, part of the sheep as sheep as opposed to the goats. And it sounds like you're saying that um, through, through their works or like what Jesus is saying in Matthew 25 is that through, is that their works are how we determine that they are, or is are how Jesus determined that they are sheeps, sheep as opposed to goats. It's not, it's not what makes them sheep as opposed to goats, but it's how we see that they're sheep as opposed to goats. Is that is that a fair distinction to make? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, that definitely clarifies things. I mean, I think, I think James would probably disagree, but um, I guess that view is it makes sense. Which James are we talking about? I feel like I know Brother a lot of James in the Bible. Um, oh, <laughs> James in the Bible. Yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking James on the channel. Um, yeah. Well. Because um, he says, you know, your their faith, your faith is made complete in what you do, which seems to imply that it's not just your faith isn't just something that um, shows that you have the spirit. It's it's something that um, your works are what actually make your faith complete, in which case you really are saved by what by your works and under that view it seems to me see i also don't i don't read james that that verse in that way um what what i hear when i when i hear that is that people who are believers in christ they will have good works like they it will something will change when christ is in your life something happens to you right so it's not because you're, you know, like, it, it's like when you're acting out in faith, right? That faith has an outworking. It, it has a result. And so, um, you know, basically it's like you're completing your faith by what you do. So like, if you say you have faith and then you there's no change in your life. There's nothing that happens to you. Then is that, is that really having faith? Like, do you really have faith if, if nothing changes in your life? Now I really hate, I, I actually really hate it when, um, most of the teachings that I've heard and sermons I've heard on the book of James, because I feel like it's misused where we're like, you know, pastors will be like, oh, you know, um, see, if you're not doing good works, then do you really have faith? Do you? you? And they like, you know, are like, and, and then there's poor people out there who already feel like they don't do enough good works. And so then they're like, yeah, am I really a believer? I would have more good works and blah, blah, you know. And actually, some of those people are like working really hard for Christ. You know what I'm saying? So I don't like the misuse of that passage, but to me, it makes perfect sense. Like, yeah, when Christ is in your life, you it, it does things in your like it changes you and you do have an outworking. It doesn't mean you're going to be a perfect person, but there is an effect. I mean, maybe I'm just taking the verse too literally, but it seems to me like saying you're the, okay. So he's talking about Abraham, right? And so starting at 
verse 21, uh, was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? Okay, so first of all, like people will love to point to where it talks about Abraham being considered righteous by his faith. Um, right. By the same reasoning, we can we can say that he's considered righteous by what he did. And that's not the same thing as saying, well, his right, his what he's doing is an outward display of his right of his faith. There's a difference between saying we know that he has faith because of what he does and saying that he has faith because of what he does. And the, the, this verse seems to be saying the latter. You see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. That seems to be saying something very different than just merely that that we know that Abraham had faith through what he did. It's saying that his his actions are what is making his faith complete. It's not just a manifestation of his faith. It is part of what constitutes faith. Um, at least that's how I read it. Maybe I'm wrong, but I mean, I think, you know, Martin Luther would probably see it the way I do too. And that's why he had a problem with it. And I think a lot of people, you know. Yeah. Well, if you, t if you read it that way, then you have a direct contradiction um, with other parts of the New Testament. So you have a direct con contradiction in Romans, I think it's chapter four, where it specifically says it, it was not Abraham's works, right? Mm -hmm. It was like, so, and I mean, we can, let's find that verse because it's actually. Yeah, I fully um, agree with you, by the way. Um, yeah. So that's what I'm saying. Like, so how are we going to read it? You know, um, but that's, that seems to me like you have to start with a foregone conclusion that there are no contradictions in the New Testament before you can take that as a reason to interpret James differently. And from my perspective, as somebody who doesn't start with that conclusion, um, I just, I prefer to, but go ahead and read the, read the verse. Oh no, I haven't found it. Um, it's okay. somewhere in the, okay. Um, I mean, we could just Google it cause, but I, I do believe it's in chapter four. Um, but, um, yeah, so I can't read and listen. Um, but can you Google that for us really quick, Chad? Oh, Paul, what what book of the Bible is it? Um, Romans chapter oh, four, but Romans just four. that. Uh, okay, wait, wait, wait. Okay, no, I got it. Um, okay. What verse? Um, no, I don't know where it is. It's oh. the one that directly contradicts the one in James because it says not Abraham was not justified by his works. Oh, okay. Um, so maybe you can Google it to um. Um. Okay, here we go. Okay, I got it. It's already, it's at the beginning of chapter four. It says, "Which what then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter? If, in fact, Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, wages are not credited as, as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the one who does not work, but trusted in God, who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. So, um, yeah, and I think there's a place that says it more strongly. We have been saying that Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. Under what circumstances was it credited? Was it after he was circumcised or before? Okay, so um, it was, and it says it was not after, but before. Okay. So do you know of any book of the Bible besides the letters of Paul, which explicitly state this doctrine about salvation by faith? Like if you were to just read the Gospels, uh, do you think you would be able to come away? Let's just actually first just say the synoptics. Forget about John for right now. Do you think you would be able to come come away from any of those books with this explicit doctrine that it is solely through faith that we are saved? Um, it, it It's not... It, it's not uh, not found much in Matthew. I think it would be hard to get saved, you know, and and understand. Uh, Do you think Jesus taught Matthew? the doctrine while he was alive on earth, like during his earthly ministry? Well, I think there's some hints of it when he told the parable of the sower and the seed in the Gospel of Mark. It was um, like the some seed were those who. Um, 
like the seed was stolen so that they could not believe and be saved. Believe, I think it even says believe the gospel and be saved. I so, mean, I, I can definitely grant that belief is a necessary condition for salvation uh, from the gospels. That seems to be derivable, but the, the, this doctrine about it being a sufficient condition, faith alone, I, I don't right. see, I don't see that in the parable of, um, that you're talking about, uh, with the, with yeah, the well, it, like I said, if we're talking about the synoptic gospels, I, there is not much that really explains the plan of salvation in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It, it's, it's a, it's like a report. I mean, it, you know, it reports Jesus's death and resurrection, but it doesn't really tell you what to do with that. Um, the well, gospel the of John is the one that really tells you, you know, salvation and it is by faith. So you, you see that in John, but not, not the, I see the, that in John. I, I could, you know, probably pull out a, maybe a few verses that might support it in Matthew, Mark and Luke, but I do think it's a harder to understand the plan of salvation. If you just read Matthew, Mark and Luke. So I kind of draw a distinction between the plan of salvation and what you have to do to be saved. seems like those aren't the, I mean, they definitely intersect in a sense, but the plan of salvation is like, what did God do to allow for our salvation? He sent his son to die for our sins and all that. And that's, that's clearly, I mean, it's taught in the synoptics, right? But the question of what do you have to do as an individual? Um, I do think Matthew answers that question. Um, but not in the way that I would expect if you shared Paul's theology. And it's just curious to me why it's so sparse, why it's so hard to find in, in the Gospels. Um, it seems like it would be one of the most important things for Jesus to teach. And even in John, even in John, it seems like, I think I know what verses you're talking about, but I, I, I can vaguely remember others which seem to imply that you do you do need to that works are necessary for salvation, not just a manifestation of your faith, but a necessary constituent part of what makes, what allows for your salvation. Um, I can't think I of one time that. counted the number of times in the book of John that it said believe. And I actually, in my older Bible, I had them all numbered. And I think it says believe like 98 times in mm -hmm. the book of John. So I think, and only a few of those are like in a different context other than like believing in Jesus for salvation. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I think it, it's pretty strong in the gospel of John that what you do to be saved is believe. Okay. I'll let uh, James say something if he wants. Okay. Wait, before James, hi, James, uh, before he, the, I did want to go back to something you said about Romans versus James and if they contradict each other. And I just want to say, I, I don't have a problem if they are contradictory. I don't have a, that particular verse in James, it doesn't feel contradictory to me, even though I recognize the, the way that it reads, it sounds contradictory, but for me, it doesn't, um, feel like a true contradiction. However, there are some things in James that I would say are discordant with the rest of the New Testament. And one of them is that it calls, it seems to call believers sinners. Well, James says, wash your hands, you sinners, purify, purify your hearts, you double-minded. It's possible that he was talking to people outside of the faith, but if he's talking to people inside of the faith, that's the only place in the New Testament that um, or in in the church era after Jesus's death and resurrection, that um, you know believers would be called sinners. Yeah, but so, the, you, mm -hmm. sorry, you have to really realize too. At some point, uh, when the rubber hits the road, it's basically just a um, population control policy via shame everybody else to do exactly what do you want to do them to do and if you don't well so sad for you or either through violence or just with the threat of basically the imagination 
but you don't really know exactly that thing. But the point is, is that you, you they need to believe your lie, well, your bluff or whatever, in order to basically just comply. So yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, I, I real, realize that a lot of people do feel that way. Um, you know, but I don't think I, I surely there is a lot of religious abuse and religious control that goes on, but I don't think that is the, the message part of the message of salvation. It's the two side of the same coin. So, you know, Okay. Um, James, you've been here for a while and haven't had a chance to say anything. Do you want to say something? Right. So it, just quickly to address what Chris was saying, if we look at the whole Bible, the whole collection of ideas that are in it, I see the same thing Chris sees, but at the same time, when I'm listening to you and you're explaining your way of understanding it, your way of relating to it, I see that as a separate entity. So I'm able to make the differentiation. So Chris's uh, criticisms would fairly apply to a lot of um, what's in there according to the way most people read it. And it might even be a better way of reading it. But I, I want to set that aside and just talk about how Rebecca reads it, and what she's saying about it, because she's not advocating for that system of control that Chris is talking about. Chris is just saying, but it's in there. Let's not forget that it's in there. But I, I think we can afford to put that on the shelf and make that a separate discussion and just talk about what Rebecca's views on this issue are. And when we talked about, when, when Chad was talking about that verse in James, and I can't remember exactly how it was worded, but basically, um, can you read it again for me? Can somebody read sure. that verse again? Yeah, as James 2.22, you see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. Right. So when I hear that, I hear love is a verb. I hear that you become... You, you have more faith in love by practicing love because by practicing love, it nurtures love within you. And as it nurtures love within you, it comes, becomes more alive within you. And then it's less a matter of faith in a concept and it becomes more a matter of faith in your own experience. It's something that you know because that love exists within you. You've experienced it through the act of charitable deeds. And in this way, you become a better person in that sense. So that's where the transformation happens. It's, it's a necessary part of the mental mechanism to have the those experiences of doing the deeds that manifest that kind of change within you. So it's a necessary part of it. That's what I understand the verse to mean. And it comes back to this idea that God is love. That's interesting. I never really got the sense that this has much of anything to do with love. Um, I mean... You can look at Abraham offering his son Isaac as a manifestation of love to God, but you can also look at it as just him valuing obedience and thinking things will go well for me if I obey God. Um, I, hey, I agree with you 100%. It goes back to what Chris was saying, that if you if there's an awful lot of stuff in there that you just cannot reconcile with a healthy understanding of what love is. You can't. And I'm not going to sit here and try to be come an apologist and say that you can when you can't and chris was right you can't but like rebecca has said before in other streams there are some things in bibles that weren't necessarily inspired by you know the spirit of love or truth or anything like that that probably should be in there so then it becomes a matter of discernment to say okay well if there is this toxic idea over here that you cannot rectify then no matter if the, a god wrote the bible or not of course, if it's something toxic and you can't make sense of it in a rational, ethical way, of course you shouldn't make that part of the way that you live. Of course you shouldn't. So, you know, it, it kind of resolves itself as long as you have that as your guide. That's how I'm seeing it anyways. I can't think, I'm trying to think, what would you, like, wow, do you have any examples of, uh, like, something we have to not, we can't understand in the Bible is toxic? I don't know. I think all those stories are fit together. I mean, you kind of see it from the Old Testament in the beginning that God's saying, look, you have to trust. He's trying to deal with mankind, but like he has to show them to trust in his provision. Like even right from the beginning with they try to cover themselves with fig leaves, but he comes down and presumably has to uh, 
kill an animal to cover them with skins, right? He, but it's like the emphasis is him providing or when Abraham trusted God, even though he didn't understand it to kill his own son, but then God stops him and says he'll provide this, you know, the sacrifice, things like that. It's kind of hinted all through the Old Testament. I mean, God's trying to get man to to do it the right way because he knows better and then they don't listen. And so sometimes he's forced to do things like, like at the Tower of Babel, he didn't want them to be, you know, doing what they were doing because he knew what would happen if they all gathered in one place. So he forces them apart because for their sake, you know, he's like dealing with their rebellion yet trying to let them, you know, go their own way to a certain degree, but he has to step in. It seems like that's, Faith being trust in God, like that's what he's trying to get man to do is trust him. Sure, I understand that that's in there. And anything in a Bible, an an apologist or a a dedicated Christian or someone dedicated to the narrative can find a way to look at it in such a way that they can that they can rectify it. They can harmonize it. They can come to peace with it and say, well, here's what it really meant. And here's how it should really apply to our lives. And it's not maybe as barbaric as it seemed or it was necessary for this reason or that. And I, you know, as an, as an atheist, as a skeptic, I don't subscribe to those ideas. I think it's often a stretch. It's often just the idea that someone's so dedicated to the narrative, they're trying to find a way to make it work. And I understand the foundation of that. Um, but I, I'm keeping it separate. Like, I don't feel like I need to come in here and say, well, what about these other things in the Bible that are awful? Like, I, yes, I do love having those discussions. But at the same time, that's not the purpose of the stream. I just remind myself, okay, Rebecca's talking about love, and she's talking about um, hope for the future. And she's talking about these other more wholesome, healthy ideas. I don't think you can harmonize those with most of what's in Bibles. But I'm keeping that as a separately shelved idea. That's all. Yeah, and I want to be clear that, because James, you said earlier that basically if I see something in the Bible I don't like, I kind of like don't, I like ignore that or say it's not inspired. I don't do that, actually. I'm much more comfortable just saying I don't know and I don't understand than like, tossing out part of the canon. So, um, you know, there's, there's stuff that I'm not, that I'm, I will fully admit I'm not comfortable with, but like Deuteronomy chapter 28, I'm not comfortable with that at all, but I'm not going to throw it out of the canon um, just because I'm uncomfortable with it. And I think that's actually, it's actually, um, if you think about it, like if, if everything in the Bible was stuff that I was comfortable with, or if I, if I reformed the Bible to think what, like, if everything in there is like exactly what I would think, then that would be a little strange, right? Like if, um, I don't know how, maybe I'm not expressing this well, but I'm just saying the fact that there are things that have endured and that no one is throwing out of the canon, um, is, to me, a testimony of the, um, enduring revelation of God. Um, so, so maybe I'm remembering it wrong, but I, and it could be that I'm remembering it wrong, but I thought I remembered you at one point a month or two back saying that it may be that there are some things in Bibles that, that shouldn't be there. Yeah. Well, I, when I said that, and I think I did say that, but what I meant by that is, I think there are translation errors in probably every Bible. Um, So there are, in that way, there are things there should be, I think there's copy errors. And so I do leave open the possibility that, you know, even there could be other types of errors. I'm not, I'm not, um, you know, ruling that out. I'm just saying um, I wouldn't be quick to like toss out something just because it made me uncomfortable. How about no, the would. politics of the day? Basically, that's it. Had like the Bible has about like a three hundred year old uh, like history of being used and all that stuff by the states to rally people. Uh, so on a social a- aspect, how about the fact that it um, it basically it evolved over time and st- stuff like that. Like you don't hear the uh, 
kill the non-believers rhetoric from the 11th century and stuff like that. And the basically uh, like the colonial era of, oh, we have to save everybody uh, via beating the beating the drum of uh, Christianity into them, like bread, like uh, kill the Indian poor, basically out of them type of rhetoric. And then it's basically right now in this era, in the modern era, it's basically like, oh, peace and love, pretty much tolerate people, that type of thing. That we're like, that's where we're at. And then we're basically probably on the cusp of another era of probably, does it really matter at the end? Or even, even if we go to say like 200 years and we have to uh, reevaluate because we would be a fair, spacefaring species or at least through the solar system, because <clears throat> old stuff wouldn't really matter anymore. Like Jerusalem would probably just be irrelevant because it's basically sitting up on Earth and probably everybody is going to change and stuff like that. I don't know. It's, it's just stuff that basically that the Bible is just like the attitudes of the era of the, those different eras is basically just an evolution, so a social evolution of us as a species. So, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But Chris is, I mean, when it comes to the, the atheist skeptics that are in the channel, Chris is, you're just preaching to the choir. Like we already agree with you on this stuff. And when it comes to the believers, the Christians in the channel, like the, those, those kinds of arguments, they just don't, don't have weight to believers. Not, not by themselves. It takes a whole lot more than that to really convince somebody that they should just stop taking their Bible seriously. I think. Yeah. Uh, let's try to get back on the topic. So, um, just a refresher, we're talking about can people be saved even if they don't know about Jesus? Yes. And Okay. MJ, what do you want to say about this? Well, just I'll just say real quick. My view is that belief explicit belief in Christ is sufficient, but not necessary for salvation. Simple as that. That's a good um, way I to think, put it. Like if, if you tempor, if you like uh, temporally kind of locate it, you can make a distinction. You can say, look, look at the Old Testament people like Job. Okay. So he saved without belief in Christ. Now let's put it after Christ. I think you'd have to extrapolate from what Paul has to say about general revelation. So if, if they haven't heard, then they got the conscience and the general revelation from the heavens and all that stuff. And they respond appropriately appropriately to that. Christ's sacrifice is applied to their response to that revelation. So no one's uh, saved independent of Christ's sacrifice. Christ's sacrifice is just applied if those conditions and those revelatory circumstances are satisfied. But explicit belief would be sufficient, but not necessary. And it would be a certain Amen. kind of belief, not the belief that that demons have, not that kind of belief. <laughs> Now, this is interesting, tomorrow. MJ, that you're expressing this because, you know, where did you, how did you come to this conclusion? Um, I read a lot of William Lane Craig. <laughs> <laughs> he persuaded me. Um, that's pretty much where I got it from. And he, he's, it's just extrapolating from the New Testament data. I think it's a, it's a good case. <laughs> Um, philosophers uh, talk a lot in terms of necessary and sufficient conditions. I think that distinction between necessary and sufficient conditions is illuminating and enlightening and set me free intellectually speaking, it liberated me. It it, it totally like clear clears it up for me. Let me ask for me. Uh, let me ask this. Is, what, this is why me. is there? Oh, sorry to interrupt. Why is there so much emphasis on belief in the first place if belief isn't necessary for salvation? Hey, Hey, Chad, we'll be right back. I'm going to give my son the second bottle. It's going to take like a minute. Yeah, that, back back. I wanted right. you to answer that, MJ. Yeah, that's the rub is righteousness by faith Dude, in God. My son's God. milk comes first, man. <laughs> MJ sounds familiar. Is that Democracy of the Dead? Is that the same guy? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, cool. We first met on this. I wish he would put his thing, you know, consistent so people could find his channel. 
He's like purposely hiding. I mean, I don't know why he's hiding. Jamie, do you want to answer that question? Why no, is there so I, much? I, I want to pose the problem that righteousness by faith and trusting God, like what, so what are with these people that don't, and look, I'm just presenting what I see as a potential issue. I, I, I'm not giving like a answer. I'm, I'm just saying like, the more we understand it, that the gospel is supposed to be, you come to the end of yourself and you trust God to provide you, you know, at the foundation of Christianity, that seems hard to make sense of if someone's never heard the gospel. Like, are we saying people who don't hear the gospel have like, just like said, I'm a terrible person and God has to just make a way for me to get in by, you know, his doing. I don't see how you get that from, from creation. And that just seems like a little bit of a problem, depending on how you understand that, uh, you know, what it is that saves a man, I guess I would say if that made any sense at all. I don't know. If MJ says that you can be saved without belief, can you be saved by uh, non-belief. In other words, what I'm getting at is maybe there should be no evangelism because if let's say you're saved by being completely ignorant and God says, Oh, I'm, I'm a fair and just God. I'm not going to cast this, annihilate this person, <coughs> put them in hell because they didn't know. And then Rebecca gives a clear presentation of the gospel and a guy like me rejects it. Now I'm in trouble. But before, if I was completely ignorant, I might've gone to heaven. Yeah, well, I, I, you must have not been here earlier because I already talked about this. But, um, you know, I, I don't think like there's more to um, yeah, yeah. this life than just uh, somebody's echoing. Hold on. Um, I, you know, I'm not. I'm an evangelist. I love sharing the gospel. I'm not worried that what I'm going to share is going to end up condemning someone. I'm, I'm, sh but I'm also not worried that if I don't share it, that they will be condemned. I'm sharing it because it's good news and everyone should hear it. Right. But like, I, I, I think people can be saved without hearing it. Are you sure about that? Like think, you have, you have kids, like th there are certain yeah. things that you can tell your kids, which is the absolute truth, but can damage them. So you withhold that truth to protect them. <laughs> So I, how would I, oh, I, I, but you're assuming that if they hear it, if they hear it and they don't receive it, then they're in a worse situation than if they didn't hear it. And I don't think that's true. Okay. So you just deny that a clear, rejecting the clear presentation of the gospel can lead you to hell or annihilation. You reject that premise. Um, I, I'll read, let me read John chapter three that I read earlier, right? It says those who have not believed are condemned already. Do you hear me? Oh, yes, we can hear you. I had to mute you because you were kind of noisy, but we can hear you. Welcome, no, Susan. Noisy is a good word for it. <laughs> okay. Um, give me, I'm going to read a verse really quick. So, um, so, you know, it says that those, those who have not believed are condemned already because they have not believed in God's one and only son, right? But it goes on to say that the problem of their, their condemnation, it's not, it says, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people loved the darkness instead of the light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. So if someone is um, rejecting the light, it's because their deeds are evil and they don't want to be exposed. This is not, um, if I share the message and they don't accept it, how could they possibly be in a worse condition? Okay, so you reject, so if someone in Africa has never heard the gospel message, they still do evil things, yes? Well. I, do you mean are they perfect? Because the Bible has a right. A, they're not perfect. People, they sin. They're not perfect. No. Okay. So, so do you believe they're annihilated, go to hell, or go to heaven? If they're completely one hundred percent, they've never heard the name of Jesus. You <clears> see <throat> the problem here, Rebecca? No, I don't. Because the problem is you haven't listened. And I, I mean, look, I explained. This well, just ask the question. About Thirty minutes. Do you okay. think someone completely ignorant of Jesus and all of Christianity lives their life when they die? Will they go to heaven? 
that is unknown. Some will. Well, no, I'm asking for what you think. Yeah, and I'm I'm telling you what I think from my perspective. Some who have not heard the message will go to heaven. Some who have not heard the message will not go into God's kingdom. Okay, and how? And what's the difference between the some that do and the some that don't go to heaven? Have you read the parable of the sheep and the goats? So you see, that's a Calvinistic type answer, right? How? <laughs> Well, basically, God has, uh, he just chooses out of his, for his no. own glory. No, you, you need to brush up. It's been a while since you read the parable. No, the the you. Jesus Everybody gathered is. all the nations. Okay. In, in, in the parable, she, but you're saying, you're Jesus saying they do good God. works. So you're saying works will get you into heaven. Boom. Boom. That's what I'm saying. Works gets you to heaven. I'm saying you still need to be saved by Jesus. He's still doing the saving. But in the sheep and the goats, who's being accepted and who's not? But the the, the sheep hear his voice. I'm talking about the people in Africa who've never heard the gospel. The sheep are surprised they're being welcomed in. They're surprised. Why are they surprised? Why? They're surprised. When, Lord, when did we feed you? When did we clothe you? When did we do these things? Okay, so you're saying that nobody can know who goes to heaven and who goes to hell for the completely ignorant, is, but you can get a guess by according to their works? What I'm saying, I mean, we're not supposed to go around judging like whether people are getting in or not, right? We're, it says, don't say who's going to ascend to heaven and who's not, okay? But basically, I can tell anyone for sure that they're going into God's kingdom if they put their trust in Christ, right? But if they if they haven't, it's not for me to judge. But, you know, Jesus has said that by their fruits, you will know them, right? So, But can you know based on someone's works for sure if they're going to heaven? I can't know for sure. But, I mean, God knows the heart. So then we're back to square one. Like basically, no, basically the completely ignorant of the gospel, you're saying we should look at their works. I'm saying that's an indicator of where they're at. But a bad one because it's not as good as putting your trust in Jesus. Yeah. Okay. Like if you put your trust in Jesus, look, first Timothy 4:10. Jesus Christ is the savior of all people, especially of those who believe. You can be especially sure that you are saved if you're a believer in Christ. But there is salvation available for all people. So, okay, so you can be especially confident if you have the fruits. No. As a believer. You can be especially confident if you have put your faith in Jesus Christ. MJ, but say, that, your, say, but, say what you said before. You said the belief is like, you, you said it very oh, simply. <laughs> belief is, is uh, sufficient, but no, it's not, not, belief, not necessary. It's just, this is my provisional position. Belief is sufficient, but not necessary for salvation. I guess I'd say it like that. Rough, rough okay. sketch. But imagine two people, one who's a believer, heard the gospel message and accepted okay. it but is one of those uh, go to the bar on Saturday night type Christians sleeps around, does drugs occasionally, um, you know, just things that typically Christians shouldn't do lives in the world, acts like the world, but put truly put their faith in Jesus, but just is really bad at it. <laughs> and then you got someone who rejects the gospel message completely say, I don't believe Jesus was God and rose from the dead, but lives the pristine Christian life, like better than the 99% of all Christians on the planet. I'm hearing that the one who has the good works. Oh yeah. I'm describing myself. I'm hearing <laughs> that the, the one that has the good works is actually more risk of hell than the one who's a slough off. Well, remember hell is not an eternal conscious torment. I don't, you know. I know, I know, but even so, annihilation. Yeah. Well, so, it depends on what um, you mean by conscious. It depends on what you mean by Torment depends on what you mean by term. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, we won't get into that. But. <laughs> no, it's very but, nuanced. Um, right? <laughs> uh, um, so your problem is you don't want people to sin? No, I'm just saying that it seems like uh, if the belief is sufficient, but not uh, 
is doesn't have to be the all. Um, it looks like disbelief would be sufficient, though. Disbelief. It looks would be like sufficient for damnation, but belief is sufficient for salvation. Yeah. See, that's the thing. You can disbelieve and be damned, but still have better works than the one who believes and is saved. Correct. Yeah, I would say those works would be in a different mode, though. Yeah. And that just doesn't seem uh, fair or just to most human beings on the planet, I don't think. Why is the Great Commission so necessary or such an urgent thing, though? What did you say, Jamie? I didn't know. What is the Great Commission seems to be urgent. So what's that all about? Should we should we thank you? Historically, the Christians Um, were pretty strongly felt pretty strongly about it. Yeah, there was a sense yeah. of urgency. Great Commission is called to discipleship, coming. right? Yes. So we want people this to discipleship be discipleship is awesome, right? It's it. I I guess I'm I'm. I, I don't, don't think Pine that. Creek has understood the point at all. No, <laughs> I understand your point. Let me steal, man. You you basically said that okay. steal woman someone someone steal. completely ignorant steal. in Africa <laughs> um, can still be saved. Yeah. And but we, it's no guarantee, and uh, and one way you can get an indication of that, although it might be a bad one, is their works, or whether they're saved or not, right? Yes. Is that a summary of everything you said? Pretty much, but Wait, you're, if you I feel like understand it. How could you disagree with it? I'm just kidding. I'm sorry. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, what's well, I understand it? it and disagree with it. <laughs> yeah, the, the problem okay. with that is. It um, well, actually, it's not a problem per se. It's just it's how you lean as a Christian. Like, do you lean more that towards personal responsibility, human responsibility, or do you lean more towards God's God's responsibility? If you lean Calvinist, you would say, you know, God chooses His sheep and chooses the goats, and that's that. And if you're leaning non-Calvinist, you say, well, no, it's human responsibility to either um, respond to the gospel message or not, or reject it. And that's that. And I think Rebecca, you're oh, trying to see you're trying to hurdle put your feet in both. No, I'm not. I am so not Calvinist in any way. I have no Calvinist bone in my body. I, okay, what I makes a sheep a sheep? Boy, so I reject Calvinist. all five five points of Calvinism. Okay. Um <clears throat> what makes a sheep a sheep? Yeah, is it God or is it the human? It's the human. Is it being good or is it faith? And why do goats have to be the stereotypical evil? By the way? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> Poor Wait, goats. we haven't heard yet from Leo or uh, Slam Arin or Rob. So if anybody wants to chime in, please do. I'm just listening. Uh-oh. I think Rob got injured or something. Yeah, I think he had an accident getting his coffee. So, uh, hi, I'm Susan. Or slam around. Hi, Rebecca. Hi. We're Glad you're of, here. I don't know if you, you know that we She's are. famous. I'm famous. What do you yeah. want to say on this topic? Oh, I'm, you know, I think people can be saved without having heard the name of Jesus, but I think it's rare. I just don't think human our fallen human nature. I mean, it's relatively rare pe- that people are seeking a God and a savior um, and look and see, hey, you know, uh, you know, I, th- I think that there are people, uh, God made special people that, yeah, that uh, he's also, God has given uh, people dreams too. And can people hear me? Mm-hmm. Yep. We're listening. Okay. Yeah. I mean, he's uh, sent people to, you know, to set missionaries or people to certain people. I think there are times you could be on a on a desert island by yourself and if you believe there's a God and you're in need of a savior and you're a sinner, you can be saved. I mean, I'm not sure how it works, but I can see it working. Can I ask you a question for MJ? Unless Rebecca has something that she wants to say to that. Go for it. Um, MJ, you talked about belief being sufficient but not necessary. And I have a question about, I guess this might go into like modality a little bit, but if you take like a possible world where somebody, let's say somebody take, 
a person who um, believes and they're saved and you ask the question for any for any given person like that well what if they had never heard the gospel and had never believed it seems like it would be true to say for each of those people that they would have been saved anyway right if somebody's mindset is such that they would believe hearing the gospel um, then it seems to me like the belief isn't actually doing anything it's not actually playing any role in, in their salvation you get what i'm saying like take take two possible worlds one in which you hear the gospel and one in which you don't if if we're if it's if we're able to say in the world where you do hear the gospel and you do believe that um you're saved and you're saying you're saved um that through your faith doesn't that kind of imply that um if you didn't believe you wouldn't be saved if that's if there's not an entailment there then i'm it's not entirely clear what it means to me to or what it means to say that the faith is sufficient but not necessary the saying that the faith is sufficient implies that there is a causal connection between the salvation and the faith you get what i'm saying i was actually thinking the same thing but i i couldn't have worded it as well as you just yeah. did there chad but but that was something that i had i have been quiet because i've been thinking about and another question that popped into my head and mj obviously can address what you said first but is sure but be, be, belief is a sufficient condition but not a necessary condition um but what what are the necessary conditions can you answer my question first just so we yeah yeah ab so absolutely. Get this sorry <laughs> Uh, warning, I don't have all the answers, by the way. I'm going to think out loud. <laughs> I, I haven't read all of Geisler's easy answers to atheist questions books. Um, let me see. So let me try to let me try to understand what you're saying first, Chad. You're saying you have two you have two worlds, this world and another possible world in this world. Uh, when Chad hears the gospel, he he receives Christ when he hears it and, and therefore believes in him. And therefore, in this world, belief is necessary for salvation in this world but if if it's the case that in another world uh, he wouldn't he would have gone to heaven even if he didn't hear it because of his response to general revelation that means that's a that's a counter example to what i'm saying about let, belief being sufficient but not necessary for salvation let me try to like wrong. frame it more simply so like yeah and I, you uh -huh. may have characterized it accurately but what i'm saying is when you say that faith is sufficient for salvation for any given person and you, you say that somebody's through somebody's faith that they're saved that entails a counterfactual right and the counterfactual mm -hmm. is had they not believed then they wouldn't have mm -hmm. been saved if the if the salvation persists in both exam both the counterfactual and the the real world then in virtue of what is there any causal relation such that you could say that the faith is sufficient I can answer that for the Christian. Well, I think the causal relation, the causal relation would super would supervene on the indicative counterpart of the counterfactual proposition. To say that out loud, just really quick, but I would say this: I would say I agree with you that there is a counterfactual, but uh, I would relativize the truth conditions of counterfactuals to worlds and times. And so we got the actual world, Alpha, what's called Alpha, in this world, if you were to if you were to be sent the, the gospel and explicitly hear it, your explicit belief would save you. I don't know what the counterfactual would be if it were the case in this particular world that you would explicitly hear the gospel, whether or not, or if you didn't hear it, whether or not you'd still respond correctly to general revelation. That seems like an independent kind of counterfactual. I don't know how those truth conditions with those two counterfactuals would relate to each other. I honestly have no idea. Mm. I'm not sure. Chad, when I was a Christian, Let's Chad, when I was a Christian, I would just say there's two types of disbelief. One is uh, outright rejection, hearing it and rejecting it. And the other one is never heard in the first place. So that's the easy way to get around that. Mm. Um, I, that's not specific enough for me, though, because you can you can satisfy those two conditions, but still respond inappropriately to general revelation. Yeah, but general revelation means nothing. For salvation in my in my model it, it was that's what i was saying i think like, so you think you think hindus is general revelation, revelation a necessary or a sufficient condition yeah good question wait hold on so no no, no just to answer that so hindus i would say uh, so there's an explicit belief in hindu doctrine but what i'm saying is uh, it, it's all a matter of unpacking what it mean what that means to respond 
appropriately to general revelation because all paul says is you got the heavens above talking about his attributes or something and you got your conscience um i don't know exactly what that would mean if you're explicitly a hindu like you explicitly espouse hindu doctrine whether or not that's compatible with responding appropriately with general revelation i mean there's precedent at least in kierkegaard for that being an opportunity to be really saved it's not fundamentalism but i i don't I'm not a fundamentalist whenever um whenever i look at the trees i just just depends on the subjectivity i guess what's that i said when i see the trees i just did drives me to want to like hung you know <laughs> serve soup <laughs> no yeah i'm just trying to i'm joking not. i just no 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 it's true I, i've actually heard that too now with that see the trees kind of thing that's not convincing to me because I, I i'm of the opinion that you can actually get at different aspects of truth through redescription so you can redescribe and conceptualize general revelation in terms of the it sounds silly to say see the trees but then you can poeticize it and make it better. So MJ, I, I just want to know your personal belief. Do you believe that if a person looks at nature, mm -hmm. looks at general revelation and says, wow, I believe in a pantheon of gods, that they can be saved? Yes. Oof, the reason why I Christians say that mad is at because... You. <laughs> well, um, so, um, I, I, everybody is always mad at well, me. I make a distinct. I make a Kierkegaardian distinction between like objective affirmation of the, of different doctrine, and subjectively appropriating the way that doctrine's manifesting itself in general revelation. So I think I agree with Kierkegaard. I'm a Kierkegaardian. I think truth is subjectivity, and I think one of the ways that God communicates His message is through the creature subjectively appropriating general revelation. So, so do we you think that? Um, do MJ, do you think that mere belief in a deity, regardless of, of the kind or kinds, is sufficient for salvation? It's necessary, but not sufficient, I would say. Okay. Well, why is it necessary? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I inverted that. Sufficient, but not necessary. Sorry about that. My bad. Okay. Sufficient. So you know, yeah, that's yeah, that's just kind of belief. It's got to be, it's got to be like a, a kind of belief that like is different in content from the kinds of beliefs that demons have, right? That's what James talks about. They believe, but they're obviously. But if it's not necessary, right? then we really don't need Jesus. Depends. We still need depends Jesus on the, on to the, be on the creatures. It look. depends on how the counterfactuals are distributed in the world. I think we should still share the gospel, not because we see how it's going to work. But just because we're commanded to, That's right? So what? You don't what make would be unhappy? What would be some well, of the necessary describing. conditions for salvation? <laughs> What's well, that? but if, let's make a distinction. Do you need the knowledge of Jesus, or do you need Jesus Himself to be yeah, like in point. order to be saved? So I'm saying you need Jesus in order to be. What saved. about you Jesus? May do you not need? need? You need His sacrifice. For your okay. sins. And then, so you still and, have a problem. You're still because Jesus only came to. So Jesus years ago. is a necessary condition. Jesus no, is Jesus. absolutely Jesus necessary Jesus. for the salvation of any human yes. being. So every human being who has ever been saved. So so Jesus saved would be an example Jesus. of a necessary condition for salvation. I don't know phil philosophical yes. talk. That's yeah. I have no yeah, idea. Yeah, she's answering yes. I thought you liked my distinction. <laughs> I thought you liked it. Here, no, 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 no. But I so liked when, what you when said. We're, yeah. Uh, but they, it's kind of useless. It, it's kind of useless, though, Rebecca, to say that, or anyone here to say that Jesus is the necessary condition, his sacrifice, because you're admitting that the belief in him, the knowledge of him, is could be irrelevant. Could be, yes. That is, I'm but, fully but, admitting. But Christ, Christ's sacrifice because I, is still applied, though. Exactly. Respond, Christ's sacrifice is still relation. applied. That sacrifice he can happen if he didn't do this thing. Yeah, but it could be the sacrifice of Jim Bob, basically. So it's like that's anyway. a separate question. It's, it's so because Bob, everyone no. will eventually know that it was Jesus Wait, I got who saved analogy. them. I want my analogy to be uh, challenged. Okay. Um. So Wait. when when were photons discovered? You probably already know where I'm going with this. When were photons well, discovered? Late, late 19th century, early 20th century. What do you mean by discovered? Like, 
like Maxwell discovered them, I think late 19th century. Like, do you re are you wondering when electromagnetic radiation was first learned about, or when like actual oh. like oh, yeah. photons? He's Whatever. he's saying it's always existed, so, whether we discovered it or not. Right. Well, exactly. of course it has. I agree. You're the man. So, like, photons are necessary for us to see light. Like, the photons got to exist for us to see light. But our knowledge of that wasn't necessary for us to see light. Aristotle saw light. He had no idea what photons were, right? But knowledge? I think a lot of yeah. Christians would feel uncomfortable with that idea of, yes, Jesus is necessary, but whether you know about him, put your faith in him and trust him, you know, you can still go to heaven. That is a hard pill for a lot of Christians to swallow. I I am yeah, it subject is. And to that's correction why... by the body of Christ. If anyone wants to scold me, I'm I'm, I'm here. I've been I've been spanked a lot in my life. <laughs> so could, does that mean that uh, like who who is definitely out of going to heaven then? The wicked want to stay wicked. So like Probably the Hitlers you're, of the world. But what does that mean? Yeah, that's how really wicked do you have to be. Becca? <laughs> okay, I'll read. Okay, let me just read some descriptions of the wicked. There's quite mm. a few descriptions of the wicked. Like if I steal a pen from the oh, office, is that count as wicked? Um, yeah. <laughs> well, then everybody should um, go to hell. But wait, <laughs> okay, so hold on. Trust in Jesus. Hold on, Re Rebecca, you, can I ask you a quick question? Do you want to be saved from that tendency <laughs> to steal? Do you want to be <laughs> saved from it? Can I ask you a quick question, Rebecca? Sure. Um, The four-year-old that just takes a candy bar from from the the shelf at target like they're four years old they just wanted the snickers and they took it they so i mean they, they stole the candy bar is, is what they did a wicked thing this four-year-old just taking the snickers off the shelf no probably not they, why is it and so but what what if what if i walked in and wanted the snickers and took it off the shelf and and, and walked off out? With your would head. that be wicked would that be wicked yeah definitely. well okay so then what's the asymmetry what's the asymmetry there Knowledge. You know I, I don't see one. What's it's the problem? It's the age of accountability. Yeah, if, if 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 you don't see an asymmetry between those two scenarios, and I don't know what it is in virtue well, of that you're calling one wicked and one and, and one not wicked. Means. Yeah, what but it's asking a, Rebecca is why is it wicked in one case and not why is it wicked when it's uh, well, an adult do who I, does it, but not when a child. But that's, yeah, do I need to answer that? I mean, don't we all? understand the difference between an adult yeah, and a child. Yeah, we do. We don't have to answer it. I don't. Federal expectations. I don't under I don't understand. Answer the question. <laughs> I'll answer you for Rebecca. The truth. Because one has a knowledge and intent of what they're doing and that one doesn't. You don't think a four year old has a knowledge and an intent of taking that Snickers bar? No, not that it's wrong. They, some of them might even think, oh that's daddy's Snickers and I'm sure he would want me to have it. Well, what if I was an adult and thought Jesus, that? Jesus advocate. <laughs> well, then you, if you're an adult and thought that, yeah, I think uh, Rebecca would say that you you might be under that bar of accountability. Like you're talking about the severely retarded, right? It doesn't even matter. No, I wasn't talking order. about anybody specific. But the, the broader point here is <laughs> that obvi obviously what's wicked and what's not is going to have a basis in social standards. And so yeah. I, don't, I don't see how it's, it's really going to be important here. Well, what do you mean? It's not important who's wicked and who's not. Well, I mean, but that's, that's that isn't what's wicked and what's not. Ultimately, it doesn't have anything to do with God. It has to do with broader social and cultural standards that humans have developed. Well, in Thank some you. in some ways, yes. I mean, there are some things that would be, you know, horribly inappropriate in certain cultures and totally normal in others. Okay, so, but um, but I I, I think you know I can read you know, one of the descriptions of the wicked. So um, people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying its power, have nothing to do with such people. Okay, so there's yeah. a description. All of those are actually vague. Like, what what qualifies as any one of those things? Like, how how are we determining that? There, there's a lot of questions to be asked with respect yeah, well, to everything that you just said. Like, I don't think it's as outright descriptive as you seem to take it to be. Yeah, like, everyone could be doubted in question. Like, sometimes you ought to disobey your parents and not honor them at all, right? 
Right. True. And so, and sometimes people don't even realize that the love of money is dangerous and could lead to bad results. And so they say, what's wrong with loving money? Like, what well, really, what's the problem with it? And so if someone is coming from that mindset, you got to convince them, oh, this is wicked. Well, I mean, I, mean, I can't was... answer that question, Doug, but that, that topic is about uh, 40 miles away from the one we're currently on. <laughs> No, well, no, no. do you think there you, are people, do you think people have a conscience about what's right and wrong? What do you I mean when you say stuff, a conscience? Yeah. Are you talking like some well, internal, think, like, I'm just talking, do you have a system? sense? Do you have a sense of what's right and wrong? Uh, so how are you taking right and wrong to, to me oh, yeah, here yeah, yeah. specifically? Becca, define I'm not going to go on the moral need precision. Look. Well, I mean, okay. if you're going to talk about morals, you know, there, there are people that are going to take, that are going to have slightly different views with respect to what's right and what's wrong. Now, most just, people probably are going to take a normative view. What's right is what ought to be done. Let's, all things let's assume Rebecca's worldview, what's though. What's wrong is what ought not be done, all things considered. Let's just assume Rebecca's worldview, and that makes things simpler. And I just, yeah. I don't, I don't really want to just assume her. I think, I don't think that's very charitable. It's very charitable to assume her worldview. How good, how is that? That's the definition of charitable. I would like to assume her worldview. Hey, everyone. Hi. Charles. Hi. Hey there. Um, so earlier, Rebecca said that the uh, Bible was written by men that were inspired, right? So I wanted to say, that, do, you, like, do you guys all believe that I'm real right now? Yes. How are you? How are you taking real to mean? Uh, that's good enough. Um, so I just wanted to say that I'm inspired, and I have a magic cardboard piece that can determine whether you're saved. So, does anyone want to know whether they're saved or not? So you mean like a list? Not really. <laughs> Why not? Like you don't believe I'm real? I believe you're real. But you don't believe I'm inspired. No. Why not? Why? Um, well, there's nothing about what you're saying right now that sounds inspired. So, well, based on yeah, what? but that's what someone who doesn't want to believe would say, right? So, why are you applying special pleading, Rebecca? Oh my gosh! Uh oh. All right. Let's so, stay uh, on topic, guys. Let's stay creep. on topic. Wait, I have a, we were just getting somewhere. We were just going, getting somewhere. Do you think you're going to be saved? Me? Yes. Me? Because this this cardboard will tell you whether or not, and I, I will figure out. I, I will run. I'll pack it up. Go on. Yeah, the, the actual program on it, and it will determine whether you will be saved. So. Yeah. Sure. Doug, let me see. All right. Let me. Let me. Let me Oh, wow. All right. No, you're not oh. going to be saved. That's okay. I want to be annihilated. Right. Uh, Chad, how about you? Do you think you'll be saved? Um, If what you're telling me is true, I'm definitely going to hell. All right. Let me check. Yep. You're you're not going to be saved. Sorry. Um, so no, I'm inspired. This is always true, and it can't be wrong. Because I am a, a man, I'm an inspired man of God. So I'm just just the same thing that Rebecca said, you know, she believes the Bible is inspired by man. I'm inspired by man. I can't be wrong. I, like why but I don't, I don't think Rebecca like, wants I, to talk I about it. Game over, man. Game over. So Rebecca, hey, Rebecca? Right, let me, let me, Is there a thermal equilibrium with the fan that's spinning over your head that's causing you to be inspired? <laughs> yes. I mean that's a holy fan. That's actually not being spun by electricity. It's by God's will. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> God inspired the man who invented electricity. So and you're fans. you're speaking like those prophets that Isaiah mocked when he said those the spirits those those people that well mutter, I'm mocking mutter. Isaiah. He wasn't a true prophet. Again, special pleading. He does, does he so have? It's, it's interesting does, does how the biblical prophets themselves piece? mock those who uh, literally declare things that don't come from God. Well, did you see them do miracles? Because this is a miracle, and each time I go how do we determine what does and does not come from God? Well, I you just have to believe me. Otherwise, do you want to go to? It's a certain I mean, criteria. Like, when you like, when you look, it seems when you look like into you're ancient Near Eastern me. literature and how those people used to think, like when you look at it psychologically, 
the Bible gives a more naturalistic read. And in fact, the Bible uh, presents itself, or the authors of the Bible present themselves as more of an atheistic mindset than a superstitious what? mindset. What? what? That's not true. Huh? No, it is true. Atheist in terms of is that why you're an atheist? You like a, like in other words, if I was to use athe the the phrase of like a sloppy, I think you mean you know, the phrase like, secular. Like yeah, more much more secular than. You mean like the Yahweh God is like a Canaanite war deity, and like all that stuff. No, what I'm saying is the biblical authors present themselves as someone that Richard Dawkins would make would be more friendly with than the other superstitious writers of the ancient Near East. So why is he not a Christian then? That's that's a good question. That's something I would like to discuss with Dawkins. You think Richard Dawkins yeah. and, and Paul, the Apostle Paul, would get along? Do you want? Yes. Do you guys want to know if Richard what? Dawkins is saved? <laughs> uh, no, he's not. But the saved thing anymore. is, they're dead, and all we got is like secondhand, thirdhand, oh like knowledge at best. So not really a verified. R R R Rob, you're shocking me here. You're saying that if the Apostle Paul met Richard I've always one day you, <laughs> and said, uh, hey, Richard, uh, pleased to meet you. By the way, you know, um, I was on this road one day and I had the bright light and it was God himself. And he told me a lot of things. Richard Dawkins would open up his arms and embrace Paul. Oh, this is so cool. No, no. Richard Dawkins would expect some form of, like, you know, like a, the scientific enterprise to kick into place, like the scientific method, critical thinking, the Karl Popper method. Yeah. But and what I'm saying say... is within, within Paul's writings, Paul then says things that, that literally match the skepticism of, say, the writings of Richard Dawkins. Like what? Uh, it's just interesting how he writes and how not just Paul, any biblical author, the way they speak with such skepticism. Give an example of that... something Paul would say that Richard Dawkins would say right on. Okay, Hopefully so not the first paragraph of God delusion. <laughs> I think he's like, well, what he's saying is that they're both kind of dogmatic. What was that? What was that, what was that paragraph, Rob? That parasitical. What was the yeah, most yeah, yeah. long name thing? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> like Galatians. Well, it's just kind of a Paul. major prophet, I guess. I guess he's talking like a major prophet. <laughs> Galatians four, you said. Preface or chapter. Yeah, one? if you go, if you go to verse, let me bring it up. Um, this is an example. If you go to verse uh, 8 down to 10, uh, in fact, even verse 11 would be a typical Dawkins way of talking. Where are we right now? Galatians what? All right. Well, everyone in the chat, if you wanted to know if you're saved, it's a big no. This will always be true because being saved is wishful thinking and wishing something is true doesn't make it so. Sorry, Christian. I wasn't here. Sorry, so Muslims. Yes. Sorry, cargo cultists. <laughs> They're all wrong. I wasn't here, guys. I'm sorry. I'm the only exception. <laughs> what? I, I... Oh, Travis left. Why did he leave? This Rage is what <clears throat> this is what Galatians eight to eleven says. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who, by nature, are not gods. But now that you know God, or rather, are known by God. How is it that you're turning back on those weak and miserable forces? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? You're observing special days, the months, seasons, the years. I fear for you that somehow I've wasted my efforts on you. How would Dawkins mm -hmm. resonate with that? So when, so when Paul says that you are turning back to those powerless and bankrupt basic principles, in, in the Greek, it's literally the, the so-called elemental spirits. Now, the... the, uh, the um, <clears throat> The key verse is actually verse ten. You're observing days, months, seasons, years. It's like a, it's like a little bit of a hint, saying what Paul's thinking of in, in this, in the context of Galatia. So, for example, Jupiter was the planet associated with Zeus. Um, you know, all those legends, those Greco-Roman legends. So Paul is saying those things oh. are just natural objects in the night sky. They're not I see what you're gods. saying. Yeah, but what? Yeah, I understand what you're saying now, but I think he would give the Ricky Gervais line to the Apostle Paul. I just believe one less God than you do. <laughs> oh, but but here's the thing. So Paul is saying something that then defines what an atheist means in that culture. So in other words, yeah, okay. The the phrase atheism today has totally lost its original meaning. 
Um, there's no association with these entities. It's not denying the exist existence of these entities. It's it's like I'm an atheos to these yeah. entities. Yeah. Yeah. That and I that was one of the first things I asked you, but I don't think you heard me when I said it like five minutes ago. Uh no, I wasn't here. No, I only just came in the room. Robert, like when I, I followed the Chicago Bulls in the nineties. Oh, sorry. Sorry. I was just gonna ask um if Rob agrees with Rebecca's main stance on the main topic about belief being required for salvation. You mean oh, not required. Or not required, yeah. There's no requirement for belief. What? I said, believing in Jesus, you can be sure that you are saved. But it doesn't mean that those who don't believe, either because they haven't heard the message or maybe they, you know, I don't know. There, there could be other Jesus. factors. Yeah, exactly. But that belief is not necessarily required to be saved. You can you can not have the information about the plan of salvation and still be impacted by what Jesus did. Actually, no, I agree with that. My favorite would be, yes. again, coming back to Paul, um, in Romans 10, verse 18, he speaks about, well, he, he quotes Psalm 19 in a very interesting way. He's like, doesn't, like before verse 18, doesn't, he's like, doesn't, like people, the only way people can hear about the message is that if people are sent, and then he quotes from Isaiah, like, aren't, aren't the feet of those who send the message, you know, beautiful? And, yeah. mm -hmm. and then verse 18, he's like, but then what about those who haven't heard? Have they heard? Well, just to be clear, though, you know, her position is, is stronger than that. She's saying even people who have heard the gospel and don't and don't believe can still be even those people can be saved, which is a little bit of a stronger claim. Do you, do you agree with that as well? Wait, so those who've heard the gospel, but they don't believe, but they can be saved. Yeah, yeah. I'm not saying they will necessarily be <laughs> saved, but I'm saying they can hear the message in a way that like somebody can present a view of Christ that's not a good view of yeah, Christ. Yeah, like... for me, that's not fantastic. What's fantastic for me, and we have an example of this with the Magi, that this is where I was going with this. So, like, Paul gives a very, like, rhetorical question. He's like, but, but did they hear, or did people hear? And then he quotes Psalm 19 that speaks about the ecliptic of the sun, which then, in that culture, you're talking about astrological stuff. So, therefore, um, well, we have an example. Take me instead of the in, Magi. Like you guys know me, I think everyone here knows me or knows of me. Yeah, but you do, you already know the gospel. You I know, already, you've I know, read it, and I and I've rejected translated. it. So here's my question to Rebecca and anybody else here: I've rejected. I've heard the gospel in many different forms. I've rejected all of those forms. Do you think it's possible for me to be saved? No. In that condition, I, no. I would make I still think it's possible. I still think I would still where, open the what door. What I find fascinating is that the now. Magi, how did they know the story? How did they know to find Jesus from coming from a Babylonian pagan context? And that's Paul's little hint in Romans 10. So, Rebecca, you said that is still possible? or I still believe it's possible. Okay. And you base that on what scripturally? Okay. Well, I'm, 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 I'm basing it on now I, I, for you. I'm only leaving open a very small possibility. Granted, but it's possible. I think you're actively working as an enemy gotta, of Christ. You're saying there's a chance. Okay. Okay. Yeah, you're saying there's a chance. Good girl. Good girl. Well, but in your present condition, in your present condition. But see, I have hope that you won't yes. stay in this present condition. But the so, same thing analogy, said by the uh, reverse. Analogy. So, analogy. analogy. Yeah. What do you mean? Let MJ say. MJ that. wants to say something. Hold on. My mic's still. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. if you jump into the pool, it's impossible not to be wet. But it doesn't follow from that that you can't get out of the pool and be, be dry. Yeah, but I so said in my current state, situation, like being in the, like yeah, you're in the pool, never change the and then right I now. die. You Rebecca, stay in the you pool, think I can be saved? I still think it's possible. Yeah. But you can still it get is, out of yeah. the pool. So, Doug, Look. I'm, I, I'm, I'm going to sympathize now. with Rebecca here. Like, in early faith tradition, in the early Christian faith tradition, like, in your dark moment, whatever, you know, that transitions period that whatever happens, like, that ultimately will lead to God. 
if we're just looking at the raw data points, your association with the gospel is you clearly reject it. Yep. So my judgment is, I don't know, like I, I'll see you as not part, yeah, I wouldn't see you as a Christian brother, like, but I'll see you as a brother in humanity, but I don't see you as a Christian brother. But again, God's greater than me and your discussion with him, if that does happen, it's up to you. So well, are you changing your answer now? Because you said emphatically no. But no, again, just... I'm I was clarifying why. So I'm still saying no, but I'm saying in the dark moment for each one of us that I'm it's very clear in, in the early Because it could be true that I'm more tradition. immoral than you, Rob, right? And Rebecca combined. It could be, yeah, in your yeah. personal life, yeah. So works yeah. have nothing and that, to do And that's with part it. of that discussion as well, yeah. Impossible. I'm just kidding. Wait, if you if you do you a, think you are more moral? I don't know. I don't know more, either more, one of you. You guys really don't know me, so we can't judge that. Only God knows. Rebecca. <laughs> yeah. Exactly, Rebecca, and I, I, make... I agree with Doug on that. Like Doug could be much more righteous than me. I don't know. So we could so just be on the same clear, Rob, your your position, Rob, is that um you can be saved if you don't believe, but you've got to be one of those people who's never heard the gospel. And once you've heard the gospel, then so you sound more like the kind of person who's susceptible to the argument that Doug was running earlier about um, whether we should go, out, whether people should even go out and evangelize if the if the goal is to um, save as many people as possible. And if no, 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 no. I, I, again, uh, for example, when Paul was talking on Mars Hill with, to those pagan philosophers, he's like, "Look, doesn't your own poet say that?" He's ever so near. He's always there. There's, you know, even, even Jesus gives analogies. God is gracious to the unkind and the kind. And like, at the end of the day, if the gospel story is true, the fact is, whether we like it or not, the Jesus stuff did happen, like the crucifixion, the resurrection, all, and then all that theological stuff that God utilizes, you know, forgiveness of sins and all that cosmic stuff, right? So whether we like it or not, that's a, f that's happened. Now, how do we? What do we do with that? And again, in early Christian tradition, you, Christians were very comfortable with the fact that, I mean, okay, let me let me just say this. They even extended it out to like what they call the the principle of plenitude. Like, what if there's other worlds? What if there's like an ET? Yeah. Like, you know, the, how does God work with that? So they they even extended it out to that. How do they hear the gospel, or do they need to hear the gospel? And so this this is a topic that's been discussed, and then. It's it's just come down to well at the end of the day what where the where the where the line is drawn is literally death and then once you transition over to whatever happens next that's when God sort of meets you at that level I suppose and yeah so can I ask you Rob the same question I asked Rebecca earlier <clears throat> like when I asked you the question do you think in my current state I could be saved you said no. Uh, what if I'd never heard the gospel, like not even close, never had Christian friends, whatever, completely ignorant? There would be a greater chance I'm saved, yes? Um, I don't, I don't know. I, uh, I don't know, because like, again, there could be, because what the scriptures are saying is that there's, it seems like there's, a, they, they cancel out. It's like those who don't know the gospel, but whatever circumstances in their life sort of accumulates to the equivalent of, say, someone who knows the gospel. It's kind of like first world issues versus third world issues, but then this, the wait, third wait world issues... Someone who knows the uh, we, clear We do a false dichotomy between the two, right? So No, but you got two people. Person A heard the gospel, rejects it. Person B never heard the gospel, nothing to reject or accept. Who's more likely to go to heaven? I don't know enough. I don't the answer that. is yes, <laughs> according to Paul. That's that's you, my point of Romans ten. You gave a a, yeah. a no for me, an emphatic no. I'm I, saying no because of the within the context of you knowing the data point of the gospel within that closed yeah, system. So that's speak, what I'm talking right? about. That person A knows the data so point. So if you and then if you it. willfully re reject it, then but then the same applies to those who may not have heard the gospel in say the King James English. Uh, they may have heard it in some. No, other no. Language, I'm saying a person but, who's never heard the gospel at all, completely 100. Yes, yeah, but ignorant. but again, in that worldview, you can't. There's still always a data point according to the scriptures that will still connect it to a gospel-like message. Like what? So in other words, What's the gospel is inevitable for for anyone. What's that data point that connects it to mm -hmm. Jesus? The completely ignorant so like, person of the gospel. 
So like, for example, the Magi, they, they never heard the gospel. But how do they know about Jesus and him being the Messiah and so on? No, but then they're, about, they're, they're not completely ignorant. What's known as redemptive then. analogies and nature, and they're not completely ignorant. Then I'm talking about someone who's completely ignorant of anything what, to do with he's, Jesus. He's a what? He or she's a baby? Then no, no. You can imagine people that's, that's today. That's literally pure ignorance in that sense. Imagine a secluded tribe in Africa, like the they, people they, in the movie they, Apocalypto that Mel Gibson made, <laughs> or, or even the recently that guy who that missionary got killed on the beach. Like imagine someone who. Never heard of the Old Testament, never heard of the New Testament, never heard of the Magi, never heard right. of anything. Isn't yeah, it more likely, according to your theology, that they will go to heaven before me? It's possible. No, no, no. Because there's stuff that they do that ironically mimics what you see in the gospel narrative and just generally speaking about life and, you know. So Pine Creek's point is, if it's possible, you shouldn't be risking it. Yes, you shouldn't be evangelizing. But you gave first of all, this I, assumes. I this, this, wait, hold up, hold up. I want to say something. This assumes that when you show up to share the gospel message, you're the first one there, and I don't think that's true. I think the Holy Spirit has already been speaking to people, and so when Here comes you the do Calvinist share the, in you. What's that? Here comes the Calvinist in you. How is that Calvinist? That's not Calvinist. It's not. Sure, it is. But yeah. Yeah. What the first mover Calvinism? being the Holy Spirit is Calvinist doctrine. How, Doug, how no, do you explain Don, look, Don Richardson's I mean, peace trial, for example? This is like. the Bible. It says the Holy Spirit was poured out on all flesh, right? So the Holy Spirit is speaking to everyone. So you're not the first one when you get there with the message. Okay? So God has already been speaking. He's already been revealing himself. Even if you have not... Even if somebody hasn't heard that Jesus Christ was crucified, it doesn't mean that God hasn't already been speaking to them. So, I mean, I, I this is kind of a weird um, scenario that you're presenting. Well, either way, you don't need missionaries then, because if God's already doing the revealing, you yeah, can but God is than allowing humans. us God, to be That's the point part of Romans of his, 10. <laughs> that God but is allowing us to be part oh, of his, boy. Um, you know. Well, you're, we're green, Rob. You <laughs> said but, um, What I'm saying is, Doug... That then, Paul in Romans 10 <laughs> gives a very interesting sort of like logical deduction about I know there's this Who's thing known as the Great Commission, but then what oh happens God. if Leo? ASMR. <laughs> Sorry? Leo's eating an apple. I don't think Rebecca was done. No, I'm not. Oh, who was it then? Chris? Okay, no, no, it look. was you, man. I know. No, Rob. I was talking about You're not eating an apple. Well, I do have one more thing to say on this topic. When you say that people are rejecting, you also have to understand that there are different reasons for rejecting. Now, if a Muslim hears the gospel for the first time and rejects it, is that going to be surprising if their religious teaching for their entire life has been the words of the Quran, Jesus is not the son of God, God has no partner, blah, 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 blah. Then you can understand that there. Who rejection... cares about whether it's the first time or second time or a hundredth time? I'm just talking about rejecting. You die rejecting. If you die okay. rejecting, you think it's still possible to go to heaven. Rob says no. I'm possible. saying it. Well, I'm saying depends. no based on my finite, my opinion. It's it's a subjective opinion. Right, based and on it's what Rebecca's I... opinion too. The scripture's not clear on it, right? Or is scripture it? is not clear, but the scriptures Jesus are not clear. Does say and Christian Jesus... tradition is, yeah. No, sorry, Rebecca. Yeah. Look, Jesus does say all the sins and blasphemies of men will be forgiven, even when they blaspheme the Son of Man. But the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. So, and what does that mean, though? I don't know. I'm not saying it's association clear. <laughs> association with with Satan. It's basically like, true. In other words, associating, associating Jesus and his work in your life, even if you're an atheist, but, it's, but actually deliberately becoming a Darth Vader, really. Um, Darth Vader. I don't know if you saw the new Obi-Wan series, but <laughs> so when I Anakin's say on my like, show, I killed oh, Anakin. It's excellent. Like, yeah. excellent. So when I excellent. say on my show I'm a servant of Satan, that uh, he's my boss, so that's basically blasphemy. No, but that's, <laughs> no, that's just flipping mocking, Doug. Like, you actually have to deliberately be what the Pharisees was telling Jesus in that moment. But Rob, Rob it's so because then... you don't believe that 
Doug is a servant of Satan and all that stuff because Ooh. we don't believe that it's true. Oh my gosh. No, 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 no. But, I'm explaining Doug... what that phrase means about blaspheming the Holy Spirit. What in that Jewish culture, what that meant to those people. So I gotta really believe in Satan in order for me to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. You have to literally be breathing and living Satan like literally, like actually. Yeah. Is there any examples of that in history? Yeah. The utmost evils have, have always been done through a certain psyop, through you know the dark forces. I, I believe Hitler would could be one of them easily. Unabomber. <laughs> so you're saying Hitler did what he did because Satan? Yeah. Doug, did you be surprised you say... by the uh, the occultic okay. uh, associations that the Nazis were in? Yeah, but how how many people did Hitler kill? Less than Yahweh. He technically didn't kill anybody. <laughs> That's, That's the point I'm getting at. Hit, Hitler technically didn't really kill <laughs> a, anybody. He was, was just Satan the person who, who was at the head of, well, of, of the... So you're saying, you're saying the 79 quadrillion tons of biodeposits in Earth's crust is on God's head, basically. Uh, no, Earth's probably he, he has his body count from World War One. But Well, I mean, I, I would say that the Holocaust is on is on God, yes. I, I, I would say that that is entailed by classical oh, Christian. That's fired. That's fired. What were we going to ask Rebecca? No, the Holocaust oh, no. is not because of God. Oh, no. <clears throat> this goes back now to yeah, our prior have, discussion with Doug. Like, who's, who's responsible? And... Well, we have a request to read this um, scripture, which probably most of you are already familiar with. Since what has been made known, okay, the wrath of God is being revealed. Since what has ma been made known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. Yeah, notice, no, notice what it is not, not obvious being understood. Me. Yeah, like, for example, God is a trinity is not obvious. Is it universal? Sure. Is that speaking of all people? I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm questioning that at this point, but I think that's a common idea. But uh, no, that passage is talking about. No, 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 no. That, are you reading Romans one? Because that passage yeah. is talking about Adam and Eve, not everyone. Yeah. Okay. Good. The the logical Both induction of that is Paul saying, one upon, once upon a time, the early humans, Adam and Eve being one of them, they knew about all this stuff, and then their hearts became darkened and. Well, I mean, in application, though, does that should we be applying that to all humans then? Uh, there is a trickle effect, um, and that's that, that's where he in Romans. That's where it leads to Romans five because it's like Romans five. It's Most like Christians do. Okay, remember that one man situation with sin entering the world. Well, now death is a problem to everyone. Yeah, but but could it be just talking about a particular group? Like, as I know, there's probably the same scholars that say you know want to make this distinction with like the sons of god type of thing or being like the line or whatever I, I forget how to exactly articulate it but i mean is there people then that don't actually see god's attributes in the creation i'm wondering if that could be the case oh no yeah, i think i think paul is clear on that again in romans 5 he's like even over those who didn't sin the same way as adam so he's he's differentiating between like you know, like those pre-Adamite views and co-Adamite views. So it's not yeah, just Adam and Eve in the garden. There's humans elsewhere, and yeah. You know. Right. That's what I'm getting at. Is it is it just a line of Adam that he's talking about, or like what we'd call later the Hebrew people? Maybe. I mean, I don't know. Did those are those other groups he, included? To Paul, take that view? The whole point of the whole point of Romans is justification through faith alone. So what he's doing is he's he's building up a case for that. He's starting, and so what he's doing is he's. He's actually giving a commentary on Genesis. So he's starting with Genesis 1, working through the whole, basically the whole book of Genesis, but then focuses on Abraham. And you see that right throughout. And then the so-called promise, you know, through Isaac. And, and then finally he ends in Romans 9 to 11 about this, like Israel being the model for the Messiah to come through. Right. Romans 10 gets into the, uh, uh, in the midst of that, Romans 10 gets into the whole, like, how are people saved? You know, when the message is sent out, and oh, but hang on a second, I have a psalm that says that anyone can look at, at look at the ecliptic, and in other words, a poetic way of saying they can just look at anything in life, and somehow God will meet them at that point, like the Magi. Um, 
So, but that's not what happened with the Magi. The Magi had heard the legends, and so they were um, operating on that. Magi didn't look around at the sky and say, "I think I just, you know," and then just like come up with the gospel idea on their own. Like that didn't happen. Actually, the you'll be surprised. I've done a whole two-hour, very special, like video study on the birthday of Jesus. Like when was Jesus born and. We can actually go. There's there's a lot of documentation about what no, the magi were thinking. No, don't go there. And, no. Uh, what what okay, are magi? Like, guys, purely from, guys, purely guys, from let's a stay on topic. Context. Let's stay on topic. But let's welcome Michael. I think this is his first time here. So welcome. Hey, thanks for having me. Hi, Did Michael. You have you wanted to share on this? <laughs> yeah. No. I, I'm just curious about what you know. Magi aren't they magical people? Doesn't Yahweh want magical people to be stoned to death? I mean, no, they're not there's a whole other topic them. there. There's a rabbit there was They had college degrees. <laughs> <laughs> they were the stars with the knowledge of the unknown and the forbidden because you people don't really like education. So we I have, have a Babylonian almanacs that give a very detailed account of the retro retrograde motions of, say, Jupiter, and and it's it's un unbelievable the accuracy by which they you know they did that stuff. Yes, but nothing about the almanac or astronomy or anything else like logically deduces a person into something that like resembles the gospel stories. It just you it can't does that. because they had in their religious because they associated religiously the alignments of certain planets. So, for example, you have Jupiter and Saturn having a close shave, and because of the refraction of say the light coming through its atmosphere. It looked like Jupiter was reaching out to touch Saturn. So they were superstitiously going, it's like King Jupiter is reaching out and passing on the bat back to, say, Saturn. And that they're seeing this as a, like a new world order and, and a new king that's going to rise. And, and sure enough, we have records of them being friends with Herod. So it's very, it's, it's, it's just interesting how Matthew's gospel accurately portrays them coming to Herod's court to discuss with Herod, this is what we've seen, we're predicting something new here, There's, where's this king of the Jews? And sure enough, they don't know the scriptures, so they have to turn to the Jewish scribes to, to you know, and they ask them that question, they then point to Micah. And yeah, it's just interesting, the you know, the timing of it all. Um, Romans 12 then gives a detailed account about the position of the moon, where the sun is, where Virgo is, exactly the sort of alignment that the Magi were looking for. And um, so you're saying that the Bible God uses <laughs> astrology in order to convey his truths to humanity? Well, that's in that context, and that's again coming back to Romans 10, why Paul mentions the ecliptic using Psalm 19. Um, as an example of, again, God meets them where they are at. In this case, if it's astrological, if you can meet them there. Or people just uh, use the current culture to make up stuff. Yeah, that. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I mean, it's not like now with stuff modern science, I can look to the universe, I Big know. Bang. See, oh, no, God's behind the Magi. Yeah. yeah. So I have a <clears throat> question oh. about the salvation oh, thing when we get a chance. Yeah, go for it. Why? So for for it being the the golden ticket that gets you into heaven to believe that Jesus Christ was a real person and died for our sins, like why? How, how is that even remotely morally relevant to a person's moral character, whether or not they believe that hmm. the, this is a story that actually happened? I was going to ask that too. Good question. Well, um, it's morally relevant because when you trust in Jesus as your savior, you're born again you are born of the spirit you have the spirit of god come dwell in you and you are made holy and righteous by god well, so you're talking about something that happens after enough. i'm talking about but why can't god just do that to everybody mm. everybody doesn't want that calvinist <laughs> yeah but why does it matter i mean if that's what god wants his will well, be done yeah exactly um, what God wants most is for um, people who want to be in his family to be in his family. He doesn't want to force you. So you're, It's not possible for everybody to want to be in his family? Hmm. Sorry. You gotta it's want possible. To want. It's possible. So then why, if that's possible, then why isn't that world the one that exists? 
because God gave you free will. Mm -hmm. Right? So it's not possible for everyone to have free will and you know, no, it's possible love Jesus? that every it's possible that every person who has free will could freely choose to be part of God's family. Or not. I just don't understand then why an, an all an all powerful, all loving God wouldn't wouldn't then instantiate that world. Why couldn't he determine? Also, who free gets will? free will? Does everybody get free will? Because we have a lot of people in the Bible that don't get free. You will. get free will. You get free will. Who you in the Bible free. doesn't get Sorry. free will? Well, I'm just going to read off of Ezekiel fourteen nine, and if the prophet is enticed to utter a prophecy, I, the Lord, have enticed that prophet, and I will stretch out my hand against him and destroy him from among my people of Israel. Objection, Your Honor. Exception. Somebody here. He's inter influencing. He's interfering in the lives of other people this is this is not free will or judas uh, the pharaoh there's another instance there uh there's there's lots of instances in the bible where was judas free not to betray get free jesus will. so yeah see there you go yes so so how do we know who gets free will and who doesn't well is that saying do you think that's saying that that person never experiences free will in any situation Okay, so because they experience free will for the rest of their lives, except except for this one point, it's okay. Yeah, I mean, look, there's lots well, that's of not natural free will, situations. That's not complete free will, though, Rebecca. Look, you could be knocked no, unconscious no, and you on. have no free well, will. Are you then are you reading? Are you two reading? Weeks, you know, for when, however long. So when you just read Ezekiel 49, 14, like, nine. yeah. Yeah. Notice verse, right. 14. surrounding that passage, uh, surrounding that verse, British you already have a Babylonian polemic taking uh -huh. place between verses 1 and 8. And then because it's a Babylonian polemic, uh, you have an example of, for example, from verse 12 onwards, this notion of non... Uh, like, for example... You know, oh, the crap. Daniel mentioned non context. Are you, are you yeah. getting that the is, context? That is, Rob, not, Rob, that is not the context. Let's not get, I don't want to go this, off no, but this, on this. But this is, this is important context, with respect Rob, to the makes, context of the passage. That, then. Yeah, screw I, that, I, then. I find it okay. absolutely Rob. ridiculous Rob. when you go outside the context <laughs> of the book. Rob, please. Why are you saying Rob, Rob? What is the context of chapter 14? No, I'll tell you you're right. It is relevant. Us away. Yeah, you're carrying context, us away from. I can explain point. this to Rob in a way he can understand. Okay. It's because it, ahead, it's Doug. because it's irrelevant, Rob. Because the main issue here was 100% free will versus non 100% free will, and Rebecca says it's still free will because it's even though it's it not is free, free will, will because you have God Himself in verse seven saying, "I will answer this false prophet who's speaking behind my back." Then it leads to verse nine. <laughs> That doesn't help um, the situation look, any. Guys, and then we can just when I say God give us free will, okay, I'm going to explain. When I say God gives us free will, I don't mean absolutely in every circumstance, yeah, every point. minute, every person has it. So then why can't God what make us all believe in him? Have? You can be knocked there unconscious and not have it. Whoa. You can be you go. go mentally insane and not have it. You so we're can, just mostly free. So how come we can't all believe in God and not have it in just that one instance, but then have free will with respect to literally everything else? Why, why would God not create that world? It seems you're saying that one would be better than this one. <laughs> You could believe. Try it. Leo, it also. sounds like you have a lot better idea how to run the world than yeah. God does. <laughs> yeah, that's but not really a response. Really God's idea. I mean, no, but does. I mean, it's so not really so a response to the question I can't tell you why God... <laughs> Objection. Well, well, I can't. The reason I'm answering that way is because I sense. can't answer for why God has done such and such. I can answer for what he has done, not why. No, you could. I don't Rebecca, know you why. could just tell Leo that he did it that way because he wanted to. It's no. all his will. His yeah. will be done. This is all part of the plan. So when, so yeah, but like then in, in that but, instance, everything which occurs just ought to occur because right, God yeah. has some sort of desire. And then uh, that I think that's just to say there is no evil in this world. We are living in the best of all possible worlds because yeah. everything which occurs ought to occur. There is yeah, nothing exactly. that occurs that ultimately anyway, ought not to occur, all things this considered. Is, this is why I like um, deterministic Calvinists better than other Christians, because it's very consistent. It's just more it weasley. Is it is it's more very boring. Weasley. Really? Is you actually a domino like effect Calvinists better no, no, than I, other I, Well, no, it makes God look like a schmuck. But it is consistent <laughs> because 
it, a, a Calvinist could answer Leo very easily. God made it this way and not a different way because for his glory. And that's case closed. If you don't like it, then Wait. grow a backbone. Wait, you, you so there's no possibility James for infinite dominoes to fall. God did it. Always works, man. Well, the infinite dominoes is irrelevant because God actualized <laughs> that one uh, timeline, hmm. saw it before it would happen. So it's irrelevant. Hmm. Again, God gave free will, knowing I... that people would reject is God, him. And he God is initializing it, or is it the system that's initializing that given domino oh. because of the hour of time? God did it. That's always the answer. God did it. No matter what. Rob, we went created. through this the other Who created day. the error? All you have to do is ask yourself a question. What came first? God, did God it, or the system? Your answer has to be God. So God, the buck stops at the mm -hmm. top. Mm-hmm. But he's not he's not responsible for where he's the time goes for. Right. Remember, but God's responsible, responsible for their existence, he's, but not he's a hundred percent responsible, responsible for everything he for everything he creates, including free will. Well, I'm not a Calvinist, so I'm just gonna existence of that's that's my last you know, answer on that. I think God is responsible just in virtue of him being both omnipotent and omniscient. Yeah, definitely. Hmm. And I think Killing. if you weren't om omniscient, if if you could drop at least that one, I think that you could Wait, you could remove God's responsibility. But if God, if God like creates like thing, <laughs> knowing what's going to result from the thing, with the intention to create the thing and thereby every result which follows, then I just don't understand in what sense God isn't every, responsible. Every single thing everybody's saying is like dropping a mic and walking away. We gotta we gotta. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Come on, wait, wait a second. <laughs> I, I'm listening for the audience in the background to go, oh. But let's get this back to Rebecca. You said something uh, when you were asked Joe, you're about much free will. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. How free do you think we actually are? Because no, no, keep laughing, man. Let's go. Doesn't the scriptures actually say that it's a spiritual battle, a spiritual warfare? Like, aren't we yeah. being influenced by God and the angels and also yes. Satan? And so mm. even the idea of believing and putting your trust in Jesus, how much of that is the human and how much of that is God? Well, I think God is, you know, actively working to bring people to himself. So God is part of it for sure. So then why hasn't everybody been brought to God? I'm still God's waiting. Yeah. Yeah. God is all powerful. Resisting, guys. Yeah. Where's Leo, my soul? Where's my soul? The Paul moment, Rebecca. I don't, I guess I don't know what it means. Himself to me. I guess I don't know what it means to resist an all-powerful being. <laughs> right? Who knows everything about you? Who knows exactly what it would be, or what it would cause to have me be convinced? He knows, but he still hasn't done it. Because mm. he wants you to go to hell. But okay. <laughs> exactly, I, he's got a plan for me. And my plan, so the plan for me is about this, to you know, burn forever. But do you guys not see That's that? God. Yeah, God's up there, like, hey, right you see now. him right there? Yeah, fuck that guy. Yeah. <laughs> no, one second. What is it? Oh my god! Oh, F bomb. <laughs> oh, oh, sorry. Oh, totally. That was so yeah. cool. Oh, the whole Didn't video has to come down recently. now. You ruined it. <laughs> it was so funny though. Deepak, what do you want to say on this topic since you just got here? Ah, uh, well, actually, you know, one thing I could say is like. uh so I'm still catching up on the uh, the Rebecca Pine Creek Rob show. I'm in the last episode where I was <laughs> listening to the <laughs> I was listening to the debate about like you know who's responsible, the one percent, the gun thing. I actually have a, a something that might help resolve. Like I, I think there like, I think the, the the resolution is people are talking about different things. But if you want to stay on this topic, I mean, if there's time we can talk about. I'm it. interested to hear your take on that. That discussion. Okay. Me too. Yeah. So this might help Doug understand at least in a sense, I think, what Rob means, right? Um, so Doug, like, you know how like some people say, uh, let's say, okay, there's two examples I can use. I'm gonna use the the more uh dangerous one, um, the more controversial that's, one. That's so, the man. Yeah. So, anyway, so you know how Ice people have girl, right? so you have a girl, right? Like let's say you have a young uh pretty woman who wears like sleepy clothes and walks down the street in the middle of like 3 a.m., right? Yeah, I've seen and that then, so many times. Yeah, and she gets sure. uh, uh, she gets assaulted and uh, and and raped and stuff. And, um, and stuff. then the question is like, well, are you to blame for that or not? Right now, Doug, like, what percentage of of uh, responsibility? Let's it's say, a trap. Just, yeah, it's what, above what zero. 
Ah, okay. So, okay. I, I thought you would say that, right? Yep. But can you understand a perspective where someone yeah. would say, I think she is 0% responsible. If she wants to walk down a street wearing what she wants, she should right. absolutely have the right to do it. And it By is... By the way, God is the pretty woman. I just want to point that out. Yeah, that is a pretty... <laughs> but, but do you understand that perspective? Yeah, like, those are bleeding hearts who say that. Do you understand it? Though? Like, <laughs> yeah, of course I understand it. Because... Yeah. 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 But the thing is, if you have a situation where... <clears throat> you are not ignorant and know that hey if you go down that street wearing that and the history has told us that you know three times out of ten you'll be raped yeah. and the person says okay i'm willing to to play the odds like you're responsible right the, han solo but, says don't tell me the odds <laughs> but, but, even no, though he responsibly tell partially responsible. never tell me the odds yeah ever <laughs> So no, this okay. Can I can I can I sort of re restate the reason why I said that to Gu Gucci Gang? Is that how you pronounce it? Is it Gucci? Gucci. Well, it's, it's actually it's actually pronounced Gucci. Deepak. 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 Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you. I recognize you. I've seen you before. Um, I think you and I have spoken before. He's the smartest um, guy from East India. I'm from Hyderabad. Yeah, which makes so, me. Uh, in the it running it makes him smarter than you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We've talked about this. Before. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm I'm Hyderabad represents. So, <laughs> so anyway, uh, I'm going with the 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 notion that Leibniz proposed um, with respect to, like, you know, early Jewish philosophy on the so-called emergent property of the universe or reality. So if God is an omni being, then he can't create another omni being. He has this whatever he if he were to create if there is such a, an omni being and if he were to create then it's not like it's creating, say, within a parameter of, say, his version of space-time or something. Because this goes into the whole notion of using, say, Big Bang as an analogy. Like, what's happening before the Big Bang? Is there actually a Cartesian point by which the universe comes into being? So it's just interesting how these ancient philosophers were thinking of, like, well, if you have an omni-being, then out of that omniness, you have this emergence of reality hence the best of all possible worlds the way Leibniz described it and therefore if it's not omni ontologically therefore what's natural to the system is unnatural to this omni being and what's natural to the omni being is not natural to the system so there's a there's a there's a divorcing or like a separation between the two therefore the events of this system don't like God, this omni being is not responsible for the things that goes on in the system. Rob, because what would I say to what you're saying anyway. right now? Steel man, like, me. What would I do say? You to not you? see? No, no, that's not what. Okay, yeah, maybe you are going to say what I would say. Well, I'm interested to hear what no, no, Deepak no. now has we, to say. We talked about this for hours. Tell me what. Yeah, but my that, I'm would summarizing be. the model, and I'm interested to hear because I know he's. I, I'm presuming you've thought about these things because I've heard you before, like. That's Leibniz's argument. I find that quite fascinating. I see a correspondence between that and, say, the Genesis count. But what I'm asking you to do is steel man the opposite of Leibniz. Rebecca, you have to write Leibniz. The, the steel manning the time. opposite of Leibniz is some Punishment. weird, petty, childish Sunday school sort oh, of thought guys, process. Disagree of, with me. Conversation your childish, was born like, the petty? first time. Let's yeah, it's it's just it's it's, it's not thinking deep again. enough about the issue. Like, like, if you disagree with me, you're not thinking deeply enough. Hear yourself, Rob. Yeah, this, this is what's coming out of your it's, mouth. It's it's just it's just it's it's literally just one of those. Oh, but there's a domino effect, and if you trace it back, oh, see, there's a god domino that releases all the other dominoes. That is not what Leibniz and all these people were thinking about Wait. reality and creation and how God works with that. Help us, Deepak. This is your fault. I, I blame you, Deepak. Deepak. It's all Deepak. <laughs> it's all Deepak. I have responsible. Deepak, bring us back on topic. Because I, I, I listened to Pine Creek and Rob happen. go back and forth on this. for It was probably like an hour, for real. Can I try no. one last thing and then I'm done, right? Like, And I think, I'm not sure I oh, really geez. completely understand oh, no. this thing. But I'm going to try to translate okay, it to like okay. Pine Creek speak, right? If, if I get it back. So, <laughs> Rob, so Rob, suppose that same woman. So you, you, you think that woman is like... X percent responsible. Like, fine. I, I don't. I think that's a reasonable view. But suppose that woman then goes to the police station and says, "I'd like to report a rape," um, and then the police take down the details. And they're like, "Wait, you walk down the street in those clothes at 3 a.m.? You know what? We're only going to assign like 95 percent of the resources to investigating this crime, 
as you would have otherwise because you're five percent wow. responsible would that would that be reasonable no. that would be resources. reasonable it's pretty a lot that's yeah, a lot that's still quite a bit i don't know well <laughs> You don't wait. You think of the police should um, if someone is like someone well, because when defend... you bring up the when you bring up the word resources, you got to assume like okay, are there other cases that they're now like there's yeah. a hierarchy of cases, right? You're basically ask, asking me to put her in the hierarchy of cases. Like, what if there was a serial killer? Yeah, then it's reasonable. What if there's no serial killer that they're currently working on? Then maybe not. So it depends. No, no, no. no, no. Like, suppose there were two rape cases, right? And the, the police decide. No, no. Okay, could... all else being equal, yeah, yeah. bad. See, and that's what I'm talking about, right? Just because she's like, has some percent of- But you're missing a key ingredient here. Rob came out of the gate. And the reason why we even talked for an hour is because I asked, would you assign any responsibility to God? And he said, zero. Right, mm -hmm. because, and this is this is what I'm trying to, like, this is my summary, right? I think you, uh, you uh, Doug, are talking about causal responsibility. And I think Rob is basically saying there's no moral responsibility on oh, God to say distinction. that- yeah, like that. You know, I would say both, both moral and causal. I see. Yeah, well, I think Rob would say there's no moral responsibility, which is why I think it's yeah, I would say he, he would no say moral. neither, right, Rob? You would say there's no causal, and right? I would say I would say neither. I would yeah, say there's no causal. Yeah, I understand, Rob. Yeah, but I just think yeah. I think he he disagrees with me because he's petty and childish and he hasn't really thought through these things. <laughs> yeah, you haven't. So have wait, you actually read I, Life in I, I, I told you to go read it. You didn't read it. Like no, but don't forget, you don't want to read it. So. Doug, you're saying that the woman is you know responsible because is. of what she wore. So basically, partially. like partially. Yeah, yeah. So you're saying that that basically you're saying the man has more right to rape her because of what that are you clothing. talking about? No. Right? No. <laughs> Rebecca, why is she percentage? Rebecca. Why Rebecca. Is she no. Okay. I'm saying that mm. just like the woman's partially responsible, God is partially responsible. And I don't, is, okay, let, I let's just, just let, let's just extend this analogy with the rape case. Okay, Deepak, this rape that happens, it's within a system that God created, right? For it to even be possible. He's talking to somebody else right now. Okay. Probably his wife, and she's asking him, why are you talking about rape? <laughs> he's, okay. he's explaining it's just for a uh, hypothetical theory everything's gonna be fine <laughs> it's, it's a hypothetical not philosophy i'm sorry <laughs> especially I mean, indian wives they can be quite uh you know. he's sleeping on the couch tonight damn you moral philosophers <laughs> oh thought experiments are macabre the woman of the household in India rules the show. I'm speaking from experience. Matriarchy. But Rob, did you say the woman had 0% responsibility? No, again, this this let's just let's just go even more meta. I don't know if meta is the right word, but like let's go even deeper. Like No. The the, <laughs> the system <laughs> allows something like that to happen, right? Now Doug is saying God ultimately is respons responsible for just the act in itself happening, regardless of whether the woman's at fault or not. Right? Well, why does the system allow that? I'm even, I'm even willing to say not 100%. But the reason why we talked for an hour is because you came out of the gate saying God is 0% <clears throat> responsible. I'm saying he's yeah. not responsible for the rape or a possibility of a rape to happen. Yeah, More. even you're saying even, he is responsible. Yeah, because of the counterfactual that if God never created, there would be no rape. So if he knows everything. This is the discussion. I'm saying when you go and read carefully what say Leibniz is arguing and the ontological oh. parameters of reality with respect to God allowing this to even exist and Irrelevant. so on, that relationship, mm -hmm. that hypostasis, I'm arguing, leads to the conclusion that God is not responsible. It's irrelevant if he, he if you but, agree but with the, the premise but that here, he could not have created. I, that, but that you're not just but one second. That's halfway to the conclusion. So that that's the halfway point. Then the other half that leads to the conclusion is ergo, God doesn't leave the system alone to its own demise. He irrelevant. marries himself to the system, which is the Christian gospel. Irrelevant. That's where life well, ultimately is going think... on. I mean, do you think God shouldn't have created sexuality in order for rape not to exist? Well, it's going to be hard because why are we here then? So what I'm saying is whatever God created, there's a potential to abuse it, 
right? Deepak, how come they, they can't so, understand what I'm saying? I feel like Rebecca is actually understanding. Rebecca's no, no, like, Re even Rebecca is not understanding because I'm saying <laughs> that an omni god seen no, what would happen. Rebecca actually understood. She asked a very good question. Why does God create? An omni god would never have created in the first place anything. That's my point. All right. Then how about you go to well, an omni category so and have a discussion it, with God on the level? This, this is exactly what, I, what I'm saying is doesn't resonate with Christians because it, that whole idea of maybe God not creating anything is totally so out there. They can't even imagine it. Yeah, because we... Because we're here, <laughs> right? <world>. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, but there's I mean, also the fact that, that theists just cannot fathom that that the the pictures to superstitious deity of choice could have mal intent or and i know basically leo is going to say oh yeah like uh, god has not a capacity of evil and then you'll probably smack me down yeah, but that's one way out just, of it huh that's one way out of it is to say that this god is not perfectly good and we wanted some rapes to happen and they just can't fathom it so, yeah. I think the argument doesn't go deeper than that. I, I think that, that to say that God is morally perfect is just to say that, that God always does what he, what, what he ought to do. And anything that results God, yeah. from God is, is, is what ought to occur. So I, it's, it, and I don't see what it would mean for God to be evil because that would entail, I, I would say that when we're talking about the classical theistic conception of God, that would just entail that God is irrational. See that comment there. I'm, I'm, having time, I'm having a hard time understanding why Rob doesn't even think it's he's causally God is causally responsible, right? Like, Good Rebecca, question. Do you think that God at least is causally responsible for the rapes and the? Um. Well, yeah. I mean, that's. I. I think I disagree with Rob okay. on that point of it because Wait, I. I, I can't with? make it any simpler than. I guess. Yeah, I'm just gonna leave it alone. I gave God a percentage of the responsibility. Oh, yeah, yeah, remember? Yeah. Yep, I remember. Okay, now I was now, changing this diapers. Is a good question, Doug. I was changing are you diapers. an antinatalist? I got a point. <laughs> okay, so hold on, because oh, no. <laughs> um, because it, you know, if you're not, but aren't your kids gonna suffer in this life? Couldn't they suffer terrible things? They could, but probably so you brought are... beings into the world that might experience suffering. I hate comments like this because it shows the lack of IQ in some people. <laughs> We're talking about omniscience and omnipotence. Becca, go to the corner of the room. We're talking no. about an, an entity who's not needy whatsoever. <laughs> I'm neither omniscient, omnipotent, and I'm very needy. In other words, I desire to have kids for neediness and selfish reasons. God is not mm -hmm. any of those things. But you're part of the system, Doug, and that's natural to the system. So sure. there's nothing wrong with you. it. It's fine. It's know, part of the system. Kids. Now, it's I part of lived, Chaos Conf. It's part I of lived, the struggle with entropy and I lived decay in Africa, and the Can we say the same thing about rape? If I lived in Africa, yes, where I knew the that rape is part of the system. I'm it, it, can the the, the it can go into a category of, say, yeah. evolution. And then if you want, you can then, because we are moral beings, which, which counters that evolutionary growth. Yeah, but if Wait. I knew part of the system would be I'd, I'd have to drown my children in the end. I wouldn't make Drowning is part of the system. I would What make will the happen system. if you stick your head in the water? You will die. You will drown. Rob, it's Rob, the laws knew, of nature Rob, don't break down if you are Rob, doing exactly what the system allows it to for that to Rob, happen. Rob, though if if I knew at some point I was going to have to drown my own children, I probably wouldn't create them. Mhm. Mm That's the difference. So but this goes back to drown, oh my god this, drown this is just burn unbelievable forever. if i was going to create a child who's going to be gay and be burned forever because of his gayness why would i create that being Good. why would i create or a at being least why would i create gay beings forever that doesn't make any sense because they'll go to you are uh, within the system basically having a problem I, it, this is ironic because this goes back to a classical theist approach like aquinas in this discussion would say oh how ironic god, you are actually yeah, transcending Rob, does your the god system know everything from does your god the know way you the way you are reacting to the system is that you're Rob, transcending the system itself which in god itself ironically proves a spiritual it, nature the bible says what i've had state. this conversation exact i know where you're going with this rob yeah. does believe in that god's omniscient thank, thank you doug and omnipotent I appreciate that. 
Thank you for letting me know. But he does believe in like the, Yeah, the Rob, I mean, I think Rob's a classical and... theist, isn't he? Classical yeah, yeah. Christian theist. He's a classical theist. So he yeah. acknowledges all those things, but still doesn't want to assign any responsibility to God. No, so that, the classical, it is weird, the classical he theist read up on would, would agree with me on all, all these points. Wish. It's not logical at all. It doesn't, doesn't add up. Rob, yeah, Rob, the Rob. classical theist agrees that, that they have lots of good objections to these arguments, and I just don't think they do. Okay, let okay. Is there such a thing as a possibility for something like drowning and rape prior to the Big Bang. No, because technically we're, there was just atoms and helium. There was and... there was nothing. Not, I'm not <laughs> even talking about Lawrence Krauss's quantum foam and, and virtual particles and so on. I'm talking about prior to all that, is there an ontological uh, availability? You know, is there some form of Cartesian point that you can point to that, yes, that can allow for something like drowning and rape. Yeah, a universe can be created and, you know, a universe of sufficient complexity for, for moral agents to arise who can then mm -hmm. commit rape. So, yes, yeah. the answer is yes. But that's if there is something there, right? If you can pinpoint and then that sort of grows into, like what you said, it's complex enough to allow all those parameters to exist. But, but reality... It's, it's, there's even a certain sizability to it and... Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm going outside abstract maths over here. But. Yeah, but Rob, it's inconsequential. Mm. Basically, right, it's just a byproduct of basically just like a chain reaction of events. And it's just like, if you look at the universe, it's like we're just like a happy accident, pretty much. We're not that happy. <laughs> what All of us are. <laughs> You know what I mean, man. Anyways, it, it's just it's just inconsequential of the grand scheme of things. So let's just, okay, yeah. let's go along with that line of thinking. Let's go down a more naturalistic route, right? Now, whatever naturalistic thing that causes the virtual particles and then this emergence from and then an inflation and then you and I right now, like, is whatever that is in a in a krausian universe is that responsible for that rape that just happened no it has no agency well in a way it is but the the difference between and we went through this in that last hour rob what would i say to that you forgot right you you rob. you would say that the responsibility lies on the person because there's no god involved because there's no omniscience and omnipotence. The yeah, universe doesn't in, have in, those two In qualities. your understanding, that, that's your argument last time, yeah. Yeah. Because there's no omniscience. Which is omnipotence. reasonable, right? That makes sense. Mm -hmm. No, because I'm saying this omni-being is <laughs> not associated. <laughs> not associated, and yet you said he interacts within the system to bring Jesus about to save he, us, right? He then chooses to interact with the system. Oh, so he just interacts so, that one time. What about miracles, Rob? You don't believe in miracles? He's like an infant. <laughs> uh, no, no not that, and the Bible doesn't showcase miracles in that sense. So I am, I'm in other words, I'm a classical theist that's 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 sympathetic to like a deistic you don't believe you know, there's like Jesus a deistic, rose Lazarus theistic... from the dead revivified him yeah he's entropy. interacting with the system there but yeah, he's wait, interacting he he's not he's not he's sustaining he's not so no like, not just sustaining this is not this entropy. is not a pan this is not a pantheistic model what you're suggesting is a pantheistic sort of no. view of god with respect do to you believe system. jesus rose Lazarus from the dead yes or no yes <laughs> Do you believe that is the normal course of nature? Did they have someone dead come back to life? Yes. Within the system. Within the system. He's you adding think... information into the system. Was that naturalistic? Lazarus. Come yes, back it to... has to be. Otherwise, Lazarus was eating literally in the next chapter. It's not some weird. It's I don't know. Like... know the process. So miracles are naturalistic. Yes, there's the hyper what I would call a hypernatural uh, account, not a supernatural. Supernatural is distinction from a hypernatural. That's situation. like natural. What would the distinction between the two be? I saw it. <laughs> in in a Greco-Roman context, supernatural means that you have to do something that contradicts the system. Natural. In other words, the gods could only do something that that because in other words, the laws is like something like an obstacle to get that that they need to sort of. <laughs> hoop over and and be victor victorious over the christian god doesn't need to contradict because 
according to the theology, he's created it, and so he utilizes it to his means. Do you to bring agree about that naturalism else? says that when I let go of this pencil, it will fall towards the ground because of gravity? Do you think naturalism upholds that or says that? Yeah, no, that's part of the that's part of the system. Yeah. Gravity. Okay, and now if I pray in the name of Jesus for this pencil to cover and not fall, that's still naturalism. And yes. Of nature. But something has to happen with all the properties of physics for that pen to then levitate. But well, that's something I don't know how God would do that. Again, in his omniscience, you know how to do that. Supernatural? It's not supernatural. Uh, it's not supernatural is something to... transcendent to the system. Whether, this, whether this pencil God goes down, <laughs> whether this pencil drops if to the, the ground, if the pen, covers, it's dog, let me put it this way: if the dog, if if the pen were to do something weird, like a poltergeist. I would still call that a hypernatural situation, not a supernatural hypernatural. situation. Hypernatural. You're just giving it a different I, name. I'm, yeah, yeah, I'm still mean, not understanding so the weird. I mean, I do book understand the point you're making. Discussed on this by yeah, philosophers and even scientists. On this. this type keyword: hypernatural versus supernatural. Like I think I understand what he means. I think it's like the matrix, I mean, he, like physical things happening in the matrix can only happen one way, but a user on the outside of the matrix can input new data and cause it to behave differently. So, yeah, but then yes. we don't have uniformity of nature anymore. Yeah, you know, no, you 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 are working within the parameters of the uniformity of nature. That's the point. Well, then, how, then, then what makes it different from just a natural event? Because it's a principle you don't know how to tap into. Like I, I don't know what that. Is. But then, Jesus but that's actually a good question. That's actually a good question by uh, Bill Keel. Is it Theo? Leo. So we're Leo. just basically yeah. testing. Love you guys. Got to take off. Bye bye. Okay. Bye bye. Oh, bye. MJ, say final words <laughs> before you go. Peace. Peace, love. I love everybody. Peace and love, 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 Okay. Next. Okay, so what what were you saying? Wow, it suddenly got really quiet. I love it, man. Leibniz for dummies. They need to get that book. <laughs> How is there a difference between Rebecca the word faith and belief for you? Um I don't know. I haven't really thought about that. Probably hmm. not. Wow. Well. Maybe faith would be more like a trusting, and you can have a belief but not trust in the belief, right? And, and, so and maybe what, there is. In order to trust someone, what does that all entail? Um, well, I mean, it's having confidence in them, right? I mean, what what do you mean? Well, that, that's what Give I'm trying to get example. at. What is in context of trusting Jesus? What does that actually mean? Well, it means that you're not trying to save yourself. You recognize your state and you recognize what Jesus has done. And you're putting confidence in what he did rather than in what you can do. But even the putting of confidence, isn't that something you do? Yeah. Yeah. So in a sense, you are trusting yourself. <laughs> yeah, but that's kind of a silly way to think about it, right? Like... Jesus is the one who's done the work. So like, like if your friend buys you like a brand new car, right. And hands over the keys and you take the keys and you're like, and then someone asks you, Hey, where'd you get that car? Well, and then you said, I took the keys from my friend. I put the keys in the, that's not how you got the car. But anyone right? who doesn't take the keys is stupid because they could have got a free exactly. car. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, they, so the person who did take the keys should be proud of themselves that they they should boast. Hey, I I took a free thing. All right. Well, I'm glad I took the free thing. Why are you not taking the free? Well, thing? It's, why it's are you not being? I don't believe that it car is exists. Not free. It's expensive. <laughs> it's expensive. Yeah, you got to pay the taxes on it. All mm. the viewers from Oprah know that. Oh. So I have a question. If it's wrong to try to do for yourself what you say Jesus does for us by 
um, saving us from death, does that mean that scientists that are working for a way to cure aging and and prolong human life indefinitely, if possible, someday are they are they committing a sin against God by of trying to not. find a way for themselves to not have to die? Without yeah, that's that's a good question, and I would say absolutely no, because you do have at least in the deutero deuterocanonical text, like say the Book of Sirach. Uh, read the first like nine verses of chapter 38 where it categorically says because it's written in Greek that Sophia, Sophia is connected to knowledge and in this case science so uh, the Lord created you know Sophia so that the doctor and the physician can then utilize that as a tool to make literally the text says drugs and medicines to then uh, heal and and it, it it concludes with so that the king of the nation can even like go back to his duties after the doctor has done what he's done. And, but ultimately, it's because the system <laughs> coming back again to that discussion, as the text also says, it's only possible for that to happen because of the system that allows that. Yeah, but um, you get so. you get you get then it kind of circles back to my original question, which is: Is eternal life worth it? Are you going to be the same person that you, as you are now? And are you going to change as as time evolves? So and, ship uh, Theseus, basically. I've already and answered this question. Person. Sorry. Go it's ahead, a great Jake. question, though. Yeah, it's a good question. And this, again, ironically enough, comes back to that Leibniz model where the Bible says that God already has in mind two creations. So it's not that he creates this creation and therefore it's like, oh no, I need to come up with a plan B because see, rape happens. It's natural to the system. and the, the But the ultimate plan is for that other creation to take place where there is no chaos conf. The only way that can happen is if he marries ontologically himself to the system and transforms so it weird. to his level. He's so it's theosis at the end of the day. I think the question is, though, like, are we going to be the same person in heaven? Like, for instance, my mom, if she's in heaven watching me burn in hell, is she going to be happy that that's happening? Is she going to be the same person? Okay. No, look. because, again, again, you're, now you're thinking in Rob, simplistic really linear terms in that sense. Like, it's... No? Like, look into theosis. Look into what... Is my mom going to care that I'm Rob, burning in hell? let me answer because you're complicating okay, go things. It. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, first of all... <laughs> People are not going to be burning in hell forever. So your okay, mom would at never... At any point, would... at any point, is my um, mom going to be watching me burn? No. No. So the people in heaven cannot but... see the people in hell? Um. Uh... No. Rebecca doesn't believe in hell. The text doesn't say that. And Yeah, we don't no, believe that, in eternal There's a conversation heaven. between Abraham and a dude in hell. In that's the an Bible. analogy. It was a parable. A parable. It still happened, though, right? I mean, did it happen? No. no. It was just a parable. So it was just a story, a fake story that... Yeah, so and this the is point of it was about the so treating a, the poor well. So it's well. not based in not, reality. No, not based in reality. You're telling me that parables are not based in reality. According to these Christians, no. So yeah, <laughs> or the, what parable is par based which, on reality? Yeah, parable. Seriously, I mean, show me a parable that's based on reality. None of Jesus' parables. The father are based on of the reality. prodigal son. Yeah, that's not. Didn't that didn't happen. happen. You're telling me that's never happened. No. No. Where does oh, the text say yeah. the parable is based on reality? You're telling me that never happened. That yeah, somebody that who has a son has oh. never gone astray and he's accepted them back. No, you're, you're, me you're talking about happened. different things. Like you, you, like Bible says what? I think you're saying was there literally a story reported in the Bible? Right? That, the, the, that literal. But does it? Does it? Does it? Does it? Does it reflect reality? Sort of Thank yeah. you. Does it? Does it reflect? Reflect reality for like some people? Yeah. yeah. Okay. For, for example, you know persons. that famous it's verse where it says, "The Son of Man uh, came to save those who are lost," right? That is a Spartan proverb. That actually did happen during the Spartan Wars. Okay, good. And apparently a Spartan general goes out of his way. He was a doctor and he's like, I've come to save those who are lost. And that became a famous proverb in the Greco-Roman world. Jesus then takes that and theologizes that to himself as the one who's, you know, to come to save those who are lost. So you, Jesus. So there's the an example where you do have something historical, but whenever he talks about parables, like you mean to say when he speaks about the farmer sowing a hundredfold, that that goes well beyond the 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 you know the 
the natural possibility of Does it have any how much crop that reality? a farmer could produce. I think that's where I'm getting at. Thank, thank yeah. you, the mustard seed that, thing that, is also not based on reality. Rob, but there's farmers, Rob. Probably not. Rob. There's seed sowers, Rob. That's the, the Bible says what's point. It, it's you. a reflection of reality. And so if... Can a mustard like, seed become a world tree? No, there's definitely Look, something... I mean, I'm pretty sure Jesus in, is okay. not that stupid. Look, the basis in reality for the parable of Lazarus <laughs> is that... God is concerned about the poor and there might be a reversal. You might be thinking you're rich and therefore God is blessing you. But in reality, God is getting ready to judge you and you might be poor and look or looking at poor somebody poor and thinking, oh, they must be cursed by God. But in reality, they're about to be blessed. So that is the basis in reality. So you're saying God is a Marxist. Awesome. I just, I just want to know, like, why exactly are we supposed to be looking <laughs> to Theo's sister again? I'm confused, bro. Hmm? You said something about, like, looking into Theo's sis. And Theo's sis, yeah. I'm sure she's a great, she's wonderful, but... Well, um... I'm, I'm answering the Bible says what question about... Are you trying to make a joke? Hell, after yeah, life, second sorry, creation. <laughs> Leave the but... jokes to me, Deepak. Yeah, okay? yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm Look, we saying. can't know everything about the afterlife and what it's going to be like. But are you going to be the same person? Yes, you are. If you're in God's kingdom, yes, you're still according to the Christian the text, yes, you are. Because when Jesus gonna was raised from the dead, he had a body. He was the same person. He knew is his friends. Is my mom going to miss me in heaven? Um, she she probably won't miss you. Okay, then that's not my mom. Yeah, it's plain and fucking simple, man. I mean, yeah. if my mom does not miss me in heaven, she's not my mom. Yeah, and Rebecca, Rebecca, you have faults, right? I'm probably one or two, but you have faults. Will you have faults sure. in heaven? Um. Well, do you mean moral faults? Yeah, yeah like Satan, well, like Satan did in heaven. No, I'm not going to have moral <laughs> faults. How about uh, like, let's say you're clumsy. I don't know if you're clumsy, but let's say you're clumsy. Would you are you going to drop pens and stub your toe in heaven? Going to that? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Like, do you snore when you sleep? Will you snore in heaven? Mm. Will you Doug, sleep in heaven? Will all you these in parameters heaven? are prior to the who you are? according to the early church tradition. <laughs> what time do you take? Do, do you get go constipated? And, seriously, <laughs> next time on your show, go and bring on a Greek Orthodox or someone to you know discuss these ideas with. They'll just be like, these are just absolute straw men that just... No, the questions. They're great questions. They're I'm not being, being humorous, sensitive Rob, but, or... But, it, or but they're, that they're is not humor. Questions. That is just... Where does one Blatant poop in heaven? Stupidity. Is a great question. It's just, it's just. I've thought about that quite a lot. Degree. It's, it's I've wondered about it. Right. Because I think we are going to eat. It's in thinking so simplistic so about all these issues. Honestly, Yahweh doesn't it's, like pork. Are we it's like have I don't even know trim? why I'm spending and wasting my like Wednesday morning or now it's afternoon. It's just, is this ridiculous? I don't get it. Poor Rob. Can you perform Kamalangas in heaven? I'm, it's a rhetorical Rob, question I'm asking. Like, why am I wasting my time? I mean, Rob, really make it, make it worth it, Rob. Say, like, say, like, I am nobody, trying to make it worth it. Nobody can but then when I'm Rob. answering these, when I'm giving the answer, oh. I'm actually giving what philosophers and theologians and scientists would discuss at that Rob. intellectual level. It's like, oh, you're making it too complicated. It's too intellectual. Don't. I don't want to think too hard about it. And then it goes no, back to, Rob, do uh, I snore in heaven? <laughs> Rob, I'll, do I, I'll tell you the do truth. Do I go that's to the not toilet? The problem. It's Please how start. you. It's how you talk <laughs> the problem. This is how. What you know? Atheists on YouTube are like. There's only Rob. very few, like Graham Oppie, that actually care about deep discussions. We're but discussions like this, it just goes and demonstrates to me, as a former atheist, like I'm actually thankful I had discussions with thoughtful atheists <clears throat> and even Christians. In well, these I suggest issues. you hang these hell. discussions are like Whatever. they're just to waste people's time and your time. So we're you're wasting not thinking, your time. You're not thinking carefully about this. Rob, you realize most Christians don't think as carefully as you, right? Like like ninety something. I know that, and that's what frustrates yeah. me. That's why well, I have I don't really have many friends even in the Christian camp because they just like this, right? like, they just don't even know why they even believe. They I just can believe help you because with that, oh because I have a so faith tradition and, and so on. I mean, we're just on the other side of that. That's yeah. I can help okay. you with that, Rob. Here's how you can be happier. Lower your expectations of other people. 
<laughs> now you're psychologizing me. Mm-hmm. Now you're psychologizing that I've, apparently I'm not happy in my position where I am. I'm completely oh. fine. I'm in Australia. Are you happy I have right a, now? You don't seem I have happy. a good job. I can go down to the beach. I can have a surf. But I can think deeply. Right I can here. I can self reflect and look at the sunset and deeply about what's going on. You could probably have an abortion. One. Right, Rob? If you wanted an abortion, you could have one, right? Okay. What? Um, <clears throat> Rob, but I do have like, one make, concern, but like, You must not follow I, American I, I politics. Give Rob Rob Stop, guys. I Maybe this is an American Rob. situation. Like, <laughs> I'm thankful I'm not in America. Like, that's for sure. Do I have yeah, a be, setting be where I can, like, mute everyone? Look, I want to give Rob. No, I'm immutable. Rob, I really appreciate. I really appreciate what you bring. And you have a lot of good things to say. Sometimes it gets carried away and takes us on many tangents. And so when that happens, it gets a little bit frustrating because it's hard to follow all the like places that we go. But I am personally thankful for the research that you've done and and what you have to say. So thank you. Yeah, I'm always glad to see Rob on here. You know, it's catch 22 for me because... I mean, right now, Look, I don't want most... any sympathetic sort of comments. Like, no, 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 no. I'm, be hated like, I'm pity. not going to patronize on, you. I promise. <laughs> not going to patronize you. I totally get it. You know, people are just kind of being slap happy and silly and not taking the thing seriously. And I think that happens when it's like one o'clock in the morning and it's like we've <laughs> been talking for three hours and it's one a.m. I mean, it's just what it devolves to. I think. But you know, I, there's been a couple of times I wanted to raise a really deep issue and I thought, no, it's too deep for this discussion. You know, and it's like now we're gone too shallow for the discussion. So, so, so can, here we can are. I, can I actually offer some constructive criticism, like feedback, right? Not even criticism, just like one way to make things better. Like Rob, like maybe you really like I've seen like so many times. Like it's obvious you have something to say. You've thought about these issues, right? And you've been influenced deeply by thinkers like Leibniz and Aquinas and stuff. And so whenever mm-hmm. someone like asks you a question, like you kind of map it to those kind of conceptual spaces, like what did Leibniz say and so on. And so you start answering like that, right? Like you start saying, well, you know, if you read chapter or whatever of Leibniz and and then it starts going off into like this tangential thing, I don't think that's helpful to your audience, right? Like, but it would be, look, maybe, maybe because coming from India, like you and I, you, you and I, the fact that you even, you know, put it that way, it's like, I'm used to those type of discussions. Like yeah. you and I would get along very well in that because... We are sharing data points, right? We're based based on not only what's like in the secondary literature, but we also come up with our, with our own like musings about it, and you know. But then when it's the slapstick sort of humor and like, like oh, you know, do you snore? Like, is there like a pillow in heaven? And do, you, do, do sometimes you may need like a breathing apparatus because people might choke to death. You know, some no, people might are, choke to but death in their sleep. Interesting questions, like, though, Rob. Right? Like because, <laughs> but but I'm I'm saying the ontological category to allow for something like that to happen in other words say if someone's really obese that's why they have snoring issues and breathing issues and and so on then what allows for the obesity to take place in the first place to bring that out and then to lead to all the circumstances and so on how does heaven at that ontological level allow for that to happen you see already in my mind i'm thinking you you've already like skipped all the steps that reach to I what heaven should be like in that context. I, I understand. But so you, this is how you answer that. I don't believe heaven's physical. Or maybe maybe you do believe it's physical. Yeah, no, again, again, that just that statement, physical. Rob, it's basically how do you know it's it's not physical? I'm asking Define you. Define physical in a whole different let's, sense. Let's run an experiment. Do you believe the heavens are physical? Lean yes, lean no. I believe that heaven is physical, yes. Okay. In Otherwise, heaven, what is existence? Defi- again, define physical down at the basal layer, or whatever that is. Do you believe heaven's physical in the sense that you can have things like farts? Yes or no? There can be an existence where farts don't ever apply or ever, ever exist as a possibility. Okay, so that's how you would answer that question. So if Chris or myself asked you a question, do you think you can fart in heaven? You say, well, I do believe heaven's physical, but I don't think we'll fart. Done. Well, that's not very fun then. I don't like your heaven. But now <laughs> think about the fart. All right? Think about the fart. It's hilarious. Why are farts possible? Because of gas. Because <laughs> we eat in heaven, though, it's, right? It's, 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 goes, it goes deeper than that. It's 
The microbiome... Think down to the very fabric of space-time itself that allows something like a thought to be possible. Okay, do you think is heaven, heaven does will heaven have, have the... the same... For example, does heaven have the same standard model of particle physics? Yeah, that's okay, a good so question, all... Rob. The quantum fields like, in heaven? Yeah. So, so just, at, just the way you answer the questions like this, electricity. I don't think heaven will have the space-time type uh, nature that we have now. And you're done. Rob. So then, yeah, at that point, I just don't know what it means to say that heaven's physical. <laughs> yeah, Rob. exactly. So now, what's 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 then? I wouldn't say curious, but what's notice that when you ask that question, I give that answer, which technically I've been doing f for like the last hour and a bit. Yeah, but I can do Where's, the same. Where answer do we go from seconds. there, from your point of view? Because what's these, what's the trajectory of the of, your, of the discussion? Well, based you're on asking questions. about motives and and why these questions come about because they're interesting to people. Like for example, a baby dies or a fetus dies. Mm -hmm. Are there like how do you imagine a fetus soul in heaven, or do you? Or do you imagine them uh, at an older age, or do you? Someone yeah. who dies at age eighty five, do you imagine them as an eighty five? year old in some physical way or a 20 year old these are interesting questions that people ask they are interesting important questions that can't be answered from you know where we stand okay. in this so all in this. you have to say at that point is i don't know we can't answer these questions but again i don't know still too simplistic of a it's not i don't know and you just leave it there you uh, give no, a range this of is your problem you have models. a need i'm going to psychologize you on purpose you have a need of just you cannot say i don't know and leave it there me i have a yes. need am i the only one that has this need you just said i can't i don't want to say i don't know and just leave it there why can't you i'm do psychologizing that? you in saying it's too simplistic uh, to just leave it i don't know uh, yeah, wait it. you are <laughs> There are people who actually think about this, ergo, the early answer, philosophers again, and Christians yeah, you, and theologians and so on. You are looking to answer a million dollars... Because it is, isn't it ironic, Doug, that the fact that you're even asking the questions means you're ironically in the same boat as all these deeper thinkers, if you think about it. Like, the fact that you're even asking these questions, it's like, you're not new in the game. This has been, you know, thought of for like well, thousands of years. I never said I was. I'm not saying, I'm not saying you didn't say that. I'm saying you're not new in the game. Correct. This has already been discussed many times. Correct. So when someone asks you a simple question, just give a simple answer. But because it's been discussed for thousands of years, the answer is not so. simple. Or say, I don't know. Rob, but, and leave it at that. Oh, I love. Rob, I don't know. I don't know is a great answer, Rob. Now, it's what is the answer. answer? What is the complicated answer about whether we fart? I'm like really curious about. Because this. the ontological categories of what I'm, physical I'm, means. I'm, I'm one myself. person said one time. Rob, like so, so, just like again, like you know, honest feedback, right? Like I think. You know, and Maybe I should come I back to Deepak. India or somewhere where you are, Deepak, and we should, we should sort of like... India, it really doesn't. People's <laughs> minds don't work so differently. No, Deepak. seriously. I came <laughs> here at the age of nine in Australia, right? So yeah. in Australia, we go to, say, year four in primary school at the age of nine. I already knew about, say, Pythagoras and so on at that age. I'm coming into this so-called much more established Western society, and they're still doing... 22 plus this is not helping you rob equals yeah, this, this is, is exactly not helping that, you that, that is this the extent of the discussions taking place in rob, like there, there is a difference countries that are outside those uh, rob so i actually like from from you know just listening to you I, I have a sense that you have a good feel for rigorous understanding but not for communicating right like these are two very different skills right i know like like in my day job right i come across people who are geniuses at proving theorems and like, you know, like just working on complex problems, right? But they cannot communicate what they're doing to save their lives, right? And I'm not saying you're that bad, but I'm saying like, it's hard work, right? You have to figure out, like, look at, look at Doug, right? You could go back and look at Doug's earlier videos, right? He isn't as quite as good at like communicating the ideas that he wants to communicate as he is now, right? It takes practice mm -hmm. and thinking about what works and what doesn't. Hmm. And I think maybe, I don't know how much work you've put in on that particular question, but I think, you know, you could do more. What, here's, here's sort of like, after looking at Doug's channel for maybe, what, two years, two, three years? Um, this is, Doug, this is, I'm just saying this 
I'm not, uh, you know, saying this to try and like hurt your feelings. I'm just being raw. I'm just being honest with my observation. You're raising good questions. In other words, I, I actually like sometimes what you do with the Christians that you bring on because it's like the frustration I have with the atheist community that don't deep don't think deeply on these issues. Christians obviously haven't thought about these issues, and you make them sort of like, oh boy, how do I answer that question? And I'm actually thankful that you know that you do that. But then at the same time, it's like you raise these questions. Because I know you're raising them because you've asked these questions yourself, and then you're just, you know, projecting that onto these other Christians, right? But my frustration with you is that you just leave it there. It's like you're asking these questions, and I'm like, Doug, but there is this book, and there is that. And yeah, but you it's know. it's straight, straight epistemology 101, yeah. Rob. You, it's 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 not a a, a closed case format. Like it's supposed to be open. It's you're supposed to think about it, reminisce, going and back it again, and go go back to the drawing board constantly. And it's not a you have to be right absolutely a hundred percent of the time. It's I'm not saying we have to do that or that's ridiculous. I'm not saying we should do that. But but Rob, I like I will be honest with you, I think those Christians that you sit and say, you kind of cheering for me. Yeah, Doug, let's get them to think. I mean, there's many times I've come on your show and I've actually sent you like a super chat said, yep. You know, yeah, I've I understand. supported you sometimes. And, you know. But my perspective is that the most well-read person in classic theology won't do any better. With some of my, with, with some of my questions, all it's they'll do is they will muck and mire it in, in philosophical language, theological terms, and try to muddy the water. So by the time they're done talking, we forgot. But why what the are those theological was. terms even in existence to begin with? Why are they define the way they define and spelt the way they spelt? Because they people, will, from? yeah, because people will have different ideas on what terms mean and so forth. I get that, but someone who knows how to communicate will very quickly figure out what people mean by those terms, either intuitively, or they'll just come out and ask. And But if you're stuck talking about definitions and theology and philosophy for hours and hours and hours, I tell you, number one, it's not fun, maybe for most people. And number two, I don't really think you get anywhere. It doesn't get anywhere. Exactly. Now you're projecting your taste onto... Yeah, this is my opinion. I'm projecting yes. my opinion. So, But does yeah, that, does that then lead to a valid argument if you're projecting your taste? On, on your methodological approach to these issues. What, say that again. Okay. Guys, we've been on the topic of Rob for quite a long time now. <laughs> um, let's. Uh... His last sentence was like the epitome of what we're talking about. You said one sentence, and I don't think anybody understood what you meant by that. Your, methodolog your, your, your method, your, yeah. how you approach epistemology, your, pro your projecting your taste of, say, what you do in your spare time outside YouTube. In this case, it doesn't seem like you'd be interested and you've admitted so you, you don't like reading or looking into these issues. But that at the same time, I could be wrong. I don't want to say you are doing that. Based on what you're saying and the way you're wording the questions gives me the impression that when you do come online and you do do your streams, it's like you're thinking of questions which ironically are you know, even Deepak would agree. It's like, these are valid questions. But then that's it. You just leave it at that. And then you make other people, quote unquote, doubt. You know, doubt is a virtue. Based on these questions you've raised. But it, it, it it's like, it just, then you hit like a brick wall. And What's wrong with that? Like. What's wrong with that, Rob? What's wrong with that is that what you're doing is you're raising people to think for themselves, which is a good thing. But then you're not, there's no encouragement to go beyond that. It's like, oh, I'm... since there's this question and I don't know the answer to that, well, then the baby with the bathwater is thrown out. And therefore, okay, I'm going to lose my fate or lose whatever I need to do. And what, what would you prefer to happen, Rob? What would be your ideal outcome? Say, Doug has asked some questions. The person is like, okay, maybe the reasons that I had for my belief are not so good. What would you like Doug to do after that? 
Uh, well, don't be a broken record and repeat the same questions. Okay. Maybe if you so raise, let's maybe say, if you raise the question, maybe you can next time come on and say, you know, the question I raised in the prior stream. Well, I checked this out, and it's an interesting little like it's not solved a hundred percent, but there is an interesting question. route that someone has thought about, and so on. Which quick yeah. question in particular are you talking about? Can you name one? All the questions we've been talking, like, like, like I don't know, Doug specifically like, presents, like, like I'm just going to bring your 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 flood story. Um, would you mm -hmm. rather? Have them poof, or would you rather have them drown? The, yeah, these are then, the kinds of questions he raises. Is what's the problem with that question? Let's let's address okay. that one specifically. So, what goes in my mind is the historicity of the account. Is there actually a flood account? If there's no flood account, then the question is moot. It's a it's a pointless question because it okay. Never but you believe happened. there is. If so it did, we go from if there. If it did happen, if it did happen, then you have to think about then the models of the flood. So if it's a localized flood in the Persian Gulf, then you have to think about when did it occur? What sort of civilization is going on? You think now you go then if you want none of that even no, matters. But notice notice the truncating down of the way I'm thinking of the flood. Then it comes down to the very base layer of the, the poofing and the drowning scenario. It's nonsense. Do you believe that, it happened or not? Yes. In the okay, Persian so the Persian none Gulf. Of that even you look, matters when you flood. look at the Persian Gulf, you're looking at Noah's flood. So none of that matters. The question still remains. Doug's question still remains. Would you rather have them poofed out or drown? If it happened in history naturally, how does that at all naturally. then relate to Did God cause that it, God has to poof them or drown them? And, and Rob, so you're so demonstrating the deduction. Rob, you're demonstrating the beauty of that question and why it doesn't matter how many books you read, yeah. you still struggle with it. It's so weird. I'm, do See, you want there's, to there's just psychologizing and projecting no. that apparently I well, struggle answer with. Answer the it. question, Rob. Well, that's the question. Simple. Poof or drown? Poof or drown? It's very simple, Rob. Stop dancing around the question. All I have to Nobody do is say cares one word. if it's a local flood or whatnot. Would you poof or drown? If I were to poof, if I was God poofing it, then I'm poofing the entire system out of existence. What? No, you're poofing the ones that would drown, not Noah. No, I'll be doing the entire system that's out of existence. That's not the question, though, and that's that is not, not all. Because, see, because you see then what you're, you're just opposing Dancing. the natural Dancing. laws of nature. You've heard me ask this question. Do, do you see? Do you see how simplistic your thinking is in this? The, I, I actually can't believe. It's so simple of a question. How it's so simple. simplistic you're looking at right. this. Right? Why can't you answer? It's, 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 just, answer it's, it's, it's like it's, even a horse blind is a more wide than the way you're thinking. Simple things confusing to you, Rob. It's not. It's, I, I'm, it's I'm so confused it. by this response, Rob. I'm so confused because it's a really simple question. It's it's would you rather scenario A or scenario B? And you're talking about well, was this an historical thing? What do you mean by flood? Was it global? Was it local? Whatever you mean by flood, Rob, that's what we mean. You're a great. Can you answer, answer the question? So, you're great are you saying that God is the one that caused the flood? Oh wow! Yeah. Have you read the Bible? That's yeah, exactly I've read the what Bible. happens. That's exactly what happens in the Bible. Really? So God's the one that took the Indian Ocean and spilled into the Persian Gulf. Is that what happened? He's the one that opened the floodgates. Who do you think ah, opened the floodgates? Okay. So that's now, if how Rob, you read if, the text. if Rob answers this way, then that question doesn't apply to him. So Rob, what you should have said is, I don't believe God flooded the earth. Do you, do you read do you Ugaritic? Go? Do you read Akkadian? Have you read the I don't ancient Aryan about those people. That, that oh my God, to the do Genesis you believe account? God flooded the earth, Rob? Yeah, do you believe God flooded the earth, Rob? Yes or Very no? Very simple. Very okay. simple. So that question wouldn't apply to you, and we move on. Exactly. Because on. we just wasted five Moving minutes on. talking about other things. <laughs> you see the problem, right. Rob? But do you, you see, see the, the straw man? Let's do you see how you've taken control. a wrong you would just straw man you made up in your own mind so and then projected easier. that onto me? So he didn't make without it thinking mind, about though. the deeper issues right, that scholars and academics have thought about turn with the respect to the guns on me, guys. Turn the guns on me. Let's give Rob a <laughs> Rebecca, last time Rebecca, we talked, we it's, it's <laughs> ridiculous. <laughs> last time we talked, Rebecca, we were talking about uh, women in the Bible. I don't know if you want to continue that discussion. I had a question oh, first. I want, know if I want to know if Rebecca you. thinks God flooded the earth. Oh, yeah. good question. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Poof or drown, Rebecca. Poof or drown. I already answered this, Doug. I know, I but I, I just poof. want Rob to hear it. There you go. So why, why didn't God poof? Why don't you ask him? Or at least sufficient reasons. Well, why, why do I need to ask him? Rebecca. I'm asking you. <laughs> because I don't have all the answers. Ask God right now. God. You communicate with him. Ask him right now. 
Okay. We can even provide the music. Well, some of them, I, all, I'd be happy. I prefer Jeopardy. I, <laughs> I, I, let's I, ask him. Come on. Let's yeah, communicate sure. with God. I love this. Let's, um, let's do it. Yeah, let's ask him. Lord, go ahead. why did you flood the earth? Hmm. Because it was entertaining. Well, you know, actually, <laughs> he kind of told us, didn't he? Let's open up. Yeah, because he regret making six. people. He regret Let's making up. people. That's what it says. It says because they their thoughts were wicked. All their actions and thoughts regret. were wicked all the time, right? So, and and the earth was filled with violence. So right. that's the answer. And well, it seems regret. like if that's the case, you just wait why and kill each he... other off. Yeah, but why did God drown the babies? Why the babies? Why the dogs? Why the cats? Pull the Skylar fiction argument. I just want to point out that you guys are inserting babies into the story. Are there not babies? You're saying no babies died when God flooded the earth? Not at all. So then why why did God kill those babies? But I'm saying every time I offer a a possibility, um, Doug says, you're inserting into the story. So you are. I'm saying you're inserting into the story babies. I don't have a problem with God flooding babies. How? I already told you that. Okay, but so, so God like, ought to or God ought to have killed those babies. That's not the same Probably. thing. Though. Rebecca yeah, is I mean, saying that if it's if God does things, God is God, right? Like who is Rebecca so to is judge to God? Babies, but that's not the Rebecca. same as saying that it's the same. Like it's an all. Is it good to drown babies? That that's why I was asking Rebecca. Um. Is it good to no. drown babies? It, okay, so hu- we we humans? follow a guy. You follow a guy who drowns babies and thinks it's good, but you don't think it's good to drown babies. Is that where I'm at? That we're at? Um, yeah, because there's a gigantic difference between me and God. What's the difference? He's the creator of life. He's the Why creator does that of all things. So if, if I'm a creator, does that give me the right to drown babies? Well, um... Deepak what if, it, what if it's your own baby? No, no, no. Look, I, no, the only reason I did that is because I feel like this particular conversation has been had before. Yes. Not so it is, had it's had just the yeah. same. Let's, yeah, let's, I have had this conversation. Let's, get back, let's like, get back to the like, point. Uh, like, like, I haven't thought about this deeply enough, but these questions oh, are Rob. so profound. Tell me what somebody says it's about it. the Rob. same thing. I think have it's looked, I, hey, I, the Bible I, says, have you looked into the Apkalu situation oh, of the first God. four verses of Genesis 6? What does that have to do with what the question? That has everything to do with what's going I'm, on. I'm explain passage. it to me. Explain how that has anything to do with the question I'm asking. It's known as the Adapa e- Epoch. Great. Explain where you have to what's me known as the Apkalu has... sages uh-huh. associated with the Mesopotamian context of uh-huh. the so called Marsh Arab population that made reed boats. Uh huh. And the religious circumstances and the ziggurats that they built and so on. And then the Genesis text takes that milieu and makes Wait. a literary so you don't sort of like an elaboration from an Rebecca Israelite does. context as I'll, a polemic against that, that civilization. Yeah. So when, I mean, for example, when the flood text just says that there's a wind that causes... Just tell me you don't believe the flood when the text says in Genesis say that there's a wind that causes the flood waters to move Holy and so cow. on, that is an emphasis on the naturalistic account of the flood. It has you nothing should, to do with God. You should talk to forcing me the Indian Ocean to come in and spill in and, and drown babies. Do you think that's what ancient what Jews thought? Rob? Yes, that's what they thought. Okay. Chris, let's let Nathan talk. <clears throat> Because Nathan came in, he hasn't said anything. Well, just yet. I, I just want to clarify. That's a very good question that was raised. Notice how deep and profound that question was. That's a good question because that's what scholars ask. So when you look at the comparative literature of Ugarit and the cuneiform, and you see how like Inlil and Enki and all those other flood accounts, they actually purposefully drown people because of the noise that they they generate. It's like the gods. Is it like, a good thing? Oh, Rob? this is this is too is too much thing? for us. We need to drown. That, the Genesis text the has question. nothing associated with that. It's a natural event. It's a disaster event, but it's a natural event that swallows up that population. What you just said there is it's all you had to say. Thank all you. the other information was you didn't need to say. Completely irrelevant. It's not irrelevant. It was to the question. No, no, no. The, how it, is it that irrelevant? Okay, steel man what I just said. How is that irrelevant? No, no, bro, that's not the issue. The issue is that you're it assuming people you just care about what you... 
you're assuming people care about the details you're giving when all you could have said was, I believe it was a naturalistic event. It has nothing to do with God done. Thank you so much easier. But then the claim, you know, like, oh, so you haven't read the Bible. You don't believe what the Bible says. Right. So this is how don't believe that stupid happened. and simplistic that sounds. This, this is an emotional need. I go you, through the details. You do not want to be viewed but as But then simplistic. you suddenly raise that question. Why do you not want to be viewed as simplistic? You need to learn how to say, okay, people think I'm simplistic and be okay with it. Do you get upset if um, I'm not, I'm, atheists I'm not mis misrepresent you, Rob? Like if an atheist describes oh, wow. something about you that isn't actually your position, Back to do, you, I'm sorry, do you get Rob. upset by that? No. But I've had I'm many getting of these the discussions that before. You do this from this, your, this, is, from this is maybe the first time where I'm sort of just being out of my comfort zone as far as my, my approachability in, in discussions. Usually I'm quite mellow and chill, and but it's it's... Maybe finally, after a few years, it's finally there's like a snapping point where I'm just like, the more I spend my devotions in careful thoughts and reading and actually respecting the academics and the scholars in this in this area, it's like, and I keep coming back to this, and I just see the same echo chamber, a same a same stagnant echo chamber with the same questions, the same you know sort of back and forth, but there's just absolutely no growth. I, I I find more growth in like cults, even though it's an echo chamber for them. But I find when they have sort of like when they try and share ideas about their issues and so on, it's like I find more growth in that, ironically enough. Not not, you know, what I see over here. Okay. Hi Nathan. So Hi. Yeah. Hi, Nathan. <laughs> You're very quiet. What's great stash, well, Nathan? We could get back to the topic that we started on if anybody has anything to share about that. But I mean, I'm fine with, you know, going on other topics, but I feel like we should kind of let Rob um, not, you know, receive any more criticism. I'm fine with receiving questions. I've never been afraid of questions. No, not questions. The, like, well, you know, We've yeah, we're afraid of your answers. The criticism. Poor Rob. Like, I feel bad. Mine was just offered as, as honest feedback, like how you can maybe communicate more effectively. Uh, I do agree with Doug on, on the points, right? Like, but, but what I was trying to I've say... I've communicated... Is, I'm pretty sure I've communicated before charitably and fairly and so on. No, charitably maybe fairly, Maybe this time around, I'm just... Right? There's like a loss of patience where I'm just voicing my criticisms about the method and the approach that's taken. It's its its just gone on for too long. And I think I have the right to raise that as an issue. No, that's nothing all got to say. fine. That all is fine. I'm just saying, like, like, just in past videos, right, I just have a really hard time understanding what you're trying to say, right? And I think the way you go about communicating, like, complex ideas is, is just not helpful. Long no, I, no, Make it no, I actually admit, I've, I've also self-reflected on the way I approach, and I'm still working out, you know, because again, don't forget, I have, I'm having to truncate that, <laughs> you know, yeah. into like maybe five, ten seconds as a response, right? So, yeah. So I'm going to go to bed here in a, in a minute. I just want to say that I never felt like my question earlier was really answered um, okay. about um, how it's morally relevant to um, believe that the stories of Jesus are true. You, your, your answer was basically to tell me, well, here's the benefits of believing it's true but okay. that doesn't but that wasn't really the question i was trying to ask okay what am i not understanding about it like what is it what do you mean what how, how is, is it morally, morally relevant how, you know how is how is somebody believing that a story about a human sacrifice in the iron age to appease a wrathful deity because he's really really mad at the way he made you how 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 is somebody saying, wow, I find that story totally believable. I now believe it. How is that an indicator of good moral character? Whereas mm -hmm. if somebody says, eh, it doesn't really make sense to me. I, I don't believe it. How is that an indicator of them lacking moral character? How is it morally relevant to salvation at all? Why would a God use that as a determining 
um, factor for deciding, wow, I'm so impressed that that guy believes that this story about what happened in, in the Iron Age is, I want him in my kingdom. That really impresses me. Like, what's the rational basis for that? Well, I don't know if there is a rational basis, but in the way that you're characterizing it, I'm not sure that like there is a moral relevance because you're saying this person who doesn't believe it, you know, has these reasons and whatever. And like, that was the idea that I was trying to present that like, Hey, if Muslims, you know, if you present the gospel to them, they're probably going to be like, wait a minute, this goes against everything I've taught, you know, like, so what I'm saying is that people do have, uh, may have good reasons for not believing when right. they well, I don't want to know about message. the people that don't believe. I want to know about the people that do believe. <clears throat> Why does that impress God? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm, that's a good question. Well, you I don't say know. It's not the belief; it's the trust part, right? I, you know, um, let me. I have to think about an answer to that, Rob, or anybody else want to answer. I guess I don't know. If I'm sharing a, a section of my screen which might help you, Rebecca. Okay. If uh, in Matthew 25, mm -hmm. uh, where is it? Um, so this is when when the Son of Man comes in His glory. So this is the supposed judgment. Um, before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate them uh, one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep at his right, but the goat at his left. Um, then the king will say to those at his right hand, blah, blah, blah. Um, uh, my kingdom, the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. Uh, I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in the prison and you came to me. Uh, then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see thee hungry and feed thee or thirsty and give thee drink? And when did we see thee a stranger and welcome thee, or naked and clothe thee? Um, and and when did we uh, see thee sick or in prison and visit thee? And the king will truly answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. So I, th I think um, passages like this are at least indicative that the kind of criteria for salvation in like robust Christian theologies aren't going to be sort of some like attitude towards the proposition that like Jesus died on a cross or something, if that sounds vaguely more like plausible as a moral criteria. It certainly sounds better as moral criteria. Yeah. That's how I read it as someone who has absolutely no context. <laughs> well, I, w I would suggest, um, there's actually a famous, uh, I forget now um, the name of the guy, but apparently this is, dur this is during World War II in the context of Nazi Germany and all that. Um, he, he was a, a teacher in his classroom and he had like all the great evil people like Hitler and all those guys at the time. And he asked the classroom, would you stone these people? And so... I'm uh, the point of the, the the point of that depiction is that each evil person of of a certain kingdom, uh, a ruler of that particular kingdom, so all the students started stoning apparently this this and and tearing the <coughs> the paper uh, representing each person. Finally, Jesus is right at the back, and then the imagery here is that he wanted to teach them a lesson that yeah, you're obviously there's a rightful like, you know judgment that's needed to be on these particular people but then at the same time they also are representative of each ethnic group and culture and country and so violence begets violence in other words and in, in the, the, the weird paradox of that is that when jesus says if you were to do this to this person or that to that person it's like ultimately it comes down to you've done it to me um so in other words the passage is using apocalyptic imagery to say it's using sheep and goat, which is, you know, representative of ancient apocalyptic literature. That since the sheep and the goat are so far apart as animals, uh, how do you engage? Like, is racism 
something that Jesus approves of, no. Is, is say, sexual orientation, uh, say, say, a different cultural group, like the Aryan race in this case. It's like, no, we are the supreme race. You know, like, all of that is not uh, Jesus uh, accommodates into his kingdom. Um, that's why early Christian tradition took this passage to showcase an equality of humanity. Um, there is no, like, survival of the fittest, so to speak. Um, so that's the moral outcome of that uh, apocalyptic text. I think I have an answer to add um, here, James. And uh, just, I, I, I wanted to think about it for a minute, but I feel like, you know, the basis of any relationship that you have is trust, right? Like, otherwise, you don't have a good relationship with the person, right? So, I mean, uh, um, like, God wants us to be, to trust him. So it's a benefit to God in the same way that it's a benefit to you when someone trusts you. And it's, um, you know, that's the basis of the relationship with him. Trust usually follows after some sort of like initial back and forth yes. relationship, you know, where that's minimum like familiarity, so, rapport. Right? Yeah, rapport. Yeah, exactly. Right. There's usually some basis for trust. Yeah, yeah. So when you read what the creator of the universe no, no, no. has done, I don't think he's talking about reading. I think he's talking about interacting. No, I know. Yeah. I know he's talking about interacting. And I'm saying, but you're going to like, the reading part. But that is interacting. That's not interacting. Right. I'm not interacting with Stephen King when I read the, his his what books. I'm not interacting with him. Well, you are. You're because you're learning. What no. you okay, Michael? Please don't jump in and answer. Like interrupt. Just look. Let, let Just me. Just saying, it's not the it. same thing. Not the uh, same thing. Well, um, uh, you can you can you can also interact with God directly. But one of the ways that God. No. Why not? Well, how, no, how? How, how, how how can you interact with God directly? I'd like to know that. Okay, well, he will speak to you. That's um, that's a weird claim. So how do you interact with God directly? You personally, how do you? How um, do you do well, What's three times three, Rebecca? <sighs> I don't care about your answer. Tell me what you had for breakfast. Shut up. Next question. Like, you know, this isn't a good way of like... Uh, how do you someone. interact with God? Yeah. Um, how does he interact with you? A very simple he question. He speaks to me. And How does he speak to you? In I'm trying to tell you, but you keep it or is it through like experience? Is, is it through experience or does he well, physically Well, one of the ways that he speaks to me is through the Bible. Another way he speaks to me is by giving me, he tells me things in my mind. Another way me, is he gives me pictures in my mind. Another way is telepathy. he gives me dreams. Um, another way is he speaks sometimes through other people. Okay, so um, I, I, I speak to Stephen King through reading his books, through having dreams about the stuff that's in his books. Does that is that the same thing? I'm not having dreams about stuff that's in his books. In his You're not book. having dreams about stuff that's in the Bible? No. Okay. So does God interact with you as part of that? What is do you he mean? in the Bible? I, I don't understand your question. Are you asking about the dream or the Bible? All of the above. Does does God interact with you in the same way he interacts with people in the Bible? Yeah. So he comes down and talks to you? I've never seen him. So that's not the same. Because in the Bible, he comes down and talks to people. He wrestles with people. He, Sometimes. Uh, he, shows, he shows up for uh, Saul on the road to Damascus. So it's not the same thing? Sometimes. I mean, you that that's not the only way he talks to people in the Bible. Right, but you sometimes he gives them a vision. Sometimes he, you know, um, have you personally had that moment where he comes to you though? Where he, where I see him physically in person. Physically, no. yeah, you know, like in reality, as opposed to a dream or you know a thought, an no. actual part. No, and I don't need that. Why? Um, it's just. Is there? I, I don't. I don't see why I would. Is there any other aspect in your life where you don't need that? Is, have you had a relationship in the past with a boyfriend where you just didn't need that? Or a family member? Maybe a better question is, do you that? want that? Like if you could spend an hour re learning about Jesus in the scriptures or spend an hour with, a coffee a with him in, um, 
at Starbucks. Would you rather spend an hour with Jesus at Starbucks or an hour? Definitely. At... That would be awesome. I mean, I'd but much <laughs> rather see him in person. Right. Um, yeah, I guess then we atheists are in the position where without something, without having spent an hour with Jesus in Starbucks, we can't imagine putting like making that leap of trust. Right. Or calling but it can, a relationship. Can I just, can I, can I also answer point. that? That's a How very good question. Call it a relationship at that point. Well, my interest coming into the faith was I'm thinking, I'm not going to go down that, that trajectory. I'm just saying what happened to me is that I'm thinking very deeply about death because of my opa's passing. Doug may presume I'm thinking emotionally about it. No, it, it intrigued me as a reality thing. So you separated now, your emotion at that point? Oh, definitely. Yeah, at the funeral. Yeah, I did. You were able to Like, separate that was my your first emotion. experience. Yes, I, 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 yes, there was emotions, but I actually separated. I'm, I'm touching his cold forehead, and I'm just looking at this, and I'm thinking, wow, it's actually a literal thing. And then I'm thinking about, hey, I'm, I'm obviously not the only one thinking about this. Obviously, there's a lot of opas passing away at this very moment. And lo and, you know, lo and behold, it's like, look how naive you are, Rob, because thousands of people have been thinking about this for thousands of years. So. I'm looking at the models associated with, say, how religions interact with this thing known as death. And ultimately, you know, long story short, my association with the Christian faith and my following Jesus is such that, yeah, I would love to have, like, say, coffee with Jesus. I've never had the so-called Damascus Road experience. I don't, I never looked for that, and I never came into the faith emotionally with respect to that. My coming into the faith was the data points, and now this may sound quite peculiar, but ask any Orthodox Christian, and they'll they'll, they'll know exactly what I'm saying. They are sort of like they have a relationship with the text. They're having they're, they're sort of like yeah, you know, Christianity is a text-based religion. It's not some emotional like some Star Wars force or something. It's 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 a constant going back and reforming with respect to what the text is saying. That's ultimately what I mean. If I if I were to boil it down and psychologize what Christians are doing for thousands of years, that's literally it. Uh, it's so you, it's also creedal. It's like based so you on don't what the have creeds, a relationship the way they're Jesus, formulated. Just the text that he's mentioned. Well, theologically, there's a there's a theological drive with respect to the text, and then this, hence then the. You know, then it's a uh, retrojection back to say praying to so, God and Jesus, and that's sense. Stephen King. Let's, let's go to that route. So I can read Stephen King, and now because I'm reading Stephen King, I'm having a relationship with him spiritually. Is that is that where well? We're if you if you think about it, it's there is a you are reading his words. You know, you right. are. I don't have a relationship having, with him though. I wouldn't. Call he had, but he because he's not omniscient and omnipotent, and you know, he's just a guy that's written <laughs> stuff. <laughs> but but you do have like when if your mom like back in the old days when they have to mm -hmm. physically write letters and leave like a like a postscript and so on those are very personal you're actually reading something that's very personal right I still it's not it just a, it's not just words on a the page there's meaning behind it I, I still wouldn't refer to it as a personal it's relationship. A relationship it's so weird you know to, to read you're talking you about a, conversation you you're pal? talking about you're talking about a dynamic. I can identify with this person. I can connect with this person through their writings, but I still don't have a personal relationship with them. But That's completely different. If Stephen King wrote it to you, though, if he wrote a book to you... That still wouldn't be a personal relationship. That would be reading something somebody wrote to me. Not a personal relationship with I somebody. Think that kind of, it doesn't really matter what we call it. I think that gets... Is, do we base so trust on that, to right? direct, to directly, They're addressing, like... Addressing Rebecca direct writing to her, so like more of a direct relationship. Do you think, as opposed to Stephen writing a book and you reading that book, and he's never written it to you, or it's like just a pen writing pal. a book that you can. So like a pen pal. Some like a pen pal. But... Right. Well, the pen pal in the Bible so you doesn't have know me very well, book. apparently. So it's that's but your presumption. I'm just trying to get at. I'm just the trying Christian, to like, tradition will say otherwise. Reading the book. Out. It's my conclusion after reading the book. It seems like it based seems like on you again your method, like I'm presuming your method in that whole approach. I'm sorry. At what point in my life does it matter about burning my it's, my daughter because she's a prostitute? None of this is written to me. I don't see my burning your daughter because the, she's a prostitute. Have you read the Bible again? In the Old Testament, it tells you to, to burn your daughter if you're a priest. 
and she's a prostitute. Burn her. You're, again, you're associating ancient Near Eastern law codes. Right, it's in the Bible. And saying not? that becomes a universal law. Have is, you read ancient Near Eastern law Bible, codes and how Rob? that's related to... God, focus, Rob. Focus. Hey, is, the, is Bible? the Bible monolithic? Oh my gosh, no. It's not a monolithic text. According to you, Rob. That's great. Do you know what monolithic cool. means? Is it in the Bible, Rob? What is monolithic? Is it in the Bible, Rob? <laughs> is Bible singular or plural? See, this is not good. But what's it, Rob, do you consider the Bible like the inerrant word of God? or? Thank you. Yeah, Thank I you. do. Okay, there you go. Oh, then... But what is, what is uh, inspiration? Is it uh, falling out of the sky? Is it uh, the Trinity in the Matrix? You know, I, can't, I don't know the, how to fly the chopper. Instant download, how to fly the chopper? Is that what the Bible is? The point the Bible says what guy was trying to say, make was that there's a ton of stuff in the Bible that really doesn't seem would help garner that trust and faith and relationship that you're talking about. It sabotages. That and that's, that is, I'm, I'm, sabotage. I'm, sabotage. There's the word. Look, if, if, if people have that, if they read the Bible, hey, I'm happy to have a discussion with them about it. But if you're going to act really childish and immature with respect to your conclusions, Simplicity then is always there's no point in regards in having a sophisticated discussion as to why I think it's a logical text, because I'm looking back at the ancient culture and, and, and teasing out what's going on, why that's written to begin with. What's the logic and reasoning for that? What is the logic behind that one, Rob? About what? The burning the prostitute? Burning your daughter who's a prostitute. What's the logic behind that one? So, in that ancient Near Eastern no. situation, the superstition. Okay, go see, ahead. See, 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 see the immediate. Just feel mm, the wrong way. I gun, right? <laughs> and you revealed your intentions. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, but it, there's not really much point in him answering if, you know, it's clear that you don't actually care what his answer is, right? Like, oh, it's but just uh, Rob has showed me throughout this entire conversation that he likes to go down rabbit holes that don't really add to the to the question. Oh, and okay. That's kind of where I was going with it. Oh, he's going there again. <laughs> Is he? Oh, God. Here we go. But no, he's he's actually answering it. Thank you, Nathan. Nathan he's actually answering. Go I'll ahead. I'll leave Rob. it to you now. All right. Like Which, Nathan and I, I respect Nathan's right. position because him and I can actually have, a, you know, anyway, go for it, Nathan. Like, I, well, that, that's what I'm saying. It just seems unproductive, right? Like, it, it seems like if, if you kind of treat someone in a way where it's clear that you don't care about what they have to say, then it's just creating this kind of abrasive tension right and and you're not going well to i think the, i think the bible the answer, says yeah, hang on the, I, the bible says what i, I don't I think don't you're familiar think that with right. yeah that's where he was going he made clear that that rob was about Dres, to you're cutting in and out Drace, we cannot hear you okay we cannot hear sorry you. can you hear cutting in and out i wouldn't even try if i were you okay we're glad you're here, but you got to... Because your audio is just so terrible. Up. It is. Yeah. Doug's in Old Testament mode right now. <laughs> well, the, the, okay. uh, the Bible says, what? Well, like anything, any bad thing that you can come up with that the Bible says, it's not going to have any impact on Rob whatsoever. Because so I'm not denying the bad stuff. The, obviously, there's bad stuff. Yeah, so I wouldn't even try. It's outdated, primitive barbarism taking place in the in the Bible. I don't deny that. But it seems like the Bible's message is that uh, those, like, those are not just descriptions, right? Those are prescriptions from uh, supposed all, whatever, good God, right? That's the part that we want. And that's to... the misunderstanding. They're not Apparently prescriptions he care. from God. They're not prescriptions from God. I see. Um, no. hmm. They claim it's to a be. reaction. It's it's literally a reaction to. The superstitious beliefs and the barbarisms that's taking place in that culture, and you have a de-psychologizing to try and bring about a Jesus ethic, which finally happens. It's like the days are coming when this will happen, and sure enough, the Jesus story comes, completely so doing like, away with that superstitious nonsense. Are you seeing something like things were really bad back then, and God worked in a way to like minimize the badness and bring it closer and closer to something better? In other words, yeah, like. I would say, according to the biblical model, notice I'm thinking here in models. So you have an Eden narrative, which doesn't have burning witches and prostitutes. Then in the middle of that model, it's like humans go run amok. And sure enough, 
different ethnic groups, different superstitions, false beliefs, and wrong thinking. Okay, God's to... having to reprogram that situation, and then the Jesus story, which then goes back to the whole world to reclaim it back to an Eden sort of paradise. Like, what's wrong with that? That's a pretty beautiful message. So what's wrong with it is that the disclaimers you're offering aren't there. It doesn't say, these are wrong think. Hmm. Instead, it says, this is God think. Huh, God yeah. said do this. God commanded this. God sanctioned this. And now you're coming back and saying, yeah, it says God sanctioned this stuff. It says God commanded this stuff. But the writers were wrong. It didn't really mean that. And you can tell they didn't really mean that if you dive into a whole bunch of complicated, complex, nuanced stuff about histori historical relationships between different cultures. And I'm like, that doesn't change the fact that the Bible says God said to do these things. You nailed it, James. Yeah, I again, did. your approach in that um, is then when you, what you're doing then is you're, you're truncating literally the, the extreme ends of the book and just saying, Psh, it's all happening in an instant. It is a trickle effect. And when you do read phrases where, and the Lord said, uh, again, scholars will, will, will come back at you and say, eh, it, it doesn't mean that. Uh, if you... If you go with the idiom and the usage of language at the time, it's sort of like an authoritative, theocratic sort of role in this. Because let me just say, let me just give an example with this respect to this Lord said situation. Jeremiah 31 is a prophecy about, hey, you know that first covenant, the 613 laws that was given to you, that does include these barbaric acts like chopping women's hands off and, you know, if they grab a man's testicle and just really weird stuff, which doesn't originate from God. It comes from Assyrian laws and the ancient Near East. There it is. God himself in Jeremiah is like, well, the day is coming when all of that's just going to be done away with because that's not my original intent in this, in this situation. Never was. But I, can't, I, I brought it about to sort of, you know, bring you guys out of that. And so that the days are coming when a new covenant will be made. It won't be written on tablets of stone. It will be written on, on your heart and the Jesus story comes and summarizes that promise. Like, can you, can you guys hear you see, me? The, okay? This is this is the nuance you have to wrestle with when you you can't just read yeah, an English translation and think, okay, God is you know speaking that way and that's that. I had a question, I had a question for Rob with respect to that, but can you guys hear me now? Yeah, yeah. much better. Thank you, um, mm -hmm. Rob. When you say that though, like you know, you were saying that the original thing wasn't really God's intention; it was just local cultural laws that people came up with and that wasn't his original intent but jeremiah uh, reveals god's true intent that it is god speaking through jeremiah so like why why in the first instance would you say that it's not god speaking but here you're very confident that it is god speaking like these other people before have said that it was god and that's in the bible so why here with jeremiah in the bible is it now god Okay, so when you have later prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, they go into what scholars will mention as an apocalypsis, like an unveiling apocalyptic literature. It's, it, it's a whole different category, which becomes a unique thing in Israelite history. It's not, for example, if I can't say that Jeremiah's experience is exactly the same as Moses or Abraham or anyone prior. When you look at, say, Abraham's story, you have to relate with, you have to see how God interacts with these people with respect to that cultural context. It's vastly different. With respect to Jeremiah, it's like he has a theophonic, you know, I'm placing my words in your mouth. It's a Babylonian exilic situation. And Jeremiah, Daniel, and Ezekiel have very, like, Babylonian polemics at play in the text. So, in other words, God is, like, talking Babylonian. He can't talk Babylonian, say, to a Sumerian audience, which is closer to Abraham, because they're vastly different. Um, so, it sounds like you're saying when people write on behalf of God. God. It's 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 with respect to the culture, the beliefs, how God interacts. So, um, Exodus is Egyptian. There's Egyptian idioms and nuances at play, like the plagues are associated with Egyptian culture and beliefs. Um, you can't, I don't you can't take Jeremiah and force that onto Exodus. So, I mean, like, there's a couple of things that I don't understand there. The first is that, like, you speaking from a modern Western perspective, you're able to grasp and appreciate 
other cultures and the way that they thought things. So why were the ancients somehow inept in being able to do that? And why, why isn't God capable as a communicator in being able to convey these ideas to his followers? And then like a, a little bit beyond that is that like even like supposing that he has to speak to people within their cultural idiom, why, why is it the case that if the cultural idiom is wrong, he simply can't communicate that to them? Uh, clearly, why is he simply going along with what you would consider to be barbaric practices simply because it's a matter of their culture at the time? Yeah, the, the, very good question. So I can look back sort of like a big picture mode and look at all those cultures, right? In fact, not just me. This this is archaeologists and paleontologists and linguists that look at the, the texts and, you know, decipher them and blah, 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 right? The reason why we can do that is because they're set in stone, kind of like a snapshot. And we can go back, amalgamate it all. We have the data and the resources and the technology to to catalog it in, in one thing. Those cultures didn't have that opportunity because they're localized. And they're localized in time and space with respect to that that situation. Now, now it's a presumption then for you to think that, uh, I forget now how you put it, but like something to do with their wrongness and in their beliefs and, and why doesn't God communicate more clearly? That's a presumption on your part. I think what I'm saying is take any snapshot in history with respect to the biblical text that's associated with that history. And I'm arguing that God is communicating a hundred percent clear, you know, the so-called persecuted scriptures happening in that moment, like Ezekiel one with the wheels. That's, that's Marduk imagery with the throne platform that they actually developed in Babylon. Like, you can't get any more clear because God is communicating to that group with that language and nuance and so on. So you were um, saying that you were saying that it was. I, I'm going to take a hind seat in just a second because I know plenty of other people want to jump into this. But um, you know, you were saying before that uh, you considered uh, the the older accounts uh, in Exodus, for example, uh, and you pointed out that. Uh, you thought that this was barbaric, but you attributed it to Syrian culture at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, but then you said that it was my presumption uh, that uh, that it was wrong and could have could have been communicated more clearly. But I I wasn't presuming that I was. Oh, I see what you're saying. Basis what, so that, of what you were saying there, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I see what you're saying. You're saying since we do know that that's barbaric, why doesn't God? Um, you know, on your point blank, yeah. tell them it's, it's on, barbaric. Given your proposal that it is barbaric, and we're assuming that that's true, and that mm -hmm. it simply comes from a Syrian, uh, a Syrian or Egyptian uh, way mm -hmm. of looking at things, um, why is it the case that that's not communicated? Rather, God simply I, adopted I would say, that. yeah, that, that's a very, yeah, no, I see what you're saying now. That's a very good question. It's something I've asked myself. I find it interesting that the text, now, and this again goes back to comparing the Genesis biblical text with the ancient Near Eastern text. I would say it is, I wouldn't put a percentage on it, but there is an engagement with that, where there's a watering down of that because God is not satisfied with that. The fact that there is even a watering down to me communicates that this transcends the culture. Because no culture would go out of the way to tweak and, and deliberately be uncomfortable with those very practices. So, for example, when I mentioned about the woman's hand getting chopped off, the Middle Assyrian law includes the ripping out of the breasts and taking out one of the eyes, depending on, I kid you not, the text is very deliberate. Not the, not the Deuteronomy text, the Middle Assyrian text says if one of the testicles were to become atrophied and infected, and this added dilemmas to the woman. The Deuteronomy text takes that Middle Assyrian text, does away with all the other grotesque imagery, and just says, chop the hand off. That is a massive watering down of that particular law. The point is, though, that that law in our eyes is still barbaric. It's, you know, it's still wrong. We, we shouldn't do that. But there's a certain logic associated with the cultural norms of what happens when you kill off, say, one of the men, and what will happen to his family, so it's sort of like an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, sort of give and take in that sense. But the so point is you do have a watering down engagement with the circumstances of the barbarisms of that 
practice. I got one last thing for you, and then I'm going to shut up, which is, um, you know, you're talking about how you, you look at it as an implication that there's something transcendent going on because the culture wouldn't do that itself. Uh, and mm -hmm. I got to be honest with you, I don't think that that's, uh, that's really a realistic way of looking at culture. Cultures change, and they don't just change because of external influences. They change because of internal dynamics that are going on over time. And so I just don't understand why you would consider a culture eventually moving away from, you know, from more ruthless practices. Uh, eventually, the population can change and look upon those practices uh, as no longer agreeable to them. They don't like that anymore. And so they want to move in a different direction. Uh, I think cultures change naturally by themselves. And I don't see any reason to, to look at that as some kind of implication that something transcendent is taking place. So I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. And, yeah. uh, and after that, I'm done. Yeah, no, again, good observation. Like, the reason why I would say there's a transcendence is because, again, since you're talking about Deuteronomy, Deuteronomus, second recounting of the law, right? Nomos means law, it's second, Deuteronomus. Now, why? Because the situation is going on in the Exodus, and then Moses truncates that in this final book called Deuteronomy. Now, here you have a people group, according to the, to the story in the text, coming out of Egypt. This people group supposedly wandering the wilderness, they're needing a land, hence it finally happens to be Canaan, and that, and that becomes Israel. Now, they become, uh, again, according to their perception, they become the, the, the center of the known world. Interestingly enough, when you look at the way other ancient Near Eastern cultures engaged religiously, theologically, and so on, there is no, they're still stagnant. There is no... Um, like like kind of what you're in, you're implying like like sort of like like self-reflection and upgrading and it's just this is what it is this is how we operate end of story and then they die like cultures fight cultures kingdoms rule you know they've they invade other kingdoms and then they they just dissolve into nothing and then that's it interestingly the jewish ethnic group has survived the way it has because of the self-reflection which when you look at, say, or you ask the question, how does that self-reflection even originate? Especially with that cultural pressure going on at the time and so on, the way people used to be. It's like these people group were the only ones that had a sense of, like, sensibility to be self-reflective and to upgrade and, and, and you know, throw out what is not needed anymore. That is the Old Testament leading into the New. And I'm saying there is a sort of, like, divine presence that's pushing them in that direction. Because the text also gives that impression as well. Hang on, I, you believe that the that a deity has something to do with the Bible because of the self reflection of the Jews? Yes. Wow. I'm gonna bow yeah. out. Thanks, guys, for having me. This has been a blast. Thanks for being on, Michael. Thanks, Rebecca. Thanks. Nice talking to you again. Nice. Yep. Bye. Ciao. Bye. Too. Yeah. Uh, See you, so, so Rob, like you, you know, you you um, you like to talk in terms of models, right? Like the biblical models. So, I guess from my perspective, like it's starting to sound like your model is is overparameterized, right, and overfitting, right? Because you're adding these. From my perspective, you're trying to interpret this text in a way that makes sense to you, and so you add these variables, right? Like this section is. I'm kind of paraphrasing and simplifying. No, like, no, go for it, go for it. I like where you're going with this. Like, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm just saying like deep enough, but like, yeah. it sounds like you're saying, okay, this section we've got to interpret it this way, that section we've got to do this, and like, you know, you know, and, and this is the impression I get, like it just sounds like, and from my perspective, yeah, but you're, thinking, I, but the impression, I want you to also quickly, I want to quickly say this, you're sort of seeing then, when I say it's a model, it is a model, circumstantial things going on to, that that you know that builds up into this model. It's right, yeah, you know, right, right. Yeah. But I'm trying to decide on this model, right? And on the other hand, I have like the I have the null hypothesis sitting here, and, and you know what the null hypothesis is, right? Mm. And I'm yeah. like, you know, <laughs> am I really going to reject that? <laughs> so that yeah, but for you, what would be the null hypothesis in 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 re with respect to my model? It's just a humans, by... a, yeah, humans' right stuff. Yeah, humans' right stuff. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's, it. That's, all it's all That's it. Without a deity. Without so a all deity. the straw manning with, you know, the way you perceive inspiration in the Bible, that is not my model. You got it. 
At the end of the day, the Bible is a human text. Drace asked you a great question. What makes you think that a deity has anything to do with the Old Testament or New Testament? And you said because of the self-reflection of the Jews, basically. That's one parameter. So, and I, I kind of like, I, I know I said that I was going to shut up, but when you said that, I, I really want to add one last thing, if you guys will humor me. Um, Go for it. Because you were saying uh, about how the self-reflection on the part of the Jews was something unique to them. But when I study ancient history, I don't see that. Like when I take a look at Greek culture and you compare like the attitude of the of even older ancient Greeks like Thucydides and then compare him to Socrates. I mean, like, what is that if not like a major difference in viewpoint where there's self-reflection going on in the culture? Um, and likewise in Rome, like you take uh, take like. Um, Cicero for the Roman Republic, and then later take um, Virgil writing the uh, Aeneid. Like that's totally different perspective. One is is a, a, a pro Republican, uh, has very uh, particular norms on like private property and stuff like that, and the other one is a glorification of empire. So like, there's totally like Drace, a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. Drace, going what on you need? No, these are all excellent points. Yeah. Drace, what you need to ask Rob is, do you believe a deity had anything to do with the self-reflection of the Greeks? I would say yes. Yeah, and that's all I right. So then, you would have said that. So then we're we're abandoning the idea then that the Jews are uniquely self-reflective. No, 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 no. Now again, part of the the Jewish model is such that there's no discounting in the fact that there are other gods accommodating the thought processes of those other cultures and this is no. this comes now down to a much lot the, the model now expands now it's god versus the gods from the jewish mindset and i quickly just want to say this with respect to the greco-roman situation i find it very interesting plato word for word thinks of deuteronomy 32 verse 8 about a supposedly a most high god that subjugates the nations to other gods and the interesting thing about the Greco-Roman thought is that it, it becomes very, like, abstract. I mean, if you look at Iliad and the way the stories are sort of developed, it's sort of like a, a god does this and this event takes place. Ergo, what's our reflection on that? It becomes more in that sort of flavor. Rob, here's an SC type um, question. Can a culture self-reflect and change for the better without a deity? Uh... Yeah, that's. I would say yes, but there's a, there's there is def, there is the deity is still part of that, or the theology of that is still part of that, which can lead to where it can run how it should run. In by other words, itself, can a whole culture habit. change for the better, self-reflect, without any god god involved at all? In that sense, no. Like if you're talking about just absolute zero and nothing ever happening. Okay. No, so Drace, this yeah. this line of questioning is totally useless because if any self-reflection for the better for a whole culture has to involve a God, then just by definition, Rob's going to answer, it just has to be. Sure. But my thing can I give Drace, like... Drace, can I give you, can I just give you an analogy, say from the gospel with respect to Greek Roman thought? Like yes, I wanna, um, I'm, I'm interested I, to hear your... Yes, uh, you can, but uh, let me just let me. Uh, yeah, answer try dogs to, and then, yeah. So, because my thing is that, like, originally when we were going down this this uh, line of thought, the argument was that uh, because of this unique self reflection on the part of the Jews that you see in the Bible, this is an implication of something transcendent coming down uh, and and kind of revealing certain you know something to them. Uh, and then I pointed out that other cultures had that too and you agreed and so like so then i said okay so it's not uniquely the jews who are going self-reflective anymore and then but then you said no uh that wasn't your point and so now i'm like totally unclear about what the argument was because originally it was about self-reflective jews and when we all agreed on there also being self-reflective greeks and self-reflective romans that means that self-reflection isn't exclusive to them anymore, which you agreed with. So, I mean, like, I'm just kind of really confused right now. Maybe your analogy will help. Okay, I'll give you one from the gospel and maybe one from Paul, I, I, you know, and, and which one's more interesting, we can discuss that. So, for example, the woman with the issue of blood, you know, she's like, if I have a little faith, grab this robe and then I'll be healed. Um, are you? It seems like you've read, say, you know, Greco-Roman stuff, like, are you familiar with the humoral theory in 
Greek Roman medicine. In which theory? It's known as the humoral theory. Um, the four categories are that that make a healthy See, human. Rob, right? this like, is the problem. <laughs> so, like uh, blood and uh, and exactly. what are the other Flam, four? Yeah, the black yeah. bile. Like, yeah. right now in Greco-Roman society, they thought that if you're a woman, it's because you were undercooked in a woman's womb, in your mother's womb. If you are a man, you are nicely cooked. So if, if if you're a woman, you are more porous, leaky. Um, you're a weaker creature, <laughs> as Peter says in in his letter. It's like he's using Greco-Roman terminology. The woman, the wife, is the weaker vessel. Um, now Mark is written to a Roman audience. It's a Roman gospel. I find it interesting, and scholars have brought this out that it just changes that perception and belief on its head. Here's the engagement. Here's This is where I'm going with this. So you have this woman in a Jewish setting written to a Greco-Roman audience where they know, yeah, this is a... Her, her humoral equilibrium is out of whack because not only is she a weak and porous creature, but she's got this issue. She then, you know, gets healed. And the I think text we get it, that, Rob. I think we get what you're well, saying. I haven't but got. I haven't got to the. I haven't got to the. To the. You're going to talk for another five power. minutes, and we're still going to get it. Okay. What am I going to say? That it's because of the unique way of how Paul or the the New Testament authors uh, relate to the culture that they were in to to take something that they previous previously had known and flip it on its head or get it in a way that they can understand it. And my question to you is. <laughs> Can human... The issue with the blood situation. What? What? Where was I going with that? The, the the issue is: Can humans write something like that that can appeal to that culture and ha have nothing to do with a god? And if the answer is no. Why? Why do you think that? Wait, what? Why do you believe I'm the saying... Bible? It has anything to do with the deity. You're answering that question. Right? I'm saying the text is actually going right in line with those belief systems at the time you have okay. an actual the, the the acclaim of a of a the historicity All of right. that event why do you believe that Jesus has to have character. anything to do with a deity because it's going beyond the culture something that no text should do at well, that if, time if a text goes beyond the if culture if that text is saying women are not porous weak vessels that is unique that is a very unique claim. That that where does it come from? If a text is unique, does that mean it's divine? I'm suggesting that the Jesus story showcases the transcendence of the ethic and the, I, and the issue. Can you please answer my question? If a text writes something unique, does well, that if mean it's, it's if divine? If it's a text that comes from that deity, yes. Then it oh. then the Bible, which is a human text, becomes unique. Veil of ignorance, thought experiment. You see a text and it's saying something very unique that's never been written before. Does that mean it's from a divine entity? No. There you go. Why do but, you believe this but text is? Notice, but notice when you ask that question, what makes it unique in the first place if you know nothing else? How do you know it's unique? You've read all the texts in the world. You see something new. Does that mean it's from divine? You said no. So tell That's us again. Not, that wasn't your question. So tell us again. Why do you believe you, you that deity has question. anything to do with the Bible? Because of the fact, the history of Jesus, because of the, what the theology is showcasing, because of the established situation of the Roman, Greco-Roman humoral theory and the, their perceptions of women, and then the theological faith claim that takes place underlying that story as a whole. And to me, that transcends the Roman, Greco-Roman culture. It just completely shows how petty and ridiculous and, and narcissistic and, you know, like, but you know the misogyny your first that's taking place of that culture. You notice your first answer in that list was the historicity? That's, the, I think, the first thing you said in that list of things. And notice that when Drace asked you about the historicity of the, of the um, Old Testament, we said, well, that's what it says, but that's not what it means. Kind of, <laughs> no, you, you misunderstand some other me stuff. That. Yeah, I'm, I'm summarizing. <laughs> I'm not but... denying any history of anything in the Old Testament, Doug. So there's, there's other stuff too, though. Like, for example, you know, you're talking about how, uh, like, for example, with respect to uh, 
how we understood gender, how they understood gender back then and how it flips it on its head. Uh, mm -hmm. And where did this idea come from? And again, I would just say that there are totally natural ways for humans to develop in terms of their thinking uh, that you know this would come about. You, you had this kind of um, aristocratic kind of mentality, uh, patriarchal mentality, Dres, I'm going to try. I'm going to try the Pine Creek method. Here. I'm going to be trying very. The brev. I'm going to try for okay. people why, why short. Okay. Darwin. When Darwin came on the scene. Right. Okay. What? Oh my gosh! There's a relationship. Like when you look at all the morphology and the genetics. Yeah. Notice how there's already a perception of the way things are. Something revolutionary like Darwin comes and, you know. When Paul in 1 Corinthians 11 says, hey, you know, you women who practice head covering, hey, I know why you do that, because you believe a woman's hair is a substitute for what they lack, and that's male testicles. So a woman's hair is an external testicle in the Greco-Roman belief. Paul says, stop that. Her hair is her glory. She's not some, she doesn't need to cover her hair because of this weird belief that you think that her hair is some external te te testicle. Right, like, and so... That is very unique for Paul to say something like that because that belief continues on into Islamic tradition because, again, so, it's part of that culture. Right, but see, here's my thing, though, is that, like, you know, what I was trying to go into before is that you have this kind of aristocratic, patriarchal point of view, um, but what you're seeing in Paul is is the exact opposite of that. And But it's no surprise that we would eventually get that from all of the people who do not benefit from that aristocratic, patriarchal point of view they're going to see things quite differently. And so they're, all, they're eventually going to uh, organize a system of thought that shares opposite kinds of sentiments. Uh, and that's exactly what I think that we see there. Um, but, like, but I want to focus a little bit more on what you were saying about uniqueness, because once upon a time, the aristocratic, patriarchal, typical Roman point of view, where did that come from? You know, like if we're saying that every new idea you know, has some kind of divine implication to it that humans can't come up with new ideas on their own, then wouldn't that original, uh, the, the earlier point of view need a divine source as well? And the one before that and the one before that, since Good apparently point. humans can't think of anything on their own. Yeah. And according to the biblical model, again, I'm working now within the parameters of the biblical model. The claim is, like Psalm 82 says, there are many gods that inspire, you know, different cultures and so on but then the Israelite God is the one that judges those gods for doing wrong in those situations so every thought that humans have every idea comes not from God. every gods. thought that's not every, again cultural ideas see, come see from how God? simplistic how you how you brought that down to such a simplistic culture like every thought please forgive me please forgive me cultural ideas come from gods yes according to the biblical text yeah Hey, remember that Doug is just like a simple guy from Manitoba or Saskatchewan. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I think, um, you know, I have to say, like, when I hear these kind of perspectives, it's, it just, it feels, it, I, I don't know, it's just like kind of a stretch, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of feels like, so Rob, are you and only a select few other people able to understand what's going on in the Bible because like, I don't know. It just seems like there's so much that has to go into this way. Of My intention is to show the intelligibility of these ancient texts, why they even exist. And, and my, the reason why I became a Christian is I was totally gobsmacked at the realization that the Bible is one heck of a compilation of very thoughtful, intelligently put together, stuff. Oh, I really true. want to ask you about that, Rob. Oh, I really want to ask you, mate. Hey, you're that's, Australian. That's your question, Rob. Main... Are you Aussie? Yeah, yeah. I am. Yeah, that's I'm right. Don't hold it against yeah, yeah. me. Oh, well, it's probably Sorry. a lot warmer yeah. there than it is here. I'm in Melbourne. Um, it, sounds <laughs> like, it sounds like what you're saying. So if, I, if I've misunderstood you, please let me know. But it sounds like what you're saying is when you look at things in the Gospels and in Paul's letters, they really run counter to the cultural norms that existed in that Greco-Roman world. They so work far. with and run counter at the same time. Yeah. Would you expect something different from a cultural movement in an environment like that? Uh, 
uh, explain what you explain that. So, that. so Christianity began as a as a movement. Do we agree on that? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Would we expect a movement emerging within a culture to be totally different to or totally identical to the culture that it's in, or would you expect it to be, have little bits of the background and little bits of differences as it diverges in its cultural? Yeah, themes all, all like of that? the above, but also like uh, to try and improve, I suppose. Um, that sounds to, very to, put, to push to it forward to a more I, kind of like what we do, what scientists do today, like that there is such a thing as climate change. There are people that are against it. They're the yeah. ones that are yeah. hindering progress. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, so then, what you... what part of that, what part of that would you say requires divine intervention? Um. So then, well, I, okay. In that sense, I'm boiling it down to, um, in this case, Jesus and the claim that he's God on Earth, and then the story involving with that, which then just explodes out like a big bang into so the theological the explanations and the resurrection narrative, you know, it all comes down to basically that. Like, for me, that's probably the the null hypothesis, I suppose, is the incarnation. Um, if that didn't happen, then everything is just hearsay and just... Were there incarnations in the culture before Jesus? Uh, no. That's a completely unique event from a theological text. No, I mean, how about incarnation stories? I'm saying incarnation, not reincarnation. Were there incarnation stories before Jesus? In other words, no. people claiming to have divineness in them. No. None? Is that true historically? No. I don't true. I can't I don't really think that that's true historically. I mean, like, what about um what about Apollonius well, I mean, like, Diana or someone, right? Yeah, that's or like uh, that's after. Hercules. Okay, uh, so yeah, no, I guess nope. you could say that Apollonius uh, is probably usually what I hear is that uh, influence with respect to him comes post Christianity. You have a mimicking like, of so, with Apollonius, so, but he's well after Jesus. What about uh, now? Let me just be really clear on our claim here. Like any any incarnation of divinity at all. So, like for example, yeah, uh, yeah because if that's the case, then like Alexander the Great or uh, you know. Uh, Probably, yeah, uh, but did they did they develop a theology of hypostasis with Alexander the Great? Okay, no, but Rob, you see the problem here. But 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 did they do this way? But that's what wasn't my question. But that's but that's part of why I'm saying it's unique. That is hypostasis is a very unique. But this is gets to what category. Simon was saying. Simon's saying we have this background knowledge of how things were done in the culture, the beliefs that they had, and then there's little changes. That's what Christianity did. Is Alexander the Great God incarnate? Do they believe no. that? No. no, but I don't think but, that, but Jesus that was, was like, either. But that was not my question. My question is, was there anybody in history who claimed or some uh, other people claimed had some part of the divine in them? That That's they not were... incarnation. Could, they I were, didn't say it was. It's a very specific category. So like, yeah, because that's yeah. what I was trying to get clear on with respect to our question. Because like, if if a if a human being is born and they're born with some kind of divine source that pre-existed them, um, mm -hmm. would we consider that incarnation? Um, and if we say yes, then I think an example like Alexander the Great would count. But if we're if we're attaching all sorts of extra things to it, like you know, for example, coming up with a very complicated theory of it, such as you find with hypostasis. Like yeah. mm -hmm. that's that's a I think that's a separate issue and and making it more fine tuned of like a, becoming more of a specific question. But but Drace again I like where you th I I literally like where you're going with this. To be honest, I thank you for having a discussion like this because it sounds like you know you're well read in this. So like John one fourteen mentions the logos becoming flesh right, becoming that socks. So. Interesting that John is using Greco-Roman terminology, Logos, and doing something with it that the Greco-Roman people had no clue about. No conception of a Logos becoming flesh. Like, ta literally the Greek, tabernacling in human body. That is something so, that doesn't exist in Greco-Roman literature. I would, agree that, uh, I would agree that as far as I know, uh, in terms of ancient history, uh, that the logos becoming flesh would be uh, unique to Christianity, but like when if we're talking about um, ideas that 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 can build from, for example, the idea of uh, 
of deity that incarnates in flesh, um, I think that that precedes Christianity. And so like, if we're talking about things like um, the development of new ideas and cultural syncretism, don't you think that those novelties can come out of those predecessors? Ah, very good. And this goes back to my um, my example with Mark, uh, you know, with the, the homo humoral theory of the, uh, the leaky women. Uh, yes, but it's really nuanced because the point is, Mark is then trying to say that since you have power penetrating out to heal that woman, it's ergo it's showing something that no other male deity, I'm using male there deliberately, the male deities of the Greek Roman world, they don't have the incarnate like Rob, penetration you see where possibilities where that you see in this, this right? story. What about Inanna? Yeah, that's another one. What do you mean by that? So she's a woman who's who's female, uh, you know, and she uh, you know she dies and rises and she has her whole story. So actually, you know what? Uh, now that I'm thinking about it, uh, it really. I apologize. I don't think that that counts because Anana wasn't placed in history, as far as I know. Uh, she's purely yeah, that's mythical. Why, that's why I'm asking you. I don't see how that. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess that wouldn't count uh, because if we're assuming uh, the historicity of Jesus, I don't think the Anana example would count because. Plus, uh, are you are you going always... along with the whole dying dying and rising motif, like? That that's part of it. If we're talking about yeah. like uh, you know deities that are preexistent and then incarnate into the flesh, uh, you know, so like. Uh, I, I was thinking along those lines, but also along the lines of like Alexander, who was a real historical person and who had like, you know, a, a whole like virgin birth kind of thing with the whole story of the serpent uh, that uh, the Alexander's wife, uh, uh, the Alexander's father finds his wife with and all this stuff. Um, so, yeah, like, you know, like I said before, I think that if we're just talking about the idea of a deity incarnating in the flesh, that idea is there uh, in previous culture. Um, I would agree, though, that as far as I know, the notion of specifically logos becoming flesh would be distinctly Christian. But yeah. that doesn't matter. Are you familiar right? with... Guys, 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 I've been waiting for like 30 minutes to interrupt. Look. Well, I'll just quickly ask... I just want to quickly ask, Grace, are you familiar <laughs> with Mittinger's Dying and Rising God text, like his book on that? Like, he's probably the one of the main scholars um, that's written on this. Hold the phone. I'm going to ha ask you to repeat that question after Rebecca gets in whatever she had for us. Well, I'll, guys, I'll link it I in mean, the private chat. It's getting yeah. quite late. Um, and I wanted to come back to the topic that we started. And Nathan gave me a great quote. So I want to just, can we say, let's leave this discussion for tonight? Because this is like way off, like where we started. Yes. Um, can I just ask Rob to repeat his question for me? Because he asked me sure. if I had read a book. And then after that, uh, I'm done. So it's Rob, by a guy named uh, TND Mittinger. Oh, Mittinger. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've read, I've read Dying and Rising Gods. Yeah, I've read Dying God yeah, and yeah, Rising yeah. Gods. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good book. There's yep. actually follow-up texts that I can I'll link to you, which have done really good work on top of that. Yeah. So Thank that, you. That's great. Now, that, the fact that you're saying yes to that, that's why we're having a proper fruitful discussion. I hope you take notes to those that uh, came before. Cool. Yeah, good book. Well, I want to read it. This is very relevant. The quote Nathan gave is very relevant to what we're um, talking about. And I just want to see what you guys... Um, so, what is my current, uh, so is my current, uh, whatever you call it, title or name. That's also very relevant to what we're talking about. What is your current title? Let me Vanities. see. <laughs> No, it's a specific line in that verse, which oh really? I cannot. Oh, Ecclesiastes twelve twelve. Yeah. What is that one? There is a no. There's no end to reading and learning. Ah, uh, yeah. Well, wait a minute. I, that you're making it sound like the opposite. Much of study wearies the body. That. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. Yeah. You're making so, it sound like yeah, you should read as much as possible, but. I well, this quote is from, you know, somebody at the beginning of this said, well, if, you know, if what you're saying is true and, you know, Jesus Christ salvation is not exclusive and people can be saved without hearing the message, then why haven't more Christians believed this or talked about it? Because mostly what we hear is the exclusive view. 
And while that may kind of dominate in some circles, there are, um, you know, good scholars that have had this inclusivist view and C.S. Lewis is one of them. So in this, um, this is the, from the Chronicles of Narnia, the last, the final battle. And basically it's like judgment day when, um, you know, all, basically everyone shows up. And um, so uh, here's someone's reaction um, to showing up on judgment day and discovering that they had worshiped like a false God. Then I fell at his feet and thought, surely this is the hour of death for the lion who is worthy of all honor will know that I have served Tosh all my days and not him. Nevertheless, it is better to see the lion and die than to be Tisroch of the world and live and not have seen him. But the glorious one bent down his golden head and touched my forehead with his tongue and said, son, thou art welcome. But I said, Alas, Lord, I am no son of thine, but of the servant Tosh. He answered, Child, all the service thou hast done to Tosh, I account as service done to me. Then by reasons of my great desire for wisdom and understanding, I overcame my fear and questioned the glorious one and said, Lord, is it then true, as the ape said, that thou and Tosh are one? The lion growled so that the earth shook, but his wrath was not against me and said, it is false, not because he and I are one, but because we are opposites. I take to me the services which thou hast done to him. For I and he are of such different kinds that no service which is done vile can be done to me, and none which is not vile can be done to him. Therefore, if any man swear by Tosh and keep his oath for the oath's sake, it is by me that he has truly sworn, though he know it not, and it is I who reward him. And if a man do a cruelty in my name, and th then though says his name, says the name Aslan, it is Tosh whom he serves, and by Tosh his deed is accepted. Dost thou understand, child? I said, I, I said, Lord, thou knowest how much I understand. But I said also, for the truth constrained me, yet I have been seeking Tosh all my days, beloved said the glorious one, unless thy desire, sorry, beloved, and said the glorious one, unless thy desire had been for me, thou wouldest not have sought so long and so truly for all find what they truly seek. So I'd love to hear responses to that quote. <laughs> it oh, yeah. was so long. <laughs> I always. Uh, I have a question. I have a response. What if? What if what you really seek is the truth? Cool. Yeah, I, that's kind of. I, I kind of resonated with it in that regard. Like I really felt like uh, I've been on a path to that, and it's led me to some radical changes in my thinking. And I think like I'm happy to say I kind of been serving that master. But uh, somebody somebody heard our conversation the other day and told me to ask you uh, if if. If it, if it was true that there was no God, would you actually want to know that? Of course. You would. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for answering that question. What does that quote mean to you, Rebecca? Well, that quote means to me, this is exactly how I think about, um, you know, people in other religions um, when they are, they, they can be serving sincerely. They can be serving, you know, um, <clears throat> the wrong deity by name, but truly serving Jesus Christ. Mm. I have LDS missionaries tell me the same thing about Heavenly Father. Cool. And I believe that they're, they are serving Jesus Christ. Most of them. I mean, I'm like, I live in Salt Lake city. I have Mormons all over the place. Um, <laughs> and I, I hope that their faith doesn't fail. I think their faith is, um, I mean, for some people, you know, they're oppressed by their religion. So I'm not saying they should stay in like this, you know, oppressive cult if if that's what it is for them. But I, I know many, you know, people who have sincere love for Christ and, um, and they're part of the LDS church. You're writing a book on how like the like uh, Islam is not bad for Christianity, right? Is that the thing? Oh, I already wrote the book. Yeah. yeah, I think that's put. I mean, I think that's putting a lot 
on sort of like an ecumenical value. I'll say that. Read much. the book and then tell me. What <laughs> okay, you it's I'll, traditional I'll Catholic <laughs> teaching. Traditionally, Catholic teaching has always been that Muslims go to heaven. Yeah. Hmm. But the thing I was is, by Jesuit, so I'm, I'm down with it. I'm the thing, it. the question is, what is the real God? Because if you got di different people serving different gods and it's all the same God, well, which one of them is has the right view? Because some of these in, views are any, contradictory. In the, in yeah. the quote, I think the point was not that Tash um, was God as well, and this person was secretly, but it's that in kind of keeping that oath to Tash. So like the because the person's the the reason that this person remained loyal to Tash was because was out of this kind of sense of loyalty and doing something good. And because Aslan being God is the good that whenever anyone does something like put in pursuit of the good, then they're still pursuing God, even if it were. Yeah. So Tash is supposed to be like Satan, I suppose, in the non- But is world. it good to show mercy or good to exercise judgment? Like it's, how do you know you're doing? Depends the on the context. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Like it's, it doesn't, it, to me, it's an empty platitude quote. If I want to be honest, I, I think it yeah. depends on your like overarching theology quite heavily. But I think people who um, sort of have more pluralistic tendency, I mean, it's not it's not going to work for like really fundamentalist um, type Christians, I don't think. But people who have Hebrew, more, for, like, Hebrew for the Hindus, C.S. Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> well, like even I mean, the, the idea of um what's called like the convertibility of goodness and being is it it's like comes out of thomas aquinas's theology and so even though catholics can be pretty exclusivist there's also a lot of people when they dig into these sorts of things who sort of um you know do tend to become more pluralist because they're like okay well anyone who's pursuing the good right however it kind of manifests to them is um pursuing god if this version of christianity is true um, yeah. without them knowing it and we know the good through our int moral intuitions, right? C.S. So yes, Lewis wrote another book. Uh, it's not quite as well known. Um, it's like uh, it's this trilogy of like science fiction books, but oh, they're all kind of yeah. stealing, like not stealing, but like you know, like Mirror and, and, and yeah. yeah. So one of them is really interesting, I thought, because they go to like Venus, like what, like two guys go to Venus, right? In a, in a, and basically, so they land on Venus at the moment where God like creates like Venus's version of Adam and Eve and Adam and Eve are spending their like a day in the garden. Right. And so one of the humans like serves the role of like the, te the, the, the tempter, but the other one is kind of like the voice of kind of like, you know, don't do this. Like it ended up badly on earth or something. And so Adam and the, the Venus, Adam and Eve end up like rejecting the fruit of whatever. And so like, you know, everything remains unfallen on Venus something like that. So I, I thought that was a cool story. I mean, He's a good fiction writer. Um, I read uh, The Silent Planet when I was younger, and I really I, liked it. One of the of the series, yeah. Yep. The second part is the one I'm describing. OK, yeah, yeah, because I was wondering, because at first you were describing exactly the plot that I had in mind, and then you mentioned the whole Venus thing. I was like, oh, wait a second, that's a different book. But yeah, I did read the first one, and uh, he's a good author. He's a good fiction writer. I don't know uh, some of it. Uh, what was the the one with the the worms? Uh, the screw tape. Uh, yeah, the screw tape letters. Like yeah, that I read was that too. so repetitive. Like we get it yeah. already after chapter three. Yeah, uh, yeah, I agree. I didn't like that one as much. Um, but uh, I, I like him as a fiction writer. I don't like him as much as a thinker. I think he's kind of a second-rate thinker. I think there are a lot of other apologists out there that offer something more sophisticated and persuasive than he does. But like, like as who? A um, I think that uh, people like people like Bill Craig definitely offers something more hard-hitting than C.S. Lewis ever did. But isn't he just, just copying I'm, other people if, in front of him, using themes that predate him, and then just changing a little bit? Yes, uh, definitely. That's exactly what he's doing, even with his premier yeah. argument of the Kalam. Simon got it. <laughs> What's that? I, I watched too it. much of your content, Doug. That's why. <laughs> he, was, he was making a joke about Rob's argument about uh, oh, I see. cultural yeah. evolution, change over time. Yeah. Gotcha. Sorry. That, I, I went totally over my head. Um, yeah, no, I, I agree that that's what he's doing. I just think that he does it much better and with more depth to it than Lewis did. Like, take a look at. Um, uh, to give like some comparisons, take Robert Adams and his defense of like a theistic moral theory versus C.S. Lewis and mere Christianity and his moral argument. I think that, you know, they're just, 
huge difference between them that Adams has much more depth to his analysis than Lewis ever did. What What's uh, Douglas Adams' ontological argument in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, where there's like um, the, yeah. there's like that translation fish, the babble fish or something? I, I remember then... this well. I'll tell you what it is. So he says that you know, like, so basically, yeah, there's a there's a fish called the babble fish that like that grows only on one planet but any creature who puts it in his ear can instantly understand any other language in the universe so then the argument is that if the babble fish is so useful that it could only be created by god so then but then if that's true like you know god exists only by faith alone yeah yeah god god said there's no proofs of my existence you have to have faith that you, you can only know i exist by faith and right. then the babble fish. Then there's like a proof from the babble fish that they Which couldn't have evolved. God doesn't exist, and then yeah. God disappears in a puff of logic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, so Rebecca, I just I'll be honest with you that I'm not a I'm not an inclusivist myself. I'm very like exclusivist about things, but uh, the quote that you were reading there, I'll admit that. Um, I have felt at times, uh, you know, just going through life, that if there were a God, and I met him later, that he would react in exactly the way of that quote, that basically, like, he would know that what I'm doing here with my life is meant in all honesty, and, you know, that that I would be, you know, as maybe it sounds arrogant to say this, but that I would be rewarded for the things that I try to do in this life, even even expressly not loyal to him, uh, not admitting of his existence or anything like that. Um, but nevertheless, he would take me in at the end because he would see that what I was doing and was in earnest. Um, you know, and I have felt that like in different times in my life that if I was wrong, that, uh, if there were a God out there, that that would be the reaction. Um, I'm not putting any stock in that. Like I said, I, I don't think for a second that Christianity or theism in general is true. Um, but if there were a God and he was a, you know, the most moral being that you can imagine, um, then I think that he would respond in that way. So that quote did have, uh, you know, something to say to me. Um, I have felt that way before, you know, just to be honest you know, about it. You know, Drace, oh. I, I recommend, uh, sorry, Rebecca, I just want to quickly say it specifically for Drace. Um, I recommend you get uh, the book The Cross of Christ by John Stott. He wrote that book in the 80s. He's, he was an English English theologian. Um, Anglican, considered a very popular one, uh, but at an academic level. But he, he, he kind of wrote like a C.S. Lewis. You know, very good thinker and writer. Um, because he was also a fan of Tolkien and Lewis, but then bridge that into, say, something like Romans. Like, just then a moment ago when he said, I think, you know, I'll be judged by my works, and I do believe I have good works, and I I presume fundamentalist Christians and religious people might, uh, you might have come across them as, as sort of like, you know, psychologizing you and, and, and taking whatever model of real, reality that they have and just like dumping that onto you and saying, oh, no, you're a sinner and you're going to hell, like, you know, that that stuff. Um, sure. So in other words, what I'm saying is something like Romans, Paul's thought process in that, John Stott does a brilliant job bridging that into, and it sounds like you're, you're well-read in things like Lewis and Tolkien. So, like, he bridges that into, like, the larger scale, you know, you know, the, you know Tolkien's uh, you catastrophe uh, coinage, like, when he coins that term, uh, like a like a sudden joyful catastrophe, it's like what you know, un- totally unexpected. But it's a catastrophe. But it's a good thing as well. It's like, yeah, like I recommend that book. You you check that out. Like it's 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 by a guy named John Stott, S T O T T, and the Cross of Christ. Um, Heard. Yeah, we'll do. So, um, and yeah. uh, I'll be honest that I've read uh, I out of out of Tolkien's works, I've only read. Uh, four fiction books by him, the Lord of the Rings trilogy and uh, major parts of the Silmarillion. Um, but besides that, like any nonfiction stuff that Tolkien's come out with or anything to do with philosophy or theology, I myself haven't touched. Um, different story That's with C.S. Okay. Lewis, who I have read, but uh, but yeah, I've missed out on some of Tolkien's uh, uh, nonfiction material. 
but yeah, I will. I'll but check I, out I, that. Yeah, I think I think Start will also show you some sort of like my thought process in this, and I think especially when you see the last chapter of that book, where he recounts uh, a Japanese theologian during World War II and just beautiful like reflections. Because don't forget that's a period where, in those people's eyes, that was like the worst of the worst that can happen. But the point is again, looking at the philosophical theological reflections on that it, it that in my opinion that's where the rubber hits the road and i just know someone like because i can based on this discussion i know if someone like you will enjoy that book so yeah i'm just recommending that book so yeah. appreciate you cool anybody else want to share a reaction to the quote or a final thought because we are going to yeah, close soon because um... i totally have lost my voice and i gotta go to bed I'll say like I've actually known a lot of Christians that are sort of really inclusivist. Um, and I'd also say I've been exposed to a lot of like really great when it comes to like behavior Christians. Like I just, you know, I've been exposed to people that are just wonderful. Like I think they're saints. I don't really have a better way of putting it. Um, it's just for me and, and for me, like the. I think the one thing that I, I get hung up on a lot is I do feel like a lot of times the atheist perspective is seen as a rejection of God or like not wanting the, you know, not wanting to serve God or whatever. But for me, it was just like, I just wanted some better, I don't know. I was looking to boost my faith, right? I was looking to get to know Jesus better by looking more into certain things and uh, just led me down an unexpected path. But uh, I relate to your quote, and then I relate to the first reaction to it, which is that that sort of feeling like if that if the Christian God really is true, then when I get there, that God will be like, yeah, like you were trying to figure it out and trying to kind of get it right, and he can see that. And so I guess it's like uh, what I feel now, I guess, isn't all too different than what I felt when I was a believer, aside from the change in the, the core belief. Uh, but yeah, really like the quote. It's a nice quote. <laughs> cool. Uh, and thanks. I just stopped by to say hi. I know you've had a super long stream. I've been busy most of the night, but uh, thanks for letting me stop yeah. by and say, say thanks hi. Thanks for stopping by. Good to, good to see you guys. You too. I'll, I don't know. What did Jesus die for? It's it's kind of um, like I, I tend to t lean towards what you're saying. Makes sense to me. But on the other hand, I feel like... Um, what exactly did Christ die for and what is about the human race? What kind of work did it do in the world? Like, did it do something to change culture too, or is it individually? I don't know. It's, uh, it's a, I, I'm kind of struggling with this whole thing, but I hope you feel better. Get some rest. Thank you. Well, I mean, I believe Jesus died for sin he saved us he's saving us from sin and from death so i mean i know that may be just a simplistic answer but i mean i think that's why what was necessary so um does any you guys don't have to share thoughts about the quote if you don't want you can share something else um nathan like, do you want to say something about it? Well, I, I guess I just like it because I, a lot of the sort of apologetics, counter apologetics dialogue, at least as far as I see it, kind of centers around like idiots on both sides, like shouting at each other, basically. Um, and it's just completely unproductive. And, and a lot of, the, you know, like the people in the Christian camp just have this very silly view i mean in my according to me right <laughs> like a, a really silly view of um like exclusivism um and they haven't really you know like they've kind of distorted what we would all agree is like morally good in order to like define love as like shouting at people that they're horrible sinners and they're going to hell and stuff like that and it's just it's kind of like topsy-turvy weird world and uh i think that when you actually when you get into the theology of some of the um sort of bigger figures in the church like aquinas and so on and, and look i don't think any of these guys are perfect i think you've got to kind of 
if you want to try and construct a plausible theology, you've got to like engage with these things and and kind of like combine them and work on them yourself in light of um, what you know as a modern person as well, which is going to be a slightly different stock of knowledge. But um, yeah, I think I like people like Eleanor Stump um, in Wandering in Darkness, right? She she put draws on the um, convertibility of goodness from Aquinas and talks about how. <laughs> people who are who are you know doing good things and genuinely pursuing you you know genuinely trying to figure out what's true and if that leads you to atheism or whatever then as long as you're doing that like cultivating certain epistemic virtues and trying to then it's not like god's going to be like 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 punish you for that and he he really is just concerned that you have this cognitive attitude of like um yeah, I believe Jesus died for me, but then you, you're just horrible to everyone else. Like that was why I mentioned that Matthew 24 quote, right? Where um, Jesus is saying, you know, whatever you did for the least of these, you did for me. And uh, uh, and they're like, well, Lord, like, Lord, when did I, you know, what I, I didn't know that I did any of this stuff. And, and, and that's the the kind of convertibility of goodness thing. So, yeah, I, th I think that there's, I think it's a really like beautiful idea that can be appreciated as well by people who aren't um even if you don't buy theism i still think it's a pretty like cool idea nathan you need to give that as a sermon in the church sometime <laughs> it'll do Try wonders. And fr frame it more eloquently yeah <laughs> yeah thanks nathan simon did you want to say something uh Look, thank you for having me. Um, it's obviously a different time zone. I wasn't sure I was going to get you. So I'll, I'll just say thank you and thank you to everyone for the dialogue and apologies if there was any heat in what I said. It got a bit heated in the middle. Um, yeah. Oh, I didn't hear any heat coming from you. I, th I think I think I just, when I talk with people, I try and be really polite. And I think I, I don't know, I got confused and, and a little lost my patience a little bit in the middle. So maybe I noticed it and no one else did. Um, but if anyone did, Apologies, it wasn't personal. Yeah. It's the Aussie sass. I'm fine with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, you're you're immune to it by now. Been inoculated. <laughs> Did anyone not share that wants to share something? Deepak, did you share? Something? Yeah, I mean, I actually have my prior is like exactly like where Dra uh, Drace was right, like saying that if if a god right. Surely he would have the attitude that he described. Like, I just the only to me that's the only one that makes sense. But at the same time, then when I read, like, and I haven't really studied the Bible in depth or anything, but like when I look at quotes, like actually the kind of quotes that we looked at, because like you know when we were doing the other one, right, whether eternal conscious torment or an, an annihilationism, right, actually looking at those quotes, I, it just you know it, it it's obscured by the by the way like i don't know like the modern even evangelical movement like treats it and stuff right but it seems like annihilationism is like the obvious interpretation right of what most scripture uh, seems to say. i think it's it's overwhelmingly universalism according like according to me um, <laughs> seriously really compute for me overwhelming but... there's only there's only a couple of places where anything that sounds um there's only a couple of sort of places that would lend scriptural support to annihilationism um and the same would go for eternal conscious torment and there's numerous places where universalism is talked about like upwards of about 35 places and it's very difficult to get around what's being said there i think um without just rejecting the passage but see, this is this is the thing from my perspective right it's actually very easy to explain all this by saying you know Different people wrote different things. With different oh yeah, ideas. yeah. I, I'm obviously working yeah. internally to assuming yeah. that the Bible has something informative to say about like right. matters of theology. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to. Okay. Yeah. Right. Man, can yeah. you tell, tell, teach me about that? I want to hear about that. Me yeah. too. I've been trying to get somebody to come on and talk about universalism. I wanted Nathan or Spartan theology or something. Well, maybe but... I, I can at some point. Maybe, but yeah. I, there's there's a really good book. Um, about just purely Hart. no no this one's just a purely philosophical um argument for universalism as well so i'd want to get through that probably first but in terms of cool. like you know in terms of the scriptural case and, and you know that so there's also a lot of stuff to do with translational decisions that have been made around certain words um oh, and obviously uh, so so firstly like to do with temporal duration like ionios um but then also to do with, you know, like how how 
where, where hell comes from in the English and and like Hades and Sheol and various other things that are talked about and how they get synthesized into a systematic theological understanding. And um, yeah, it's just, it, I, I think it's just a complicated story, but when you do theology, what I see is the right way, which takes into account, you know, like what scripture has to say, but like reads it with alongside like tradition and reason and experience. I just think that universalism comes out as a much stronger view overall. Cool. Well, that's definitely something I want to um, talk about on, at some point um, in depth. Um Rob or Drace, did you want to share anything? Rob, you go first if you got one. I I I uh, I have nothing to add based on what uh, Nathan and Deepak and all of you have shared. I mean, if you're talking about a C.S. Lewis quote, like I think I think my recommendation would be what I recommended Drace, uh, John Stott's Cross of Christ as a yeah, so you have C.S. Lewis, but then, believe it or not, despite him being a creative, lovely writer, um, um, if you really, in, for those who are interested, if you really want to go into the theology of why the theology can be quite deep and, and uh, can sort of bridge into, like in other words, the theology is not just some abstract thing, it actually does have correspondence to reality. John Stott would be my recommendation. Cool. Jamie, are you going to do something on your channel now? Yeah, uh, yeah I probably will. Okay, um, well, anybody who wants to continue this conversation, go to Jamie Russell's channel, just Jamie Russell. And um, so um, I think you, if you just search it, you can find it, right, Jamie? Or should I put the link? Yeah, you can put the, I put the link. Okay. Okay. Let me put the link in the chat and then I will say good night, everyone. Thanks for being here. Appreciate right, you guys. Bye. Okay. Bye. You okay, Rebecca? You seem kind of <laughs> <laughs> because uh, you know what? I tried to leave the studio without ending alive. the broadcast.